Chapter One of East by West: A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. East by West: A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two, by Henry W. Lucy. Chapter One: Dining and Cremating. We lunched with Mr. Inouye, the foreign minister, at his pretty country house on the outskirts of Tokyo. Mr. Ito was present, together with several English gentlemen who have been closely associated with the government of Japan in furthering its desire of drawing nearer to Western civilization. The Foreign Office, where Mr. Inouye officially resides, is furnished throughout in European style. At his country house, the foreign minister preserves the two styles, there being a suite of reception and dining rooms furnished in European style, and one wing of the house in Japanese manner. There is no doubt which is the prettier. Nothing could be daintier or in better taste than the Japanese house. The colouring is exquisite. The various woods, simply polished and showing the grain, are a pleasure to look upon. The house stands high with trees and fields facing it, and in summer weather must be the perfection of a summer residence. What can be done in the way of grafting European notions of furniture upon the Japanese style of house architecture is seen in a pretty little bungalow which Mr. Greville of the British Embassy has built for himself at Tokyo. He took what was originally a Japanese house, made a few alterations while strictly preserving its style. And then began to furnish and adorn it with prizes drawn in the curio lottery. Mr. Trench pathetically complains that when paying a visit he is always afraid to move about, being prone either to knock his head against the ceiling or to knock over something on tables or floor. But the chargé d'affaires is a very tall man, and even he is not so dangerous as he represents himself. It is very difficult now to obtain really old lacquer or old things of any kind in Japan. Madame Inouye is happy in many priceless possessions. She has not only knowledge and special opportunities of exercising it, but has been quietly at work for some years. Every foreigner who goes to Japan is on the lookout for old lacquer and curios which antedate the European demand for them. Whatever of the real thing comes up is eagerly snatched at, but Japanese modern art is equal to the emergency and makes many things that are beautiful if not old. I met in a remote country district an enterprising Semitic from London who had spent two months in Japan and had bought up enough odds and ends to freight a brig. He would buy old lamps if he could get them; if not, new ones would do. But he must have them as like the old ones as possible, and would then take them by the dozen and the score. This is a clearing out process from a strictly trading point of view, which I believe is not uncommon, and which must, at no distant date, empty Japan of whatever makes her dear to the curiosity hunter. One other little difficulty the foreigner meets with in Japan surrounds the question of money. Japanese currency is chiefly in paper money, in convenient denominations down to ten yen, which should be of the value of five pence. But for a long period terminating with last year, the paper currency was grievously depreciated. What was nominally worth four shillings could, with difficulty, be exchanged for three, and it reached levels lower than that. The government, and above all their new policy. Was upon trial. They might break down any day, and who could say that their successors would, even if they could, meet the promise to pay which the notes bore? Gradually, confidence in the government and in the future of Japan has grown, and with it, paper money has very nearly touched par. At the present moment, a paper yen is worth only five pence less than the silver dollar. Which is a recuperation as remarkable and even more rapid than that of greenbacks or Italian notes. This sure sign of the growing prosperity and stability of the new empire is not viewed with very great approval by all who live within its borders. It is said, and with unquestionable truth, 
that it has sent up the prices of everything and made living appreciably dearer. Once a yen, always a yen, is a golden rule among the shopkeepers and tradespeople of Japan. What they charged a yen for when the note was worth only three shillings, they still charge a yen for now the little bit of paper is worth three and sevenpence and seems bent on reaching par. That, however, is not the grievance of the foreign visitor. He would certainly bear to have currency worth twenty-five per cent less than its nominal value, since that would mean that for his English sovereign he would get twenty-five shillings. But he thinks he has a reasonable right to demand that he shall know a yen note when he sees it, and shall not confound a fifty yen note with one valued at twenty. Formerly yen notes were recognisable at sight, having the figure one printed on them in numerals. Now there are yen notes of various colours, sizes and designs, with no figure of denomination printed on them. The fifties are the same size as the twenties, and are exactly the same pattern, save for cabalistic signs in the corners. Of course, plain enough to the Japanese, but worse than Greek to the foreigner. It is true that if you know where to look for it and have a microscope handy, you can discover the figure twenty printed on the tenpenny note and fifty on the two-shilling one. But these are not conditions always realisable, especially at night. I heard of a recent visitor to Japan who had only a month to see the country in. Like John Gilpin, though on pleasure bent, he had a frugal mind, and a dear friend estimated that he spent one week of the four in studying his notes before he made payments, and went away saddened by the conviction that he had three times paid away fifty yen notes for twenty. This is not likely to be strictly true but it indicates a matter of considerable embarrassment to visitors to Japan, and might be commended to the attention of the government among their other reforms. The explanation of this shower of diverse designs in copper plate is the establishment of national banks, of which there are no less than 152, each authorised to issue its own notes. The necessity for diversity of designs is obvious, but there is the more reason why the denomination should be made clear. The silver yen, a strikingly handsome coin, is now at par with the Mexican dollar. It is indeed preferred by tradespeople and banks, since Chinese industry has found a new and wide field in dealing with the Mexican coin. By the exercise of dexterity and industry, the artisan removes the face from one side of the coin, cuts out the silver, fills up the cavity with baser metal, and resets the face in a way that makes it difficult for any but trained eyes to detect the fraud. So widely has this practice obtained that when payment is made in Mexican dollars, the recipient rings every coin. It is of no consequence when the transaction does not exceed three or four dollars, but when it comes to thirty, forty or over, it is rather a bore to have to stand by and watch each coin tested. This is necessary, since the industry branches out in another direction, and the guileless-looking Chinese, who is judiciously testing your money, may have ready at hand a few of these manipulated coins ready for opportunities. These somehow get mixed up with yours, and he, with a pitying smile for your earlier misfortune, will invite you to replace them with sterling silver. Between luncheon and dinner was a convenient time for witnessing a cremation. In Tokyo, the principal place of cremation is situated at Shenzhou, a suburb reached through long lines of busy streets. It was fate day in the neighbourhood, and we approached it through a dense crowd of holiday-makers. The shops were brightly lit, gin rickshaws abounded, most of them holding two, and one at least four, persons, two being babies. On these occasions the Japan infant obtains a change of view and position. For the most part it peers out upon the world round the side of its mother's or sister's head. 
but it being physically impossible for a woman to sit in a jinrickshaw with the everlasting baby at her back, it is, on this occasion only, slewed round to the front. Many of the tea-houses in this quarter were brilliantly illuminated with scores of lanterns. One, which our guide said was a goose-house, had over a hundred, a tall pole running up from before it hanging out a score. It appears that the Japanese is rapidly developing carnivorous tastes. As the home culinary department is not yet equal to cooking joints, the luxurious Japanese of the lower middle class goes out to a beef-house, or a goose and duck house, and feeds on the unfamiliar viand. After an hour's drive through a lane of busy life, we came to the silent house where the dead awaited the last service of the living. It stands a little apart from the main road, a building of a single story with an innocent-looking tall chimney that might be connected with a pottery or small iron foundry. The business is always conducted privately, and there are few in Tokyo, except those who are professionally engaged, who have witnessed the process. But arrangements made by the omnipotent foreign minister opened the doors and secured a respectful welcome. We were first received in the house of the manager, where tea was served in priceless porcelain cups of Kutani ware. The furnace, if so imposing a name may be used for a process so simple, stood a few paces from the house. On entering it there was nothing to be seen but what appeared to be two butter-tubs resting upon a few faggots of wood. There were several cavities about two inches deep and a foot long in the stone floor, and these were filled with shavings. According to municipal law, no burning is to be done before half-past six in the evening. It still wanted ten minutes to that time, but in the circumstances the manager thought he would be safe in anticipating the hour and the shavings were fired. One of the men, kneeling before the growing flame, fanned it with a piece of wood. It caught the dry faggots, greedily licked the sides of the tubs, rose high in the air, and then, with a horrible thud, the head of the barrel burst outwards. Quick as thought, the man seized a large piece of wood lying by in readiness, and hid from sight whatever may have protruded. It is the boast of the skilful cremator that under his supervision the contents of the barrel are never exposed to view. A heavy matting of wet straw is laid over the length of the barrel before the fire is ignited. As the barrel is burned away, this falls in and covers the body. In three hours the work is done. Every particle of flesh is burned away, and there remains only the skeleton. The bones and the teeth the relatives collect and give them sepulture. There are three classes of cremation at this establishment. In the first class, each body is burned separately, a charge being made of seven yen, equal to twenty-eight shillings in our money. In the second class, the charge is only ten shillings, the difference being that two or more, according to the briskness of trade, are burned at the same time. The third class pays six and sixpence, the semblance of a coffin provided by the tub being dispensed with. It will be seen that, as compared with the most moderate scale of ordinary burial charges, cremation is cheap. As far as I could gather, it is this which recommends it to the class of Japanese, generally the least wealthy, who avail themselves of the resources at the establishment at Shenjo and kindred institutions. We dined in the evening with Mr. Irwin, the American gentleman to whose energy Japan is, as already noted, indebted for a new and well-equipped line of coasting steamers. Mr. Irwin has a Japanese wing to his residence, and the Japanese portion of the establishment is infinitely the prettier. It was a fairy-like scene as we took our places on cushions on the matted floor of the dining-room. It was to be in every respect a Japanese dinner. Consequently there were, at the outset at least, no chairs, much less tables. After a while hospitality overcame the rigour of etiquette, and at a crisis when my unaccustomed knees were beginning to crack, a small stool was quietly brought in on which I was able to sit without disturbing the harmony of the picture. 
That was effectively done by Mr. Dennison, an American gentleman in the confidence of the Foreign Office. Though he has lived many years in Japan, he has never been able to take kindly to the national posture, and now nothing less than a big cane chair suited the exigencies of his burly frame. Outside the garden was festooned with Chinese lanterns which softly illumined its dark recesses. A panel drawn aside at the foot of the room opened upon the veranda, which served admirably for a stage, on which three small children performed during the meal a touching drama. Hidden from view was a musician who played upon a samisen, a three-stringed instrument as old as the sixteenth century, thrummed upon banjo-wise with the fingers. From time to time the musician, a woman, broke forth into a monotonous chant, descriptive of the scene going forward on the stage, and analytic of the motives of the characters, just as on the real stage the jorori singers assist the players. For the sole actor in this dramatic company, two members were girls, this adventitious aid was quite superfluous. The youth was in his sixth year, the son of a small shopkeeper, who added something to his income by hiring out his children for these performances in private houses. I gathered the general plan of the play to be that he was a faithful retainer, whose young master, his sister aged nine, was in love with a young lady, a character taken by a sprightly young thing of seven, who was, for family reasons, not an eligible party. The duty of young Rossius was to advise, and if possible, restrain his master from indulgence in this unhappy passion. The way he frowned and strutted, shook his gory locks, and waved his aged but still virile hand, the way he relapsed for a moment into attitudes of profound and saddened thought while the Jorori singer told what was passing within his perturbed breast, the way when, angered past endurance, he threatened to draw an imaginary sword, his haughtiness, his affection for his master, his unbending hostility to the fair one, and, above all, the efforts he made when declaiming intense passages to produce bass notes out of his piping treble, were things worth a journey to Japan to see and hear. All were good, the maiden with her pretty face and quaint womanly manner, the love-lorn lord, patient to the last under the tyranny of his truculent retainer. But the small boy was simply sublime, and should be heard of hereafter on a wider stage. When we took our seats around the festive board, the first course was already served. Before each guest was placed a little lacquered tray, raised three or four inches from the ground, on it was a covered porcelain bowl containing a small quantity of boiled rice. A second covered bowl of lacquer held some clear fish soup, which I made bold to eat and found uncommonly good. As there was only chopsticks to eat the rice, I said I rarely ate rice at this time of day and passed it by. Nor did I care about the contents of the third bowl, which contained some mysterious-looking vegetables. Whilst we were discussing or regarding these delicacies, there entered a bevy of pretty serving girls bearing lacquered cups for each guest and a little blue jar containing sake. It was slightly mulled, the small jars being replenished from a silver kettle. Each guest has his appointed handmaid. Mine was exceedingly pretty, a great addition to the picture as she gracefully knelt at the other side of the tray watchful for opportunity to do service. As there was nothing particular to do, she filled up the time by smiling on me in the friendliest manner. I smiled back, and we go on very well together without articulate speech. Presently the little handmaiden rose, left the room, and with the others returned carrying a covered vessel of pure white wood. This was full of rice, with which she refilled the empty rice bowls, whilst another maiden, nearly as pretty, removed the bowls of clear soup, a third replacing them with lacquer bowls containing stewed wild ducks, raw fish, white cakes of bean paste, and a little bowl of pickles, 
which may have been savoury to the taste, but were certainly unpleasant to the nose. After a while, just as young Rossius on the stage had discovered his master making signs over a supposititious garden wall to his lady-love, and murder seemed imminent, my little handmaid brought up another bowl containing a fresh kind of soup. Whilst I cautiously tasted this, she went out again and brought in some fried fish on a plate, with a little ginger and pickled vegetables in a porcelain bowl. The fish, I ascertained, was Thai, a kind of place, and it is the correct thing to eat it with ginger. Sixthly, she brought another plate of fish stewed in soy, with a plate of lily bulbs and another of chestnuts. Close on her heels came a girl bearing the wine kettle, this time quite hot. Having had sufficient sake in the cooler state, I declined a further supply, whereupon another kettle was brought. I said I would take some of that, not knowing its contents, but earnest in search of knowledge. It turned out to be plain hot water. It seems to be an accepted doctrine among the Japanese gourmands that at this stage of the feast something hot must be taken. For those who like it, there is sake. Those who do not care for sake gurgle down hot water. I did not care for my supply, now I had it, but the indefatigable handmaid placed on my tray, as others had served to them, a cup of hot water with leaves of an aromatic plant floating on it, doing their best to counteract the influence of the pickled vegetables. Here there was a pause. Cigarettes were served round, and some of the guests who had squatted on the floor through the dinner took the opportunity of stretching their limbs by strolling about the room and neighbouring apartments. Though what has gone before is quickly told, it took a considerable time in the accomplishment. The play had been going forward simultaneously, and the faithful retainer had now learned beyond doubt the infatuation of his master, and his brow had grown in blackness. He had killed nobody as yet, but his hand frequently sought his sword-hilt, and slaughter was imminent. I thought we had finished dinner, but there remained yet another course. All the dishes had been removed, and now came a tray bountifully supplied with plates of bean-jelly, rice-cake, and other toothsome things. There were also grapes, of which Japan grows some excellent varieties, and hopes shortly to do better. There was also a toothpick, but I did not feel as if I wanted one. This course disposed of, the host rose and conducted us to another room, where tea is usually served. If there had been a few thick slices of bread and butter with the tea, I would gladly have gone forth in search of it. As it was, the prospect of a thimbleful of pale yellow fluid served round with smiles and bows was a little depressing. But our host knew the weakness of the European. We had, when offered our choice, recklessly voted in favour of a Japanese dinner, and we had had it, or, to be more exact, had had some of it. Still, an inch of fish perilously conveyed to the mouth with chopsticks, a mouthful of soup, and a sniff of greens kept too long in salt water, are not filling. We were therefore unfeignedly glad to discover, in place of the tea-tray, a table bountifully set forth with a good British dinner. I noticed that the Japanese, who had so long sat at meat in the other room, took very kindly to the European food, a preference which I fancy is growing. I once asked the disguised prince who came across with us in the Coptic which style of food he preferred, the European or the Japanese. The Japanese, he promptly answered, but then he had not for seven years had an opportunity of tasting it. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of East by West, Volume Two by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: A Personal Episode in History. Sitting one day in the European drawing-room of Mr. Inouye's counting-house, 
which, after all, has its conveniences in the matter of chairs. The foreign minister told me the story of his life, which is also, in a great measure, the story of the life of the new empire of Japan. In 1864, Japan was in those throes which surely presaged a new birth of one kind or other, most probably of revolution and rapine. At Tokyo, the tycoon reigned but scarcely governed. At Kyoto, the Mikado reigned but in no sense governed. The ancient and curiously solemn farce of dual majesty still prevailed. The Mikado's person and authority were sacred, too sacred for contact with mundane affairs. He lived in his palace surrounded by all the attributes of imperial majesty. His name was revered throughout all the provinces. In theory his power was unlimited. He could do almost anything but direct the destinies of the nation of which he was the titular head. He could create a new deity who would presently have his shrines, his priesthood, and his throng of worshippers, but he could not move a regiment of soldiers. The tycoons, who had commenced to be Cromwells, whilst not destroying the kingship, had long usurped imperial state, and in recent relations of foreign powers had used the title of majesty. So dark were the internal affairs of Japan to the foreigner that the shadowy emperor interned at Kyoto was possibly, after some vague efforts to comprehend his position, absolutely ignored, and foreign treaties were contracted with His Majesty the Tycoon. It was the existence of these treaties and the prospect of further and closer intercourse with the scorned and hated foreigner that accounted for the hot blood now seething in Japan and threatening to find outlet somewhere, against the foreigner if possible, if not against the usurper who had so far forgotten his duty to the empire as to traffic with foreigners. In 1854 a treaty had been made with the United States, very narrow in its scope, but illimitable in its consequences. It had been signed at the instance or on the insistence of Commodore Perry, and bound the Japanese government to afford succour and protection to seamen and vessels of the United States. If the Japanese government failed therein, or could in any plausible manner be held to have failed, Commodore Perry or someone like him at the head of a fleet of ironclads would appear off Nagasaki, bombard the town and perhaps land troops. The tycoon, in entering into a pledge with a foreign power, had given that power the right to enforce its fulfilment. In 1858, Great Britain had wrung another treaty out of the tycoon, one much wider in its scope than that conceded to the United States. The foreigner had already obtained a foothold on the sacred shores of the empire. He lived at Yokohama, built houses, carried on trade, and if any two-sworded man were, in an excess of patriotism, to chop off his head, instead of being protected and advanced in favour, he was tried for murder. The foreigners were asking for more open ports, fresh treaties were talked of, and nothing in the previous conduct of the tycoon justified the hope that they would not be granted. The old nobles of Japan saw this degradation and threatened destruction of their country, with troubled breasts and growing anger. They were the real rulers of Japan, though for convenience sake and with the object of preventing one or other of their fellows from usurping the emptied throne, they were content to do homage to the tycoon. But when he thus proved faithless to all traditions of the country, some of them resolved to assert the personal independence which had always existed in fact. Foremost amongst these hot-headed chieftains was the Prince of Chosu. He swore a great oath that let the tycoon do what he pleased and make such treaties as he thought fit in Tokyo, the province of Chosu should be held free from the contaminating touch of the foreigners. If the foreigners entered his territory, they should incontinently be slain. If foreign ships appeared off his coasts, they should be fired upon to which end he built and armed forts. 
Amongst his retinue were two young men of twenty-two or twenty-three years of age, one named Ito and the other Inouye. They were of the samurai class, and their sagacity and courage had, even at this early age, raised them high in the councils of their prince. They were daring enough to offer him advice, and when he talked of keeping the foreigners off with his puny forts, they gloomily shook their heads. They had seen British ships at anchor in Yedo Bay, and had heard the roar of their guns. If, they said to the hot-headed chieftain, you should succeed in driving off an English vessel by the fire from your forts, what then? Within a week or two others of greater strength would steam up, and in an hour you would not have a stone standing on another. The only thing to do is to beat England on her own ground. We must learn to sail ships and fight them, and with a fleet of our own we shall be able to keep our coast inviolate. The prince listened to reason from these young but trusted counsellors, and a notable scheme was hatched. These two young men, with three others of the same age and standing, were to go to England, to spy out the land, master the great secret of naval supremacy, bring it back to Japan, straightway create a fleet, and then let England, the United States, and France look out. The first difficulty in realisation of this plan barred the start of the young patriots. It was at this time a capital offence for any Japanese to attempt to leave the country without the permission of the tycoon. The tycoon, however, was not a man to be trusted. He was gradually selling his birthright for successive messes of pottage, and patriotic Chosu would have nothing to do with him. Japan should be saved in spite of him. In this dilemma, young Inouye came forward with his plan. He had often been down to Yokohama, watching with glowing eyes the evidences of the strength, activity, and, he was bound to admit, the intelligence of the detested foreigner. He had even scraped a personal acquaintance with some of them, amongst others a Mr. Gowen, then consul at Yokohama. What particular story he told this gentleman in order to induce him to assist in his escape, I do not know. It is pretty certain that he did not tell him that he and his comrades were going over to England with the expressed purpose of taking preliminary steps for humbling the pride and power of Great Britain and blowing its navies out of the sea. However that be, he induced the consul to ship them in the dead of the night in the guise of common sailors to Shanghai, where they could take a passage for England. The prince of Chosu had raised a thousand pounds to meet the expenses of their expedition, a sum placed to their credit with the house of Jardine Matheson and Co., one of the pioneers of British trade in Japan. Everything went well as far as Shanghai, but here a hitch occurred. Three of the party duly sailed as passengers and reached England after a more or less pleasant voyage. Ito and Inouye met with quite another fate. Being questioned as to their desires and intentions, Inouye expended the greater part of his store of English in declaring that he wanted to learn navigation. His heart was full and his mind engrossed by the object of his mission. Knowledge of navigation was the secret of England's greatness and the foundation of the power which enabled her to be overbearing and insolent in Japan. He and his dear friend Ito would go and study navigation in its chief school. They would come back and spread it through Chosu. Then should the star of the British Empire on the seas pale, and who knows but what it would be found worth while that Great Britain should be annexed and should be even as Yezo, or one of the countless islands that stud the inland sea. Accordingly, when asked what they wanted to do, Inouye answered, Navigation, and that being all the answer to be got out of him, he and his comrade were shipped as common sailors on board the good ship Pegasus, bound for the port of London. They did not discover this till Shanghai had become a dim streak on the horizon, and they found themselves buffeted about, ordered in an unknown tongue to do impossible things. 
How they got through the voyage it is difficult to understand, though Mr. Inouye, looking back at the episode from the eminence of the Foreign Office, talks of it pleasantly and cheerily. The sailors called him Johnny, and the boatswain had a keen eye to a sum of fifty dollars they happened to have with them when they went on board. Strange games of cards were played in the forecastle, in which they were invited to join. If they refused, they were thrashed. If they played, they lost their money. After a brief period of hesitation, during which their heads began to swell and their backs ached, they decided to lose their money. This once settled, they led quite a pleasant life. The sailors took pains to teach them their business, and with the natural aptitude of the Japanese they speedily became able seamen. "'I never see a sailing-ship now,' the foreign minister said as he told me the story. "'But I find myself scanning the rigging and running off the names of the ropes and spars, as I used to do on the Pegasus.' When they arrived at the port of London, the sailors left the ship and hurried off to home or other haunts. But the two Japanese runaways had nowhere to go. They were dazed with the sight and sounds of mighty London, with its moving crowds, its interminable streets, and its forest of ships. They had entered it by its most imposing avenue, and slowly sailing up the river, had watched with ever-widening astonishment and deepening trouble the signs of wealth and power. This was the country they presently meant to defy and to humble. In the future history of England, the day when they sailed up the Thames, disguised in blue sailor shirts and canvas trousers the worse for wear and tar, would be marked by a black letter. As it was, London took distressingly small notice of them. The procession of ships sailed up and down. The docks for miles and miles were full of ships. There was a town on either side of the river that seemed to have no end. They were in the centre of millions of people whose ultimate fate they held in their hands, but who, for the present, with provoking indifference, took no more notice of them than if they had been two gnats that strayed into dock from Plumstead marshes. Moreover, they were beginning to feel very hungry. With the end of the voyage, rations, such as they were, had stopped. The galley fire was cold, the cook had disappeared, and there was not even a bit of mouldy biscuit to be had. They stayed on board partly because they had nowhere to go, and partly because they expected that their arrival would be duly notified, and that someone would come down and lead them to a place where they were to stay. Nobody coming, and hunger gnawing at them, Inouye volunteered to go ashore and buy some food. They had three dollars left, which they had secreted beyond the ken of the rapacious boatswain. Not knowing the value of such coin in England, it was deemed desirable that the emissary should take with him all the money. He accordingly pocketed the three dollars, and went forth in search of something to eat. He would surely come upon a place where rice was sold ready-boiled, or little bowls of soup were dispensed, or, peradventure, a little fish with trimmings of seaweed might be purchased. Wandering about, with his weather-eye open for such contingencies, young Inouye at length came to a baker's shop. Bread does not form part of Japanese daily food, but he had learned to eat biscuit on board the Pegasus, and this at least would be softer. Besides, the negotiations for the purchase of a loaf of bread would not be impeded by his ignorance of the language. He need not speak a word. He had only to enter the shop, take up a loaf, put down the money, and the transaction was closed. He took up a loaf when it occurred to him that he did not know how much to pay for it. He had never bought a quartern loaf before, and could not even guess at its price. It might be one dollar or less, it might be two dollars, or even three. He did not like to offer too little. Of course, if he gave too much, the man would give him the change. So he put down the three dollars. I am sorry and ashamed to say, that the baker, after looking at him and clinking the coins to test the goodness of the silver, swept them all into the till, 
and Inouye, with a sinking heart, left the shop. He had got a loaf of bread, but in the heart of this big and pitiless city he and his comrade were penniless. A new trouble beset him when he left the shop. He had taken the bearings of the ship as carefully as he could, but he had not walked far before he discovered that he had lost his way. For hours he walked about, faint with hunger, fatigue, and fear. Ito was hungry too, and till he came to him he would not break bread. At last, when it was growing dusk, he happened to turn into the dock, and found Ito almost in a state of desperation on his account. The two sat down in the empty forecastle and ate their bread with a mighty content. The next day a messenger from Jardine Matheson and Co.'s rescued them. Lodgings were provided for them in Gower Street, and they had plenty of money at their command. This they used in prosecuting those inquiries which were the object of their expedition. They were keen-eyed young men, and were not long in discovering how ludicrously slight was the foundation on which they had built their lofty hopes. The invincible power of England, which had dawned upon them during their voyage up the Thames, grew with every day's residence in the country. At the end of three months news came from Japan which greatly added to their trouble. The Prince of Chosu, perhaps incited by the knowledge that he had five secret emissaries in the enemy's camp, who would presently possess themselves of the talisman of England's power, had kicked over the traces. He had closed the Straits of Shimonoseki against British ships, and had threatened to fire upon any that came within range of his guns. The tycoon had solemnly rebuked him, and he had defied the tycoon. Inouye and Ito knew only too surely what would be the end of this. Less than six months ago they had left their prince as deeply imbued as he was with the conviction of the irresistible power of a Japanese clan, if it could only meet on equal terms with the forces of Great Britain. They were now hundreds of years in advance of their master in respect of knowledge. Their first and immediate duty was to go back to Japan and warn their prince of the hopelessness of the struggle upon which he had embarked. Like Saul of Tarsus, they had set forth on their journey full of anger, hatred, and contempt of these new men who disturbed the peace and order of the old regime. They would go back like Paul, humble and convinced of the power they had despised, and would hereafter become the foremost apostles of the Western civilization, to whose repulse from their shores they had devoted their young lives. They called upon Messrs. Jardine Matheson and Co., and explained the peremptory need of their return. But the members of the eminent and practical firm only shook their heads. These young Japanese had been consigned to their care with other goods from Japan. They were labelled students, and Messrs. Jardine Matheson and Co. had put them in the way of study. Till fresh orders were received, they could not reship them for any port. This was a serious rebuff. But the two young Japanese had grown accustomed to rebuffs, and had already formed a habit of disregarding them. Their beloved prince was in peril, their country was in danger, they had but one duty to perform, which was with the least possible delay to return to their rescue. Since there were no other means of obtaining a passage, they, profiting by their experience on the Pegasus, shipped before the master's common seamen, and making the long journey by the Cape of Good Hope, reached Shanghai in safety. The next thing was to get to Japan, an enterprise even more difficult than the journey from Europe to Asia. They shrewdly suspected that the British minister at Pekin would gladly accept their good offices in furthering the settlement of the difficulties their hot-headed prince had created. They appealed personally and directly to Sir Rutherford Alcock, told him of their conviction of the utter uselessness of the prince of Chosu's kicking against the pricks, 
and of their urgent desire to come face to face with him and report the result of their observations in england the british minister touched by this mixture of simplicity and shrewdness ordered admiral keppel then in command of the british fleet in the chinese seas to land them as near the camp of the prince their master as was practicable as soon as they got ashore they hastened to the prince earnestly besought him to desist from a hopeless conflict and in part succeeded in stopping him in his mad career but they were more truly representatives of japanese opinion when eight months earlier they had left the country in search of means to trample on the foreigner the prince himself was helpless to stem the course events were taking he had raised a spectre which he could not lay at will as for the new and unexpected emissaries of peace it fared hardly with them ito had to hide himself from popular indignation inuye falling into the hands of the angered samurai was slashed hacked and left for dead by the roadside he had just sufficient strength to crawl to his mother's house where he was nursed back to life and carefully hidden but to this day he bears on his face a memento of the terrible night within four years of these events the inevitable end had come the power of the tycoon had crumbled to pieces the mikado was restored to actual authority the feudal system which had brought about this result in its turn miraculously melted away and after a transformation scene the like of which has never before been enacted in the history of the world japan found itself under something approaching to constitutional government in the growth of popular liberty and concomitantly of national prosperity which has since invigorated japan the hapless sailor apprentices have borne the principal share the lessons they learned in gower street in eighteen sixty four have not faded from their memory abandoning all notions of conquering england they determined as far as possible to imitate her they have introduced into japan railways telegraphs a postal service and a thorough system of education the dream of their early youth has been realized to the extent that japan now has a navy of first-class ships though their guns are not loaded to keep off foreigners on the contrary foreigners are welcomed throughout japan and foreign trade flourishes at half a dozen open ports the policy of the present government of which mr ito and mr inouye are the founders and the sustaining forces is deliberately and persistently directed towards extending this sound and liberal movement they are prepared to throw the whole of the country open to foreign trade just as england is opened but they ask that the work should be accomplished on something like the same conditions as it is rendered possible in this country they demand that foreigners trading within the empire shall be subject to its laws whilst they are willing to have those laws administered in the case of foreigners under conditions as to the personnel of the tribunes which shall secure the certainty of justice as a preliminary to this state of things there has lately been promulgated in japan an adaptation of the code napoleon which has drawn forth encomiums from several eminent european jurists in addition japan demands some slight revision of the import duties which it is contended do not as at present imposed by treaty leave to the government of the country the bare means of subsistence compelling them to make up deficiencies by increased charges upon their own people those treaties were exacted from an ignorant and irresolute tycoon standing between the devil and the deep sea having english french and dutch ships thundering at the gates of kobe and around him the chiefs of the clans protesting by their swords that the foreigners should gain no foothold in japan no impartial mind can affirm that treaties so made and at that date are applicable to the japan of to-day and it is to be hoped alike in the interests of japan and of the commerce of the western world that the negotiations pending in eighteen eighty four may result in a just and equitable revision 
End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of East by West: A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three by Sea and Land to Kyoto. We left Yokohama in the late afternoon. The bay looking more beautiful than ever in the sunlight, shining out of a sky blue as any spread over Naples. We were bound for Kyoto. The ordinary way of going thither is to take a steamer to Kobe in one of the large and well-appointed Mitsubishi steamers, and proceed thence to Shanghai. But we resolved to go something out of the beaten track, take steamer as far as Yokaiichi, and thence across country by Jinrikisha to Kyoto. The sea voyage to Yokaiichi is not unfamiliar to Japanese, but is not often taken by Europeans with the natural consequence that there is no accommodation for them. Our steamer was an old tub of 250 tons. The saloon was approached by an uncompromising ladder, and luxury was aimed at by the disposal of sofa bunks round the stern in pleasing contiguity to the screw. Of course there was no stewardess, nor any regular steward that I was able to identify. The office seemed to be in commission, and when any boy happened to find time hang heavy on his hands, he took a turn at steward's work. Our berths were small cupboards opening off the dining-room table. Each was fitted up with two narrow shelves, which I thought were for books or plates. It was presently made clear they were for us but it did not much matter it was rather promising in the way of fun and excitement we had only one night to sleep here and everything was big enough and nice enough for a twenty hours trip in summer seas like that on which we were even now gliding the foreign minister came off in his steam launch to say good-bye an unaccustomed visit which greatly fluttered the captain and crew the captain was so much impressed that he immediately placed his berth at the disposal of the lady of our party. The berth was more commodious, having at least three inches more beam. But as the kindly offer was not accompanied by preparations for changing the bed linen, it was declined. Before we reached the gate of the Bay of Yeddo, the beauty of the scene had wondrously increased. On the right, the sun was setting flooding fuji and the mainland in crimson and gold on the left the moon had already risen a globe of luminous silver set in the blue firmament thus we sailed forth between the risen moon and the sun not yet set the bay hardly touched by a ripple was alive with sampans with their sails fully set tripping gaily home before the gentle breeze wafted inward from the pacific the only member of the crew of our steamer with whom it was possible to converse was the engineer he was the inevitable scotchman and had been many years in the native coasting trade he had not improved his opportunities of learning japanese but he got along very well he said he was evidently taken aback at seeing a lady appear to take passage on the ship but after the first shock he became violently prophetic of a good passage, and things generally going off comfortably. "'Oh, you'll see, it'll be all right,' he said to me in an argumentative tone, as if I had been affirming the contrary, whereas I had not even broached the subject. "'You see all those junks out there? Well, that's a sign of good weather. You don't see many out when it's rough.' "'But, they're running into port i said yes of course they're running into port he replied it's getting dinner time you know oh we'll have it pretty fine you'll see and your lady will be right comfortable besides if it comes on to blow a bit the captain will run in under the lee of the land given your lady his berth hasn't he i said he had kindly offered it ah he said, nodding as if that were conclusive of fine weather. Then he's going to be on deck all night. 
we had a large number of Japanese passengers who seemed to fill every nook and cranny forward. A pleasant-looking family, fearful of the closeness of the steerage, had built their soul a lordly dwelling-house over the hatches amidships. They had piled their luggage round and planted themselves in the middle. The walls were not very high, but at least they served to mark the limits of their domain. There they sat, the father blandly smiling at the fair scene around, the mother tidying up, and the little boy with his head shaved save for two locks over either ear which were nicely oiled and combed. I was very glad to think, as I looked on this family scene, that we were going to have such fine weather that the captain was making preparations for spending the night on the bridge. It would be a terrible thing if the vessel rolled and pitched, breaking down the house of cards, inextricably mixing up the little boy with the luggage and spoiling his hair. Worse still if cruel seas were to come over and wash the decks. Presently, as we came nearer to the bar, and could faintly hear the boom of the Pacific rollers on the rugged coast, a tarpaulin was slung over a pole, covering in the scene of domestic felicity. They had a lantern, and peeping through a chink, I discovered them smiling more vigorously than ever. Never had they been so comfortable on board ship, and they were more than ever pleased that this happy thought had occurred to them, and that they had not pigged in with their countrymen in the hold. Ito was so charmed with the idea that he made a nook for himself also under the tarpaulin. He is growing quite fastidious on the subject of fresh air, and talks pityingly of the people down in the hold. These, we could see through the open hatchway, were already at dinner. It was served in easy fashion. There were a great heap of little wooden trays with four divisions. The cook, kneeling beside a wholesale quantity of stores, dipped his hand into a bucket and filled one receptacle with rice. Into a second he fingered two bits of boiled fish. A third he filled with vegetables, and into the fourth he, with more discriminating hand, placed some of the evilly smelling pickles which the soul of the Japanese loveth. The boxes were piled one on top of another, till they were as high as they could be carried by an able-bodied seaman, who took them into the hold and distributed them to the passengers. As for ourselves, we had contracted for European food by payment of two yen a head for the voyage. An appetizing duck hung from the rigging aft, giving promise of generous supplies to meet the healthful appetite born of fresh sea air and smooth seas. The sun had gone down when we reached the harbour bar, but the west was golden yet, and the moon, nearing its full, was brightly shining out of a sky as blue as if it were noonday. As we crossed the bar, the little steamer began to throb and leap about in an unexpected manner. The duck hung on to the rigging, wagged its head in a forlorn manner, as if it did not like the prospect at all but the engineer was even more energetically hopeful. A narrow place this, you see. The tide running in like as if the Pacific was trying to crowd itself into a mill pond. But it'll be all right by and by, you'll see. Besides, our captain can run in if he gets it too hot. This was satisfactory as far as it went. But why should the captain want to run in? on a night so fine that he was tempted to remain on deck. "'It'll be all right, you'll see,' the engineer persisted, tightening his tarpaulin trousers, which he had put on since I saw him last. I never remember to have seen an engineer in tarpaulin trousers, but then I had never before seen the sun and moon brightly shining in the heavens at the same time, Autre pays, autre mœurs. Perhaps in the coasting trade of Japan the engineer always clad himself in tarpaulin when the night was expected to be exceptionally fine. We cleared the bar and got out into the full sweep of the Pacific, but things did not seem to improve. It was almost as light as day, and far around was the dreary waste of waters leaping out and breaking into foam. 
It was getting near six o'clock, and a savoury smell came from the galley. The vessel was not only rolling, but pitching. That, however, was not much to travellers who had crossed two oceans. We walked up and down the little deck, determined, as we said, to get an appetite for dinner. It was not much of a walk at best, and was momentarily growing shorter as the spray began to break across the deck forward. The hatchways were closed, and the men were battening them down, making it comfortable for the crowd below. I peeped through a chink in the tarpaulin to see how the Japanese family were getting on. They were not smiling now, being too busily engaged in the effort to keep their walls up. Sometimes a box would roll off on the port side, and whilst they were refixing it, a bundle placed aft would drop down upon them as the steamer buried its miserable little nose in the sea. I was conscious of the engineer watching us as we paced the deck, but whenever we approached the engine room he disappeared. He was evidently as anxious now to avoid conversation as he formerly had been to open it. At four bells we turned in for dinner. We had been very cheery on deck, perhaps a little ostentatiously at our ease, staggering about with the heaving ship. But when we got to the bottom of the ladder and were standing in the close and narrow saloon, the gaiety of the company was eclipsed. The last thing I saw as I descended was the duck shaking its head more violently than ever, with an expression of idiotic bewilderment that haunted me through the terrible night. We were not, however, going to give in without a struggle. Dinner was on the table, and we would at least sit down, making talk of ghastly cheerfulness and eyeing each other suspiciously. We ate our soup and eagerly discussed its relative merits with those of various other soups we had eaten under circumstances we were at curious pains to remember and recite. Two courses followed, one of mutton, the other of veal. I forgot which was the veal, but it did not matter. It might have been called turtle fin with equal accuracy of reference to its flavour. At this stage the lady of the party retired. Another course arrived of some undistinguishable meat. I am not sure that it was not the veal back again, having passed out at one door and in at the other, after the manner of an army of supers at country theatres. The young gentleman from Glasgow, though unusually silent, did fairly well. He had paid for his dinner, and the commercial transaction would not be completed unless he ate it. Something else came on, perhaps cheese, peradventure an orange. The cook was determined to rise to the occasion and show the friends of the foreign minister what could be done on board this ship. To this end, he had manufactured three small tarts of very pale complexion, which, by way of luring on the appetite, had been placed on the table with the soup. These tarts were always slipping off the table, being rescued from under by somebody and replaced on the dish. I have a fancy that they were not quite so pale when I first saw them, but with the cabin bobbing about in this style, the ceiling coming down to the floor, the floor going up to the ceiling, and occasionally the port or starboard side taking the place of the ceiling, even a tart made of tinned greengages might be excused if it gradually lost some of its fresher tints. I meant to sit out the young gentleman from Glasgow, but when I saw him take up one of these tarts with evident intent of eating it, I left. It was not easy to get fixed on the plate shelf, but it was done at last, and I even got to sleep. From time to time, it seemed at least every hour, I was awakened by the thuds of the sea as it thundered down on deck, and with a rushing noise swept backwards and forwards till it finally cleared off. Alas for the hapless Japanese family with their frail tenement of boxes and their poor shelter of tarpaulin. It was piteous to think how the night must have sped with them and with the other poor wretches battened down in the hold. 
there was no limit to the variety of the motion of the little tub adrift on the angered ocean there is among sea-going passengers a difference of opinion as to whether pitching or rolling is the least bearable we had both in succession with a quite new and original motion as if the vessel were trying to jump sideways over a yawning chasm and always failing was pitched ruthlessly to the bottom of the abyss once the bows coming upon a roller were pitched so high that the vessel seemed literally standing on end there was a moment during which i distinctly felt it poised trembling in every plank undecided whether since it had come so far it was worth while going back and whether on the whole it would not be better to go over backwards as a rearing horse sometimes falls on its rider i remember assisting at the deliberation without particularly caring how it ended the force of habit prevailed and the vessel righted herself and by way of change began to roll thus the night wore on and thus in slightly modified degree the day was spent i heard afterwards that the captain had vainly tried to run for shelter into a little fishing port on the coast but wind and sea proved too strong for him he could not fetch the port could only lie out with the engines at full pressure driving the ship along at the rate of two miles an hour the night continued light whereby possibly catastrophe was averted but what with the waves constantly washing over the steamer and the spindrift blinding the lookout man it was hard to see where we were going the young gentleman from glasgow got up and went resolutely to his breakfast i remained on the shelf and spent quite a pleasant day eating a pomelo and reading mr edmund yates's land at last the cupboard though a little close with the door shut had some corresponding advantages for example you might if you liked having opened the door step out of bed on to the dining-room table an arrangement which i do not remember to have seen perfected even in the best appointed houses in england short of that you might lie in bed and making a long arm help yourself from the breakfast table thus i obtained a woodcock on toast it is well there was toast as there was singularly little woodcock the young gentleman from glasgow ate five and then took some dubious compound labelled jam i never saw such a fellow for puddings cakes jams and other unwholesome compounds i believe that if the worst had come and struggling in the water someone had thrown him a plank and a gooseberry tart he would have gone for the gooseberry tart we were to have reached yokkaichi at two o'clock at noon we were still out in the open sea and it was clear that if ever we reached yokkaichi at all it would not be till after midnight the wretched engineer had now gone round on a fresh tack and was as despondent as he was yesterday hopeful the gale had considerably abated but it had left its mark upon the waters through which the little vessel floundered the engineer for our comfort sent down word that the comparative quietude now prevalent would not last very long a spit of land was sheltering us from the full wrath of the sea but when we rounded the point now within view we should have it all under these circumstances it was better to stop on the shelf where i felt no discomfort except when the captain and officers came down to their meals then we were obliged to shut the cabin door after waiting till we had rounded the point and nothing particular happening we got up to dinner and did very well the melancholy duck turned out excellent and there were some more pale tarts for the young gentleman from glasgow it was now announced that we should be at yokkaichi at midnight and the question arose whether we should stay on board another night or straightway go ashore it was decided that we should sleep on the shelf once more a prospect the less appalling since we had now got into smoother water and by midnight the steamer would be at anchor in the bay 
this was a resolution we subsequently had occasion to regard with thankfulness ito undertook to go ashore as soon as the steamer had dropped anchor and arrange for an early start in jinrikishas in the morning i did not question ito too closely about his experiences they were in truth written upon his face and in the pervading limpness of his bearing amongst the experiences crowded into his yet young life was a brief sojourn on an english man-of-war he had he believed permanently gained his sea-legs on this cruise and on boarding the steamer at yokohama had assumed a certain rakish nautical bearing that was quite reassuring one felt that if anything happened to the captain or the engineer it was well that ito was on board but there is no use in disguising the fact that ito like some other seasoned sailors had been utterly routed during the storm and he was now eager to go ashore at the first possible opportunity in the early morning between one and two o'clock i was awakened by a tremendous hubbub on deck men ran about wildly shouting half a dozen captains seemed giving orders at the same time the noise lasted five or six minutes when it ceased as suddenly as it had arisen and a deep silence fell over the steamer now at anchor in the bay it was clear enough what all this meant a fleet of sampans had come up to take off passengers had clamorously got their fares and had gone away i turned over and went to sleep in the certainty that the faithful ito would come off for us at six in the morning when i awaked it was already half past six and ito had not come whilst we were taking a cup of tea and a biscuit a japanese entered with profound bows and made a long speech with the assistance of the chinese cook we made out that ito had sent him off to bring us ashore this seemed strange as ito was not accustomed to delegate part of his duty to others there was however no help for it so we went off with the strange man being sculled across the bay in a sampan that threatened to upset with every motion of the oar it was a grey morning with clouds lying low on the hills the bay was large and singularly lonely the only shipping it contained beside our own never-to-be-forgotten craft was a junk of fantastic form with rudder standing out from the stern at right angles as if after prolonged bickering it had come to the conclusion it would have nothing more to do with the ship this appearance was due to a habit of the japanese mariner of hauling his rudder up out of the water so as to save wear and tear whilst at anchor we anxiously scanned the quay in search of ito but he was not among the group gathered there this began to look serious it was certain he would be there if he were alive and could walk apprehension was increased by the replies of our guide to persistent questions of where's ito he invariably pointed to the water with finger downward which could only mean that ito was drowned this was a saddening conviction what was to become of the poor old mother and her provision for daily prayer when the staff of her life was lying under the dark waters of this gloomy bay our guide on landing led us to a tea-house close by the quay here surely we should find ito if only his body but there was no sign of him and nothing could be learned from the crowd that gathered round us at the door the guide made signs for us to enter the jinrikishas that were waiting a step we were not inclined to take not knowing whither it would lead and anxious above all things to get some clue to ito's whereabouts after some delay and finding explanation hopeless we thought it best to go on and were whirled through the narrow and dirty streets for a distance of about a mile we drew up at another tea-house and there arrayed in a miscellaneous costume of borrowed garments with his teeth visibly and audibly shaking in his head was the lost guide his story was brief but thrilling the steamer had brought up at her moorings about one o'clock in the morning two or three sampans came along to take off passengers who crowded in the gangway 
anxious to leave the ship on any terms. Critically surveying the scene, Ito had sagaciously come to the conclusion that the first sampan was dangerously overladen. He awaited the second, into which sixteen people, all told, managed to pack themselves. There was a big swell on in the bay, a legacy of the gale of the previous night. The stern of the sampan was driven under the lower step of the gangway. There was a violent shove, a loud shriek, and in an instant the sixteen passengers were floundering in the water. Ito went down under the boat, and, he added, I thought I was never coming back again. But he scrambled out, as did thirteen others, for it was bright moonlight, and there were several sampans round. Unhappily, a woman with a baby on her back sank, and her body had not been recovered when we left the village. This sampan, we remembered, was the one we should have gone in had we arranged to go on shore at night. I do not know whether the passengers were invited to return to the ship and change their clothing before proceeding. What is certain is that the sampan being righted, they got in, and huddled together, dripping wet under a bitter cold wind coming down from the mountains, were sculled across the dreary two miles that separated them from the shore. When he reached the quay, Ito had to take a drive in a jinrikisha to the tea-house where we found him, and where he arrived, more dead than alive, at half-past two in the morning. Whilst under the water he lost his pocket-book containing his reserve cash, and, worse still, the silver watch Miss Bird had given him as a memento of his journeying with her across unbeaten tracks. But the philosophical mind that had, unruffled, heard of the destruction of his house and the burning out of his mother, remained unshaken. Tried by fire and water, Ito came out equally uncomplaining. "'It's a bad job,' he said, as he turned his garments over the fire and extracted the last drop of water out of his shoes. "'But it can't be helped. The worst of it is this here salt water takes such a long time to dry.' Ito concluded to finish the drying of his clothes as he went along, and we got under way a little after nine o'clock. The district greatly differed from what we had seen further north. The houses in the village were meaner in appearance, the people were poorer and less light-hearted. Houses were built of a hard wood that turned grey like oak, imparting a dead monotony to the scene. As we got further inland the country improved, and the people seemed less depressed. Presently the road began to run by the feet of green hills, with every nook carefully cultivated. We stayed for luncheon at Skeko, a poor little town where the sight of Europeans was evidently a rarity. As we moved about looking at the shops, the throng at our heels increased till it seemed that all the village had turned out. An old woman was weaving, with the assistance of some simple machinery, as old as the first shogun. She was pleased with the interest her work excited in the breast of the foreigner, but as we stood and looked on, the heat and pressure of the throng grew insupportable, and we were glad to seek comparative privacy in the tea-house. We had afternoon tea at a place called Tsutiyama. Just as we were leaving, one of my men's sandals broke. He hardly stopped the procession to pull it off, and was going ahead, evidently intending to run the remaining ten or twelve miles with one bare foot. I insisted upon buying him a pair of sandals, which cost a penny. The next day a man in one of the other jinrikishas lost his shoe, and ran more than twenty miles barefooted without any sense of inconvenience, much less of hardship. In this district tea is largely grown, the plant very much resembles an overgrown clump of box. We crossed several rivers by bridges just now many sizes too large for them, but that in due time these bare beds of gravel will be covered with rushing water is plain enough. In some parts, where the road stands high and dry above the bed of the river, large slices have been cut away by the rushing tide. This must have happened not later than July, but gaps still stand, making the road impassable for horse or bullock traffic. 
the jinrikishas can just get past in some places by making a detour in others profiting by a perilous ridge of roadway that has remained with the exception of these accidents the road is a good one we slept at tagawa a pretty hamlet nestling at the foot of a hill the hills here are very curious being perfectly bare brown or red sandstone rocks standing up out of the greenery they are thoroughly japanese of the coolie class seeming to have got up in the morning and gone out without putting on any superfluous clothing in the early morning we toiled through the steep pass that winds its way through the hills and descending at a rapid trot reached Otsu, where we had tiffin within view of lake bewa here we found train for kyoto and gladly took it for it had been raining all the morning and the slow process of drying ito's clothes had been disastrously interrupted End of chapter three Chapter Four of East by West: A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two, by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four: The Capital of the Mikados. Of all the towns in Japan accessible to the foreigner, Kyoto is by far the most interesting. Compared with it in point of years, Tokyo is but a stripling. And Yokohama a puny infant. When in 1590 Tokyo, then known as Yedo, was made the capital of eastern Japan, Kyoto had been Miyako, or residence of the sovereign, for 800 years. This far reaching antiquity is modified by the fact that Kyoto has many times received the baptism of fire like all japanese towns it has been burnt several times and what the fire has not destroyed at one time it has attacked at another the palace itself has been destroyed by fire six times within the last one hundred and eighty years as for the city so recently as eighteen sixty four it was half burnt as an episode in the civil war nevertheless it preserves in unmistakable manner its old-time look it lies in a valley with a chain of hills almost encircling it through its midst flows the kanagawa after the summer rains a noble river but in november when i saw it a streamlet trickling through a wide bed of pebbles apparently in imminent danger of losing its way there is no european quarter in kyoto and judging by the behaviour of the natives i should say that the average of europeans finding their way thither in the course of a year is small we did a good deal of miscellaneous shopping and wherever we went there assembled a crowd of people of all ages and both sexes they were very quiet and not intentionally rude but their capacity for a prolonged steady stare is infinite what they saw did not at least not immediately suggest interchange of remark they did not whisper or point with finger they just stood and dumbly stared watching every slightest motion or gesture of the strange beings who had dropped from heaven knows where upon the streets of their city on the night of our arrival we went to a barber shop for a shave necessary after four days travel as our jinrikishas drew up the crowd began to gather and when it was discovered that two englishmen were actually about to be shaved the excitement throughout the quarter deepened in intensity the crowd blocked up the narrow street those behind trying to see over the heads of others in front whilst the thrice fortunate ones in the first line flattened their noses against the window and steamed it with their breath inside the shop there was a reflex of the excitement the barber himself though pale was collected in manner and gave me only one gash but his whole family were ranged in a group in the kitchen which opened into the shop the assistant stood around from time to time handing unnecessary articles to the operator 
the most hopeless case was the small boy whose duty it was to stand by and hand paper combs brush towel or whatever might be needed by the barber he stood at the elbow of the chair whilst i was being shaved with his face half a foot from mine his lips slightly parted and a pair of great brown eyes unnaturally extended fixed on my face i fancy he was in a condition of modified catalepsy at any rate he neither moved nor spoke whilst the barber rasped me and when i vacated the chair in favour of the young gentleman from glasgow he began afresh on him it was the most villainous shave i ever suffered a dinner-knife would have been for the purpose a luxurious article compared with the razor i besought the barber to let me off but without avail it was the opportunity of a lifetime and he would not limit its duration by any voluntary act we had brought ito with us a necessary precaution otherwise before we could have made our protest understood we might have had a few bald places artistically arranged on our heads and perhaps our eyebrows shaved off in the manner of the japanese after much haranguing ito induced the man to let me go to the manifest disappointment of the crowd who were consoled only by seeing the young gentleman from glasgow take the chair finally the barber charged one and eightpence for his fiendish work which considering we had left the united states seemed dear for a shave the price to a native would have been twopence halfpenny at most and he would in addition have had his ears and nostrils shaved and his hair brushed and oiled this was noticeable as the only attempt to charge extra to a foreigner which came under my personal notice in japan the streets of kyoto are not quite so densely crowded as those of tokyo but there is about them the same air of good-humoured bustle kyoto has the advantage of larger masses and greater variety of colour in tokyo yokohama and throughout the north generally it is not good taste to dress in colours the empress it is true comes out on state occasions in a blaze of glory but that is the exception to her habitude she being on other occasions dressed with the quiet good taste of japanese ladies in the north dark blue unrelieved by any variety is the ordinary walking dress of the ladies and women in lower stations adopt the custom the southern blood of the kyoto ladies revels in colours of brighter hue a peacock is nothing to a kyoto girl out for the day a parakeet is more closely imitated in respect of plumage bright reds violets greens and yellows are frequently seen adorning the same little person where matronhood suggests greater sobriety the average is struck with the assistance of the baby children are dressed in the most fantastic style looking like little cardinals as they play about the streets in long wadded robes of many colours it is notable that whilst in the north women and children carrying infants on their back wrap them closely up within their dress so that nothing but a little round head is visible the kyoto women whilst obliged to enclose the babe within their garment are careful to leave hanging loosely outside in full view the child's cloak a purple cloak picked out with red and lavishly turned up with yellow at the sleeves is too precious a gift to be withheld from the enjoyment of the public there are some pretty girls in tokyo and yokohama and there are some ugly ones in kyoto eight out of every ten girls met in the streets of kyoto are good-looking and five are decidedly pretty they wear their hair differently from their sisters in the north who for the most part are content to observe the general local custom of arranging it in a chignon at the back in kyoto a young lady takes the chignon pad and instead of laying it flat to her head fixes it at right angles after which all kinds of arrangements are possible artificial flowers are largely used to complete the adornment of the kyoto belle's hair in the north except on high festive occasions this is very rare 
girls there are content with thrusting a pin through the chignon the kyoto girl has several pins in addition to a gaily coloured flower wired so that it may stand an inch or two above the topmost flight of her hair the chignon shares with the obi the provision of opportunity to the japanese lady to display her wealth and her taste any amount of money may be spent in pins for the hair the obi is the sash with which both men and women in japan girdle their kimono or outward robe it is made of silk runs to great length is wound twice round the waist and in the case of ladies is made into a stupendous bow at the back a japanese girl can by a glance at the obi and the value of the pins in the back hair reckon up the measure of affluence enjoyed by a lady she may pass in the street or meet in a tea-house the obi frequently costs more than the kimono itself ito from whom i have many confidences tells me that he gave thirteen and a half yen equal to about two pounds twelve shillings english for his obi whilst his kimono only cost twelve yen but then ito is a man of luxurious habits in respect of his clothing the day after our arrival at kyoto he came out in a perfectly new suit the coat and waistcoat of rakish homespun calculated to give him a sporting air and a pair of plaid trousers which i believe he selected from his wardrobe as a delicate attention to the young gentleman from glasgow these were happily saved when ito was submerged in the bay at yokaitsi on our way hither what chiefly troubles ito's soul now is the condition of his shoes these were bought new for this trip and were much admired in the seductive hour of calm weather when we were steaming through the waters of yokohama bay into the stormy pacific when he went under water his shoes of course went with him on landing at yokaiti he gave them to one of the maidens to dry she seems to have taken the surest means to that end by putting them in the hibaiti where a hole was burned clean through the soul ito who since we set forth on our journey has received with calm resignation the news of the burning of his house and the imminent escape of his mother who has scarcely murmured against the evil fate which having first tried him with fire whelmed him in water is sorely taxed by this disaster to his shoe as we were taking our boots off before entering the ancient temple of hishi hon guan i saw him gazing forlornly at the cruel wound in his soul the streets in kyoto with the exception of one or two thoroughfares crossing the city are curiously narrow passing through some lanes in a jinrikisha it would have been almost possible to sit in the middle of the road and help yourself from the stores displayed in the shops on either hand the buildings are very low so much so that glancing down their lengths it seems as if they were all one story high this however is not the case as on entering there is invariably found a low-ceilinged suite of rooms up a steep staircase all the roofs are deeply gabled there not being a straight line anywhere in view in the bright sunlight and under the blue sky arched over the city even in these november days the streets are full of pleasant pictures at night when chinese lanterns hang from shop fronts and others go twinkling through the throng pendant on the right-hand shaft of the jinrikisha it looks like a scene taken from a superlatively well-appointed stage i had heard at yokohama that everything was very dear at kyoto but that does not tally with my experience i know that among other investments i paid a halfpenny to visit a zoological garden and an uncommonly good collection it was the yard which contained it backed into the surrounding houses which though perhaps objectionable on sanitary grounds supplied opportunity to the residents for gratuitous observation on the mincing ways of the owl the lofty manners of the hawk and the indolence of the young alligator 
Also they could hear through the live-long day the momentarily repeated lesson of the parrot as it was taken in the proprietor's hand. The show was run by a family who divided the labour, one taking money at the gate, another stirring up the monkey, a third making the parrot talk, and others showing round generally the constant stream of visitors. Kyoto is full of shops for the sale of lacquer work, china and bronzes. These are worth visiting, but I like better to stroll through the shops of the second-hand dealers, where all kinds of miscellaneous articles are stored, and now and then something worth picking up is discovered. The rain which came down in torrents yesterday has passed off, and the many colours which fill the streets are glowing in the summer sun. The storm passed away last night with a sunset of singular beauty. Scarcely any crimson in the sky, only the west suffused with rich golden light. The morning view from the Ya'ami Hotel is very beautiful. The hotel stands well up on a hill embowered in trees. In the valley beneath, almost hidden under a veil of white mist, lies the town. Beyond it is a thicker cloud of mist, through which rise the tops of hills just beginning to glow in the newborn sunlight. Whilst the mist still lies closely over the town, hiding all trace of human habitation, it seems as if we had gone back to primeval times, when water filled the valley and the silent hills looked down upon the solitary lake. The Mikado's Palace, one of the principal attractions for the foreigner in Kyoto, is now closed to the public, and according to the present intentions of the authorities will not be reopened. We were favoured by a special dispensation, and had full opportunity of wandering through the palace. The residence stands within an area of twenty-six acres, intruders being kept off by a thick roofed wall of earth and plaster. There are six massive gates, against which a mob unprovided with artillery might thunder in vain. Inside is a vast gravelled area its bareness broken here and there by a few trees. Standing within the enclosure we could see nothing of the town, the horizon above the height of the wall being broken only by the green hills that girdle it. A European gardener would make a paradise of the place, with springy turf, fountains and flower-beds, but Japanese gardening runs largely to gravel, and where we have green refreshing lawns, Japan has barren stretches of gravel or soil beaten hard. On approaching the first room of the palace we were required to take off our boots, a ceremony preliminary to entering any building from a tea-house to a temple. Sometimes, in respect of the temples, the game has turned out to be not worth the slipper, there was quite a posse of attendants detached to accompany us through the palace, where one intelligent man would have done equally well. They were attired in ordinary Japanese dress, though I dare say on festive occasions they proudly produce a rumpled suit of black broadcloth and a pair of white cotton gloves, such as their colleagues wore at the review on the Mikado's birthday, and such as undertakers wear in England. I do not know why they should have been present in such numbers, but it was evidently not with the intention of making themselves useful. The governor of Kyoto had politely sent one of his secretaries to accompany us through the palace. This gentleman, with the excessive courtesy of the Japanese, would not allow us to carry our own boots. In such case it seemed not improbable that some of the able-bodied servants who followed us about might carry a pair but that was not an idea that occurred to them, and pleasurable contemplation of the works of art in the palace was disturbed by repeatedly coming upon the governor's secretary taking shortcuts with four pairs of boots under his arm. We entered by a suite of apartments in which the daimios seeking audience of the Mikado were wont to assemble. There is a series of apartments known as the Chrysanthemum Room, the stork room and the tiger room in reference to the subjects treated on the panels of the sliding walls. 
unlike the residences of some sovereigns which the public are privileged to gaze upon here are no mighty four-post bedsteads no full-bottomed chairs no tapestry no carpets nor hangings no portraits of ancestors nothing but the bare room with its thickly matted floor its artistically decorated walls and its ceiling always of beautiful wood the absence of paint in their dwelling-houses compels the japanese to seek colour and variety in the grain of various woods and within their own country they find a rich field the throne room reached from the waiting-rooms by a corridor is a long bare apartment with a canopied chair set near the centre the chair is lacquered and richly inlaid with mother-of-pearl the canopy consists of white silk trimmed with deep border of reddish brown at first sight it looks like chintz as the attendants entered they all bowed low to the empty throne repeating the obeisance whenever they passed or approached it in this room the new mikado is solemnly enthroned and here through successive new year's days a long line of mikados now sleeping in the dust have given audience to peers of the realm it is not actually the same room since the palace as already mentioned has more than once been destroyed by fire but it is built up again as nearly as possible a copy of the old one with the same provision for ceremonial immediately facing the throne is a courtyard access to which is gained by eighteen steps these correspond with the grades into which the imperial officials are divided those who have not reached the dignity of being allowed to stand on the lowest step are known as fige or down on the earth a wall at the back of the throne is divided into panels each containing four portraits of chinese sages above these hang two excellent oil portraits of the mikado and the empress it must not be supposed that either sacred personage went through the process of sitting for the vulgar artist but even a mikado may without suffering in his dignity hold communication with the sun this conceded the illustrious pair were photographed and from the photograph an able artist in milan evolved the oil paintings we had been permitted to walk at will over the throne room but when we came to a suite of private apartments called the ko gosho one of the attendants was found to have sufficient energy to forbid entrance we might walk about the veranda and look in at the beautifully painted panels but the tread of a foreigner albeit bootless must not desecrate the floor this suite of rooms faced a pretty garden with maple trees glowing in reds and yellows and a moss-grown stone bridge spanning a fish pond the on mi ma august three rooms is that portion of the palace where the mikado was wont to watch the performance of the no players this place is marked by a dais raised six inches from the ground on which the mikado sits the stage is some distance off and as now when not in use is cut off from the imperial apartments by a wooden hoarding amongst the decorations of this room is a wonderful group of horses drawn with their heads and tails down and their legs stiffly pendant in the attitude a beast falls into when it is being lowered into the hold of a ship with a band round its belly japanese artists are great in birds and flowers but they ludicrously fail when they come to draw any kind of an animal the seiryo den is used chiefly for levies in one of the rooms a corner of the floor is strewn every morning with earth so that the mikado may worship his ancestors without descending to the ground except for the panels some of the ceilings and the beautiful wood used for doors and screens there is not much to attract in the palace but it is impossible to turn in any direction without being confronted with evidence of the reverence with which the person of the mikado was regarded even during the long period when he was practically a prisoner of state 
a crowned puppet of the shogun's sovereigns in western states are more or less servilely approached as human beings placed on lofty pedestals the mikado was and in considerable measure yet is more than a human being his office was of heavenly ordination and he is descended through a long line of personages who figure in popular mythology how long this will last it might not be friendly to inquire but undoubtedly the most suicidal blow the mikado has struck at his own mystic authority fell when he signed the decree of compulsory national education End of chapter four Chapter five of East by West A Journey in the Recess Volume two by Henry W. Lucy This Librivox recording is in the public domain Chapter five Temples and Worshippers The many gods whose shrines and temples stand thickly in all the towns of Japan have grown into the condition of deity almost under the eyes of the people they have been for the most part military heroes or prominent ministers under successive sovereigns had the duke of wellington lived in japan he would by this time have been a god with his shrines and temples his many priests and the rin reigning throughout the day into his gridironed money-box so would lord nelson so would the first duke of marlborough and lord randolph churchill instead of busying himself with politics might have been abbot of the principal family shrine it was thus that mitizane came to be a deity and to have his temple at kyoto and elsewhere mitizane was third minister of state to the mikado towards the end of the ninth century his rapid advance and his personal influence exciting the jealousy of a colleague named tokikira finally led to his degradation and banishment he died in exile and was buried by the roadside as his body was being carried to the cemetery in a bullock car the animal stopped and since it could not by any means be induced to go farther the disgraced minister was buried on the spot there does not seem anything very extraordinary in this incident the reasonable conclusion would appear to be that the bullock was tired perhaps having been out on a job earlier in the day but combined with other portents the mikado troubled in his conscience saw in this a heavenly sign he withdrew the decree of banishment conferred his former earthly rank upon the dead man and without more to do made a god of him the bull which played so prominent a part in establishing mitizane's posthumous career is largely represented in his temple at kyoto amongst other models there are two one in black marble and the other a curious speckled red these bulls and all others in and about the temple are covered with pellets of chewed paper cast at them by devotees a man or woman in doubt as to some particular course contemplated comes here chews a bit of paper makes a pellet of it and standing at some distance throws it at the bull deciding according to the spot on which the pellet sticks something akin to this pagan habit is found in england where a man halting between two courses determines them by tossing up a halfpenny on the left as the temple is approached there is a curious picture gallery with more bulls and other objects marvellously painted these are also covered with pellets of chewed paper i was much struck with one painting representing two men in scanty clothing holding by a halter a lively bay horse their astonishment at discovering that the horse has a sky-blue eye is very graphically delineated curious-looking animals understood to be tigers are carved in great numbers wherever they are within reach they have pieces of paper string tied round their forelegs just above the heel which gives them the appearance of tigers with their garters slipping down the temple itself is like an old curiosity shop full of mirrors and lanterns at the upper step 
close by a large cloth covered with rin, an old man knelt in prayer. He was terribly in earnest, clapping his hands to arrest the attention of the god, wringing them with gestures of piteous entreaty, and pleading in broken voice for blessing or forgiveness. At the foot of the steps were half a dozen men and women also engaged in prayer, but none had the earnestness of this old man, who neither saw nor heard anything around him. The temple of Rio Midsudera, like that at Asaksa, is approached through an avenue crowded with little shops and penny shows, which give it the appearance of a fair. It was a fete day when we visited it, and the dense crowd was always passing up or down. In the porch of the temple, amongst other votive offerings, was a large lock of greasy black hair tied with string to a wooden frame. This, Ito explained, was the offering of a man who had probably been too much given to drink. He had come there, taking a vow to abstain, and in token thereof had cut off his hair and hung it up. Another votive offering was a vivid picture of an explosion on a steamship, with full account of the catastrophe and of the providential escape of the pious votary. In a little recess close by the altar, three priests were driving a flourishing trade in the sale of charms. For a penny I bought two, one warranted to hold me scatheless against thunder, and the other securing for me general good fortune. Before the altar were seated a row of worshippers repeating the name of Buddha at the rate of sixty times a minute, and marking off the tallies with beads on a string. One man, a skilled practitioner, must have repeated the word a thousand times whilst we looked on, working his hands about the while. With equal expenditure of energy, he might in the same time have knit the foot of a pair of stockings, or mended his clothes, or done some other useful work. To one of the pillars before the altar was attached a wooden box in which were copies of Buddhist scriptures. Worshippers coming in unprovided took up one of these little books, said their prayers, returned the book to the box, and went their way. At the other side of the altar was a large open trunk, with innumerable bits of bamboo in it having writing upon them. I saw people as they passed throw in a bit of stick. Ito explained that this is one of the most honourable customs of the church. If a man has at heart any special desire, he will go to the temple, carrying with him as many bits of bamboo as he numbers years. On each he writes his name, age, and the object of his desire. Then he makes the circuit of the temple as many times as he has lived years, praying before every shrine, and as he passes the wooden trunk he throws in one of the pieces of bamboo. For instance, Ito says, if I wanted to get back my watch which I lost when the boat upset in Yokaitsi Bay the other day, I would get twenty-one pieces of bamboo and go round twenty-one times, but I wouldn't do it, he added with stern resolve. Ito is Shinto and looks with contempt upon the superstitions of the Buddhists. Yet he is full of charity. His mother, leaning towards the ancient faith, Ito makes no effort to proselytize. He even allows the old lady a fixed sum of money per week, so that, relieved from domestic cares, she may spend the whole of her days in worship. And she does, Ito says in a tone of resignation, goes out early in the morning, comes home when the temple is shut up, praying all the day. This is a common custom among the old people of the Buddhist faith. Having closed their account with life, they devote their remaining days, be they few or many, to propitiating Buddha, wearying him with incessant prayer for admittance into the heavenly state. We saw many of these people in the temple. Two, a neat old lady and a still vigorous old man, were noticeable for the business-like way in which they set about their task. They had taken possession of one of the little chapels that abound in the temple, 
a small alcove with a shrine crowded with gods and filled up with little trays bearing food each labelled with the name of the donor both man and woman were on their knees and each had a tiny wooden hammer with which they incessantly struck a small gong the old man with the selfishness of his sex had in addition possessed himself of a large bronze bell from time to time he struck this its sonorous notes drowning the sound of the woman's gong and fixing the attention of buddha exclusively upon him all the while both man and woman rapidly prayed the old gentleman occasionally breaking forth in song with most comical effect like ito's mother they had come here in the early morning and evidently meant to stay till the place was closed on a cloth before the shrine was a handful of copper coins doubtless the joint offering of the worthy couple judiciously distributed a threepenny bit will go a long way in this kind of expenditure and a day so spent need not be costly in one of the booths on the way up we saw a string of legal currency which was change for a halfpenny there were probably fifty metal coins on the string which are thus prepared for the use of the charitable and ultimately find their way to the pockets of the beggars who in this part of the island swarm about the temples a few paces farther on right opposite a large shrine was a pleasant tea-house overlooking the valley here women were sitting on the matted floor gossiping over thimblefuls of tea from this place we got a striking view of the structure of the temple which is built into the side of the hill the outer walls being supported on large wooden piles between the tea-house and the alcove where the old people prayed and hammered away at the gong a panel drawn back disclosed three women sitting over a hibaitzi smoking pipes next door was another little chapel with two old women and one young one beating gongs and saying their prayers situated at the southern side of the city is nishi hu guanji the chief temple of the western branch of this sect of buddhism the present building is nearly three hundred years old and is a splendid specimen of the architecture of the time unlike the gaudy temples at nikko the wood and stonework are left in their natural colour which centuries have toned down to a soft grey a feature peculiar to the temple is the extensive suite of state apartments in these the priests receive distinguished guests from the mikado downwards the largest room has its panels decorated with paintings of storks by famous artists there are also some wonderful specimens of carved storks about the woodwork the various rooms which in addition to being connected by a long corridor open into each other by sliding panels are each decorated with a special design one chrysanthemums another peacocks and cherry trees a third with marvellous chinese landscapes on a dead gold ground outside the temple is a gateway which formerly belonged to a shinto temple but as frequently happens with sections of temple buildings in japan it was transported hither there is much carving on this gateway the figure on one of the panels telling a pretty story ki yo yo having had a proposal modestly made to him that he should resign the throne is here figured in the act of washing the ear that has suffered the indignity of receiving the proposal so great is the insult that nothing less than a waterfall will serve the cleansing purpose the artist accordingly puts in the waterfall pretty thick but eastern fancy does not stop here a little farther on are the figures of a man and a cow the latter drinking from a pool below the waterfall the man owns the cow and he is glaring upon ki yo yo for thus polluting the water which his cow was drinking he cannot contain his rage at the thought that his cow should even after a waterfall drink from a stream tainted with such a proposal i do not know anything in western literature or art that can go beyond this in expressing contempt 
the Japanese painters do not fall short of the artists in wood in reproducing water effects. One of these state apartments is known as the Wave Room. The walls are covered with paintings of desperate seas, looking at first sight like agglomerations of logs rounded at the head and bulging out in the middle. On the ceiling, in every panel, there is a freely drawn object, which I thought was meant to represent large shells of a species unknown in Great Britain. These are, however, waves, and it is the glory of the artist that though there are over a hundred, each one is turned a different way. A terrible sight for Ito, who has not yet got over his experiences by sea. The temple itself, like all belonging to this particular sect, is very plain, this characteristic being so marked that it might almost be taken for a Shinto temple. It was close upon four o'clock when we arrived, and at the stroke of the hour a priest appeared and drew the gilt shutters across the altar. With the punctuality that marks the movements of the British workmen at the dinner hour, he shut out from further devotion for the day a young man who, conscious of being late, had been vigorously praying. There were three shrines, and as one was closed by the businesslike priest, the young man hopped off to the other. When the last panel of the last shrine was closed, he skipped across the matted floor to the open door where he had left his clogs. We passed on to the Ami Dado, and there, before the yet open shrine, knelt the industrious young man. Close by this temple is a pavilion, named in the Japanese language after the flying clouds. This was to me one of the most interesting buildings in Kyoto, for here, more than two hundred years ago, lived in the flesh Hideyoshi an able and valiant Japanese who left his mark deeply cut in the history of his country. Apart from this personal connection, the building is attractive by reason of its age. In a city periodically burned, this narrow, lofty building has stood unharmed. It is set in an old-fashioned garden, dark with the shadow of ancient trees and crowded with conifers. There is a pool in which grow goldfish of prodigious size. They seem as if they had been born in Hideyoshi's time and had been slowly growing ever since. The place is in the custody of an old gentleman, the nimblest for his years I ever looked upon. He was dressed in an old brown kimono, shaped after the fashion of a monk's gown. He wore no hat, had not shaved for many days, and was in a state of spasmodic excitement at sight of three Europeans, who would probably tip him before they left. We were in constant danger of losing him, as he generally ran ahead through the winding walks, returning to find us standing, belated, discussing by which turn he had disappeared. He was into the house like a shot, and before we had reached the door he had opened the side of a room and was loudly clapping his hands over the pool beneath. This looked like active lunacy, but he was only calling the fish, who came up under the window in shoals. A steep staircase, with steps about twice the ordinary height, led up, room over room, to the topmost story, where was Hideyoshi's bedroom. It was, of course, bare, but there were some curious and interesting panels on the walls representing the old nobles in wonderful costumes, their skirts swelled out by exaggerated crinolines. One, with a curiously flattened look, was squatted on the floor under a weight of clothes that seemed to preclude the possibility of his ever getting up again. He was, Ito said, something under Hideyoshi and indeed he did look sat upon. Another panel held all that was left of a view of Fuji, faded now almost to nothing. Some Japanese humorist has called it the Fuji of good manners, because in order to catch its dim outline you must bend low. Hideyoshi's bath is on the ground floor, just as he left it when he was steamed for the last time. 
it is a somewhat elaborate contrivance with a furnace and pipes for conveying the steam into the box in which the great man used to sit and parboil himself this humble domestic appanage seemed to bring one very near to old japan it was as if hideyoshi had but just stepped out after taking his bath as if the shogun's empire with its blindness its ignorance its feudalism and its ferocity were still a living thing and the new japan with its railways its telegraphs its post office its system of national education its liberal foreign policy and its coming house of commons a disordered dream End of chapter five Chapter Six of East by West A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six The New Empire in the West. During my stay in Japan, I had the advantage of many interesting conversations, both with Mr. Inouye and Mr. Ito, on the condition and prospects of this interesting country in order to enable me to acquire full and accurate knowledge on the subject the foreign minister laid all the departments of the state under contribution and i received from each statements which contain the latest and most accurate statistics of the trade commerce and general condition of the empire i have thrown them together in the present chapter imperial family and government the dynasty of the empire of japan was established by the emperor jimmu in 660 b c and to the throne have succeeded from generation to generation the same dynasty without interruption up to the present time in the twelfth century the imperial power once declined and the political power of the empire fell to the hands of the successive military chieftains shoguns namely Gengi, Hojio, Ashikaga, Oda, Toyotomi, and Tokugawa, for the period of about seven hundred years. In 1868 the present government stripped the Bakufu government of its political power, and thus achieved the restoration of the imperial power. In 1871 all the daimyos returned their territories to the emperor, and thus the political administration has become uniform. The present emperor was born at Kyoto on November the third, eighteen fifty two, and succeeded to the throne of his father, Komei Tenno, on january the ninth, eighteen sixty eight. On the twenty eighth of December of the same year, the daughter of Itsijio Fuziwara Tadaka Daizin was made the empress. She was born at Kyoto on the twenty eighth of may, eighteen fifty. In regard to the imperial succession established according to the usages of ancient times, the rule of primogeniture is observed whenever the reigning emperor dies. Females may also succeed to the throne, and there are many examples where they have done so. If the throne becomes vacant by reason of the death of the reigning emperor, leaving no issue, one of the members of the four imperial branch families may be chosen as the imperial successor these four branch families have not only the same origin or common ancestor but also have been closely connected with each other by marriage the imperial expenses are fixed at the amount of one million seven hundred and forty eight thousand seven hundred and eighty five yen for the year eighteen eighty four the empire of japan is an absolute monarchy the legislative executive and judicial powers all belong to the emperor and the daijio ku one where the emperor presides and decides upon all the government affairs is the office of the executive and legislative powers where all the important affairs of the empire are supervised in this office there are one dajiyo daijin or prime minister one ga daijin one u daijin and several cabinet sangis it is usual that these cabinet sangis act respectively as the heads of the various executive departments in the present time there exists no fixed demarcation between the legislative and executive branches of the government 
but the Genroin, or Senate, established in 1875, discussed the legislative affairs, and the result of their discussion becomes law by the sanction of the Emperor after it has passed the Cabinet. In June 1883 the number of senators was 37, but there is no limitation in their number, as the usage is that they are chosen from among those who have rendered remarkable services to the state. The Sanzi Inn, or Conseil d'État, established in 1881 as a part of the Daijio Kuwan, has both the legislative and executive branches, makes drafts of the executive affairs and of rules and regulations, and discusses all drafts submitted by the heads of the respective departments, and the result of their discussion is submitted to the Senate. It also judges all the administrative controversies. In June 1883, the number of the members and assistant members was twelve and twenty-nine, respectively. The executive branch of the government is divided into ten departments, namely foreign, interior, financial, army, navy, educational, agriculture and commerce, public works, judicial and imperial household departments. The local government affairs are vested solely in the hands of the Tsiji of Fu and Rei, or Prefect of Ken the whole empire being divided into three fu and forty-four ken. In each fu and ken there is one tsiji or one rei. Also fu and ken are divided into a number of ku or districts and gun or counties, respectively, in each of which ku or gun there is its chief transacting the local affairs. In 1872, all the Tsijis and Reis were called to hold meeting at Tokyo, the meeting being called Sihoku Wan Kaigi, or the meeting of the local governors, the chief subject of their discussion being the taxes. By the imperial decree promulgated in 1873 was revised the old system of taxation of the whole empire, the revision having consumed the period of seven years. In each of the years of 1875, 1878, 1879, 1881, Tsiji and Rei were called to hold meetings to discuss the local executive affairs. In 1879, Fu and Ken assemblies were opened, the members being elected by votes and vested with the power of discussing the sole affair of the adjustment of the local taxes but the approval of Tsiji or Rei must be obtained to execute the result of their discussion. When Tsiji or Rei thinks that his approval could not be given to it, he submits his reasons for it to the Minister of the Interior for his direction. Those who are qualified to be elected members of each Fu or Ken assembly must be men of over twenty-five years of age, living in each Fu or Ken over three years, and paying land taxes upwards of ten yen. Those who are qualified to elect such members must be men of over twenty years of age, living in such fu or ken, and paying land taxes to the amount of five yen. Those who are qualified to elect members were 1,809,610 in number at the end of the year 1881. Of this number, those who were qualified to be elected were 879,347. Education and Religion On December 31st, 1881, the statistics of schools, high schools, normal schools, University of Tokyo, schools for special branches and schools of all kinds, are as follows. Schools, number 28,908 male teachers seventy four thousand four hundred and seventy three female teachers two thousand four hundred and ninety six total teachers seventy six thousand nine hundred and sixty nine male students one million eight hundred and eighty three thousand one hundred and eighty eight female students seven hundred and thirty three thousand six hundred and ninety one total students two million six hundred and sixteen thousand eight hundred and seventy nine High schools, number 173. 
male teachers 924, female teachers 10, total teachers 934, male students 12,111, female students 204, total students 12,315. Normal schools, number 71, male teachers 546, female teachers 56, total teachers 602, male students 4,557, female students 718, total students 5,275. University of Tokyo, number 2. Male teachers, 135. Female teachers, none. Total teachers, 135. Male students, 2,035. Female students, none. Total students, 2,035. Schools for special branches, number 98. Male teachers, 975. Female teachers, none. Total teachers, 975. Male students 8,795. Female students 34. Total students 8,829. Schools of all kinds. Number 1,026. Male teachers 2,026. Female teachers 572. Total teachers 2,598. Male students, 54,187. Female students, 18,073. Total students, 72,260. Totals, number of schools, 30,278. Number of male teachers, 79,079. Number of female teachers, 3,134. Total number of teachers, 82,213. Total number of male students, 1,964,873. Total female students, 752,720. Total students, 2,717,593. Among those schools, some are maintained by the government expenses or the state taxes some by fu and ken expenses or the local taxes and the money collected from the public in such fu and ken and some by private donations they are called respectively the government public and private schools the number of each of which are stated as follows government schools four public schools twenty eight thousand one hundred and thirty five private schools seven hundred and sixty nine Total schools, 28,908. Government high schools, 1. Public high schools, 158. Private high schools, 14. Total high schools, 173. Government normal schools, 3. Public normal schools, 68. Private normal schools, none. Total normal schools, 71. University of Tokyo, Government 2, Public none, Private none, Total 2. Government Schools for Special Branches 12, Public Schools for Special Branches 42, Private Schools for Special Branches 44, Total Schools for Special Branches 98. Government Schools of All Kinds none, Public schools of all kinds, 333. Private schools of all kinds, 1,469. Total schools of all kinds, 1,802. Total schools, government 22. Public 28,736. Private 2,296. Total 31,054. Of these schools, those which are under the supervision of CG and REI are public schools, which are the foundation for the extension of the education of the whole country and considered as important elements of the educational statistics. 
consequently those who attend and those who do not attend the schools together with the state of the income and expenditure of the schools are indicated as follows in eighteen eighty to eighteen eighty one the comparison of those who attain the age of attending school from full six years to full fourteen years with schoolboys and girls among those who attain such age is as follows eighteen eighty number of students attaining the age to attend schools male two million eight hundred and seventy eight thousand five hundred and eight female two million six hundred and fifty four thousand six hundred and eighty eight total five million five hundred and thirty three thousand one hundred and ninety six number of students who attend school on attaining age male one million six hundred and ninety thousand two hundred and seventy seven female five hundred and eighty one thousand five hundred and seventy three total two million two hundred and seventy one thousand eight hundred and fifty those who attend school out of every hundred of those who attain such age forty one point o six eighteen eighty one number of students attaining the age to attend schools male two million nine hundred and fourteen thousand seven hundred and twenty seven female two million seven hundred thousand two hundred and eighty total five million six hundred and fifteen thousand and seven number of students who attend school on attaining age male one million seven hundred and forty seven thousand four hundred and fifty one female six hundred and sixty six thousand one hundred and thirty five total two million four hundred and thirteen thousand five hundred and eighty six those who attend school out of every hundred of those who attain such age forty two point nine eight during the years of eighteen eighty to eighteen eighty one the annual educational income and expenditure by the local taxes and the money collected from the public are as follows eighteen eighty annual income eight million seven hundred and twenty three thousand nine hundred and seventeen yen annual expenditure six million eight hundred and eighty one thousand and ninety five yen eighteen eighty one annual income nine million six hundred and ninety three thousand and sixty three yen annual expenditure seven million nine hundred and two thousand six hundred and twenty nine yen in eighteen eighty one the number of students of such public schools was two million five hundred and eighty two thousand eight hundred and twenty six and their educational fees amounted to four hundred and four thousand two hundred and eighty seven yen the poor not being required to pay fees the property of these schools adding the value of the lands and houses belonging thereto amounted in value to nineteen million seven hundred and sixty two thousand five hundred and ninety four yen during the same year the amount of money gratuitously given for educational expenses is nine hundred and seventy seven thousand two hundred and sixty one yen and besides land and houses are in some cases given the religion is of two sects namely shintoism and buddhism in eighteen eighty one of the shinto kiyodoshi yoku or shinto preachers the number of male preachers is seventeen thousand seven hundred and fifty six and that of female preachers ninety five of the number of disciples males are one thousand two hundred and ninety nine females three of the buddhist kiyodoshi yoku or buddhist preachers males are seventy five thousand one hundred and forty four females one thousand one hundred and thirty one and of the number of their disciples males are nineteen thousand six hundred and sixty four females one thousand three hundred and forty seven the lower classes of people are generally believers in buddhism annual income and expenditure the income for the fiscal year ending in june eighteen eighty one was sixty three million three hundred and twenty thousand five hundred and sixty five yen and the expenditure of the same period sixty three million one hundred and seventy thousand eight hundred and ninety three yen the estimated income for the year ending in june eighteen eighty two was sixty eight million five hundred and seventy three thousand nine hundred and ninety five yen and that for the year ending in June eighteen eighty three sixty six million eight hundred and fourteen thousand one hundred and twenty two yen 
Sources of Revenue The expenditure for each of the said two years, estimated in the budget, is equal in amount to the revenue. The sources of revenue and branches of expenditure, estimated in the budget for the financial year ending June 1884, are as follows. Revenue Sources of revenue, estimated yen. Customs, 2,600,330. Land tax, 42,029,745. Tax on mines, 15,878. Tax on revenue of Hokkaido, 864,193. Tax on alcoholic liquor, etc., 16,768,135. Tax on tobacco, 974,199. Stamps, 886,336. Post office stamps, 2,250,000. Stamp paper used for suit, 121,642. Ship duty, 136,131. Carriage duty, 441,549. Miscellaneous duties, 2,168,582. Mineral produce, 240,941. Railways, 1,160,033. Telegraphs, 39,144. Mint, 397,811. Miscellaneous receipts, 1,848,609. Contingent income, 1,662,801. Total revenue, 75,606,059 yen. Expenditure. Branches of expenditure. Estimated yen. Redemption of public debt, 23,391,687. Civil list of the emperor and allowances to other members of the imperial family, 1,748,785. Pensions, 412,740. Council of State, 632,232. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 195,210. Ministry of Interior, 639,225. Ministry of Finance, 669,829. Ministry of War, 10,105,872. Ministry of Marine, 3,081,692. Ministry of Public Mint, 935,035. Ministry of Agriculture and Commerce, 903,297. Ministry of Public Works, 468,294. Ministry of Justice, 2,070,556. Ministry of Imperial Household, 401,460. Senate. 185,500. Legation and Consulate, 533,395. Tax Collection Office, 624,237. Custom House, 204,971. Post Office, 2,465,000. Fu and Ken, 5,332,609. Postal Service, 1,100,000. Shinto Shrine, 151,789. Repairs in cities and prefectures, 809,744. Fund for charitable purposes, 1,200,000. Miscellaneous expenses, 907,504. Contingent expenses, 14,410,281. Total expenditure, 75,606,059 yen. Among the sources of revenue, the most important is the land tax. 
Ten years ago the source of revenue had been land tax alone. Although the land tax has gradually been reduced through the land tax reform and the system of imposing other kinds of taxes has been introduced, still at present land tax amounts to 57% of the total revenue. An average rate of tax imposed on every one tan, about a quarter of an acre, of rice field is 1 yen and 16 sen, 36 sen for every one tan of dry field, and 97 sen for every one tan of residence. Of the whole population, the owners of some of these three kinds of land are more than 6,000,000 in number. The least amount of tax paid by each of these owners is 10 sen. The public debt is of two kinds, namely the home and the foreign. The home debt was made up as follows, July 1883. 4%, ten yen. 5%, yen. 6%, percent yen. 7%, yen, 8%, yen, 10%, yen, total, 219,614,150 yen, without interest, 8,555,196 yen. Total, 228,169,346 yen. Paper money in circulation, 98,290,352 yen. Total home debt, 326,459,698 yen. A great part of this debt was left to the present government for redemption by the former princes of different provinces. The foreign debt of Japan was raised in England. It comprises a 9% loan of £1 million issued in 1870, which has now all been redeemed, and a 7% loan of £2,400,000 contracted at the price of 92.5 in January 1873 which has gradually been reduced, and which stood at the amount of £1,825,100 in January 1884. Banks At the end of the year 1881, the number of the public banks was 148, of the private, 90, of specie banks, 1, and other companies which had kept some characteristics of bank, 369. The public banks and the specie bank are chartered by the government. The specie bank was established in the year 1880 with the certification of the government, and its capital amounted to 3 million yen. The total capital of the 90 private banks amounted to 10,447,000 yen, and that of quasi banks to 5,895,000 yen, January 1882. Army and Navy After the disappearance of the feudal system in Japan, the system of the regular army was introduced by the Imperial Decree of Recruitment in the year 1872, and it was amended in 1879. It was thereby ordered that every man, except the eldest sons or grandsons, and also those who had received a higher education, may be called up from the age of twenty by lot those who are called up shall be distributed to their respective military stations, and must remain for three years in the regular army. The soldier who has passed through the regular army must be for three years in the army of reserve, with liability to be called upon once for annual practice, and to be incorporated in the regular army in the time of war or other like contingent event. Leaving the army of reserve, the soldier enters the militia for four years, with liability to be called upon at a convenient place once for annual practice, and to be called up in the time of war or other like event after the army of reserve has been incorporated in the regular army. Every man from the age of seventeen till his fiftieth year is enrolled in the Landwehr, 
which body is only called upon for defensive service in time of invasion the strength of the japanese army in december eighteen eighty one was including reserves nearly one hundred and four thousand men besides there are eighty five in telegraph troops three hundred and fifty in the military college for commissioned officers eight hundred and fifty in the military college for non-commissioned officers these form the whole number of soldiers since the passing of the law of recruitment before the passing of this law there was the regular army which consisted of four hundred thousand sizoku among them there are a great many who are still fit for the military service for the naval service volunteers from the age of fifteen to twenty-five are called up the term of the service is either five or seven years the volunteers may prefer either of the two alternatives those who desire to be still in service at the end of the fixed term are allowed to be in service for every three years area and population honshu and islands belonging thereto fourteen thousand six hundred and fifty two point nine nine square re population eighteen eighty one twenty seven million six hundred and ninety one thousand seven hundred and seventy three eighteen eighty two twenty eight million seventy two thousand seven hundred and eight shikoku and islands belonging thereto area one thousand two hundred and seventeen point three six square re population eighteen eighty one two million eight hundred and twenty one thousand four hundred and eighty three eighteen eighty two two million seven hundred and forty two thousand six hundred and seventy three Kyushui and islands belonging thereto area two thousand eight hundred and twenty seven point eight square re population eighteen eighty one five million six hundred and seventy seven thousand six hundred and fifty four eighteen eighty two five million seven hundred and six thousand eight hundred and thirty six hokkaido and tsuchima area six thousand and ninety five point three six square re population eighteen eighty one one hundred and sixty eight thousand and eighty four eighteen eighty two one hundred and seventy seven thousand nine hundred and one total area twenty four thousand seven hundred and ninety four point five one square re population eighteen eighty one thirty six million three hundred and fifty eight thousand nine hundred and ninety four eighteen eighty two thirty six million seven hundred thousand one hundred and eighteen in the above table twenty four thousand seven hundred and ninety four point five one square re is equal to one hundred and forty eight thousand four hundred and fifty six square miles the specification of population according to the estimate of january eighteen eighty two is as follows male eighteen million five hundred and ninety eight thousand nine hundred and ninety eight female eighteen million one hundred and one thousand one hundred and twenty number of heads of families seven million five hundred and eighty four thousand nine hundred and eighty six average number of persons in a family four point four six at the same time the number of foreign residents is male five thousand one hundred and seventy nine and female one thousand and eight making the total of six thousand one hundred and eighty seven persons there are no recent statistics of the number of married persons but according to the estimate of january eighteen seventy six there were six million seven hundred and eighteen thousand two hundred and eighty eight husbands and six million seven hundred and eighteen thousand two hundred and eighty eight wives and twenty million nine hundred and one thousand eight hundred and twenty eight others making the total of thirty four million three hundred and thirty eight thousand four hundred and four persons the following shows the number of births for six years but the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate births is not clear eighteen seventy six male four hundred and sixty four thousand two hundred and ninety nine female four hundred and thirty eight thousand six hundred and forty seven total nine hundred and two thousand nine hundred and forty six eighteen seventy seven 
male, 455,589, female, 434,829, total, 890,518. 1878, male, 449,744, female, 425,139, total, 874,883. 1879, male, 449,550, female, 426,979, total, 876,529. 1880, male, 452,327, female, 431,257, total, 883,584. 1881, male, 476,864, female, 464,479, total, 941,343. The following is the number of deaths for the same period. 1876, male, 316,324. Female, 296,698. Total, 613,022. 1877. Male, 324,732. Female, 295,574. Total, 620,306. 1878. Male, 314,633. Female, 288,644. Total, 603,277. 1879. Male, 374,462. Female, 346,507. Total, 720,969. 1880, male, 313,668, female, 289,387, total, 603,055. 1881, male, 351,164, female, 334,900, total, 686,064. The cities containing a population of more than 100,000 are as follows, January 1882. Tokyo, in Musashi province, 823,557. Kyoto, in Yamashiro province, 239,425. Osaka, in Setsu province, 293,681. Nagoya in Owari province, 118,450. Kanagawa in Kaga province, 107,624. By the poor law promulgated in 1874, it is provided that to each helpless person, or one above 70 or below 15 years of age, and who, being crippled, is not able to do any work, one koku and eight to of rice shall be appropriated every year. In case of an abandoned child, the same quantity of rice is given to any person who brings it up until it reaches thirteen years of age. Besides this, in every locality some funds are kept to help people suffering from calamity. In Tokyo there is a poorhouse supported by local taxation. The following table shows how the land lies. Private properties. Rice field, 6,469,841 acres. Farm or garden, 4,561,412 acres. Homestead, 858,545 acres. Mountain and forest, 13,378,553 acres. Wild plain, 3,592,967 acres.
public forest twelve million nine hundred and thirty two thousand four hundred and eighteen acres there are besides no small portions of crown land which are tenanted by the people but statistics are wanting the principal agricultural products in eighteen eighty were as follows rice one hundred and fifty five million six hundred and twenty nine thousand four hundred and nine bushels barley sixty two million forty nine thousand nine hundred and forty bushels beans ten million seven hundred and ninety five thousand seven hundred and seventeen bushels the annual incomes of both the government and private forests are not known at present the government forests have in possession trees of one foot in circumference to the number of one thousand eight hundred and sixty million four hundred and ninety one thousand six hundred and forty eight the exportation of the principal agricultural products in eighteen eighty one was rice fourteen million two hundred and eight thousand one hundred and twenty eight pounds barley five hundred and one thousand four hundred and seventy six pounds beans two thousand five hundred and forty seven pounds the number of cattle is very small in eighteen eighty the cows and oxen numbered one million one hundred and twenty four thousand five hundred and sixty four and the horses one million six hundred and five thousand five hundred and forty three the principal products of the fisheries are whales sardines herrings katsuwo bonito cuttlefish cod and salmon in eighteen eighty the total number of fishers was one million six hundred and one thousand four hundred and six eight hundred and forty eight thousand two hundred and eighty eight male and seven hundred and fifty three thousand one hundred and eighteen female number of fishing boats one hundred and ninety thousand and forty five by a notification of eighteen eighty two all the mines of the country have been declared government property some of them are worked by the government and others by private individuals at present there are twelve of the former and five thousand five hundred and seventy nine of the latter in eighteen eighty one the whole expense of the mining works both governmental and private was five million nine hundred and sixteen thousand six hundred and twenty one yen while the quantity of the ores obtained in the same year was as follows gold ten thousand and sixty three ounces silver three hundred and twenty two thousand nine hundred and sixty eight ounces copper ten million three hundred and seventy six thousand six hundred and thirty three pounds iron thirteen thousand five hundred and twenty eight tons coal eight hundred and eighty one thousand two hundred and sixty one tons exports have steadily increased during the three years ending eighteen eighty two the last date available in eighteen eighty the total value of exports was over twenty seven million yen in eighteen eighty one it had risen to over thirty million and in eighteen eighty two it was thirty seven and a quarter million on the contrary imports have decreased the value in eighteen eighty being thirty six and a half million yen in eighteen eighty one little over thirty one million and in eighteen eighty two considerably less than thirty million railways and telegraphs are steadily advancing and the telephone is also making way the circulation of the letter post is one of the best tests of a nation's advance on the path of civilization in eighteen eighty one the total number of letters postcards newspapers books and samples circulated through the post was seventy four millions in the next year it had risen to over ninety millions and has gone on increasing up to the present date japan has two hundred and twenty five newspapers with an aggregate sale of over thirty seven and a half millions End of chapter six chapter twenty four of east by west a journey in the recess volume two by henry w lucy 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four Through the Suez Canal. The voyage from Aden to Suez in such weather as fell to our lot is one of dreamy delight. Leaving Aden behind, we sailed along a coast guarded by files of sentinel hills rising one above another with boundless wealth of blue sea at their feet. There is no sign of tree or verdure, but the rocks, birth of volcano, take on in the varying distance hues of infinite beauty. Close by Aden there is a miniature bay of pure white sand, shut out from the world in the rear by an impenetrable wall of rock. This is called Honeymoon Bay, because, it is said, young couples getting married have been known to sail away and build them a tent here. Further out there are a constant succession of bays sufficient to meet the honeymoon necessities of the close of a London season. We had magnificent weather and seas without a ripple till almost within sight of Suez, but the clouds had, as of old, hidden Mount Sinai as we passed. On the afternoon before we reached Suez, the wind suddenly veered round, and a summer's afternoon was instantly changed into bleakest October weather, the sun still shining, but the wind piercingly cold. The Southern Cross, constant harbinger of the coming day, was left behind, not to be seen again on this journey. The last time I saw it, midway up the Red Sea, it was shining brightly in the southern heavens, whilst to the eastward both sea and sky were suffused with the rosy tints of the coming sun. In the west, the moon and its attendant court of stars and planets shone out as brightly as if the sky were their unquestioned empire, and there was no such thing as day. On the fifth morning after leaving Aden, we awoke to find ourselves anchored at Suez. Two miles away on the left lay the town, its white-walled houses shining fair in the morning light, though I believe it is the cleanliness and beauty of a whited sepulchre. We got a nearer view of Suez as we entered the canal, and saw the long procession of mules travelling to and fro along the narrow causeway raised above the swampy level and connecting the town with the port. The French genius of the place breaks out in a little café fronting the entrance to the canal, where doubtless petits verres are to be had, after which refreshment the pleased resident may stroll along a forlorn boulevard bordered here and there with stunted funereal cypress. At Suez, in accordance with the regulations of the company, we took on board a pilot, a stout middle-aged Italian, who knew as much of English as our captain did of the language of Dante, that is to say, nothing. The necessity of engaging a pilot to take a steamer through the canal is analogous to that which exists for compelling the commander of a flat to ship a pilot on entering the metropolitan boundary of the Regent's Canal. What is wanted is a steady hand on the tiller and an eye that can follow a straight line. It might even be supposed that a pilot, in addition to the heavy impost exacted for his service, is undesirable, since a quartermaster accustomed to steer the ship would do it better if left alone. However it be, our pilot, within an hour of taking command, ran us ashore in broad daylight in a straight cut of the canal, with not a breath of wind stirring, and with no one on board having a command of the Italian language sufficiently fluent to let him know what we thought of him. The Nepal, after unaccountably wobbling to the port and starboard, finally selected the left bank and with gentle gliding motion ran on to it, her bows rising three feet in the air. The engines were already reversed, and the screw plunged and hissed through the water in the effort to withdraw the bows, but the bank held like a vice, and the only result was that the stern swung over, grounded on the opposite bank, and the screw was useless. This was a pretty interruption of a prosperous voyage, lying like a log athwart the canal, 
with the pilot aimlessly trotting up and down the bridge and no one on board able to speak italian all along the canal bank on both sides posts have been driven for use in contingencies of this kind captain wyatt leaving the pilot to his own reflections promptly had steel hawsers attached to these posts a steam winch was got to work and an effort was made to slew the stern round so that the screw could be freed after a few moments straining the hawser parted the riven end wriggling along the deck like a snake that had been cut in two fortunately no one was near and no one hurt another steel hawser was got out at the stern a second one at the bows and a united effort made to pull the ship straight to this end all the ship's company including the stewards and barber were mustered aft and the game of rolling essayed this is a simple game much enjoyed by the crew everybody gathers at one side of the quarter-deck and at a signal given by the steam whistle they run over to the other side the object being to loosen the vessel in its sandy bed and so ease the work of the cables still straining fore and aft at suez we had had put on board in addition to the pilot a representative of the egyptian government charged with the mission of seeing that the quarantine regulations under which we sailed were not broken to that end as soon as we had got under way he stretched himself out on one of the benches and went to sleep he was awakened by the shock of the grounding and evidently regarded the incident as a personal matter depriving him of his sleep i wanted him to join in the rolling exercise but he resolutely declined whilst making my advances the basis of an acquaintance subsequent developments of which consisted of his asking me for cigars he was a poor dirty disreputable looking fellow whose pitiful wages were probably in arrear he slept most of the way through the canal and faded out of sight at port Said, as it were in an earthquake a boat came alongside with the p and o agent in charge of a quarantine officer but whether to prevent the agent catching cholera from us or whether to deliver us from the danger of contagion by touch of a resident in port Said is a nice question left unsolved our quarantine man leaning over the bulwark engaged in conversation so loudly with his colleague in the boat that after various remonstrances the captain looking up from the companion ladder said take that fellow away instantly the quartermaster a giant with face simple and kindly as a child's had the representative of the egyptian government by the throat whisked him across the quarter-deck and with a parting kick sent him whizzing round the captain's cabin and for aught i know into space i never saw him any more as for the quartermaster he resumed his position at the head of the companionway looking gentler and more childlike than ever i fancy he had been yearning all through the passage to kick this lazy frowsy egyptian and was glad when the time came for half an hour the ship's company ran to and fro to their huge enjoyment then the second wire cable broke fortunately in an interval of breathing time it was evident we were in bad case nothing more could be done and a telegram was dispatched for a tug at dusk it arrived and a manila cable of prodigious size was fastened stern on but it was now low water and night was falling a jackal came to the edge of the bank looked at us and trotted off as if it were no business of his a flock of black ibis rose up from the desert spread out in single file curled like the lash of titanic whip they circled slowly round the ship and passed away out of sight the sun went down in a cloudless lurid sky and we were left alone shut up between two sandbanks the tide would be near flow at one in the morning and the crew turned in early to be piped up half an hour after midnight when the silence of the desert was broken by the tramp of men as they ran from side to side 
the tug puffed and hauled astern the steam winch strained at the cables fore and aft half a hundred men ran from side to side but still the great ship lay steadfast in her bed of mud and to move her seemed as hopeless as the endeavours to slew arabia round to join egypt once more the task was given up the only hope now was to lighten the ship and telegrams were dispatched for men and lighters the prospect was not a pleasant one ships aground as we were had been known to stick for five days till half the cargo was out we were going to breakfast with gloomy hearts when it was suddenly discovered that without apparent effort when operations were suspended except for the puffing tug the stern had slewed round into deep water the welcome vibration of the screw was felt again the tug puffed more frantically than ever the cable over the bows strained between winch and post in ten minutes the steamer slowly moved astern and we were again afloat after twenty-one hours detention it was proposed amid acclamation to put the pilot on board the tug or ship him in one of the lighters for suez but that would have been against the law of the land so he was quietly ignored and the vessel safely steered to ismailia here we made the pleasant discovery that practically no time had been lost by our misadventure if we had not been aground at the entrance to the canal we should have been at anchor in lake timsa another steamer had not only grounded but sunk a hundred yards up the canal after passing ismailia and lake timsa was crowded with steamers awaiting the removal of the block we fortuitously arrived at the end of two days detention and early the next morning were able to proceed leading a fleet of splendid steamers and passing at successive gares groups bound east moored till the line was clear our journey lay all day through a narrow ditch with the spoil bank rising at either side for the most part shutting off all view of the desert at places the canal is so narrow that as we crept along the melancholy sand-laden mimosa that fringes the banks almost brushed the side of the ship nearing port said the view widened the waters of the mediterranean began to creep over the low lands away to the left we saw what seemed far-reaching white rocks surrounded by a quiet pool of water as we drew nearer we discovered that this was an innumerable flock of flamingos standing knee-deep in the water at the firing of a gun the flock rose like a great white cloud changing to pink as mounting higher the plumage under their wings came into view we found port said crowded for the same reason that gathered a fleet at anchor at ismailia the block in the canal had thrown out of gear the traffic of two worlds and at least twenty-four hours must elapse before the tangled skein could be unravelled the yellow flag at our masthead indicated our condition of quarantine an absurd and vexatious regulation which it is not easy to see who benefits from we had a clean bill of health and were thirteen days out from bombay where there was rather less cholera than on the average throughout the year but if we had left a town tainted to the water's edge we were safe company as the seeds of cholera do not wait thirteen days for their generation nevertheless the condition of isolation was maintained with ludicrous strictness letters and newspapers for the passengers were gravely handed over with a pair of tongs letters and documents from the ship were taken up with the tongs put in a tin box and carried off at arm's length to be fumigated before being handled the passengers were condemned to remain on board for twenty-four hours during coaling and port said lost a certain sum of money they would have spent had they been allowed to go on shore to complete the comedy malta put egypt in quarantine and rather than run the risk of further annoyance and delay it was decided to steam straight home for plymouth thus losing for malta the considerable profits of a call from a p and o steamer 
early on the morning after our arrival at Port Said, a crowd began to gather on the quay right opposite the steamer's moorings. The majority of the men wore the fez, some turbans, and a few Arabs had their heads tied round with shawls. The favourite colour of dress was a shade of light blue, too cool for the state of the weather, but pretty to look at. A crowd of boats gathered in front of the quay, and men and boys in them began to undress, in spite of the keen wind that blew and made muffled-up folks shiver. Presently, from round a corner to the left, there emerged a procession. In the van came two men in short white skirts, red stockings and black skull-caps trimmed with gold lace. Behind them walked a priest, in long white gown, trimmed with frills and lace. Over this hung a crimson silk cape, rich with gold lace and embroidery, a gold embroidered cross pendant from his waist. Four boys in white gowns carried crosses and censers, and behind came a long string of rabble, running and pushing, threatening to run down the priest, as if he were the speaker, and they honourable members proceeding on the opening day of the session to hear the Queen's speech read in the House of Lords. As the procession approached, the men in the boats cast off all their clothing save a pair of drawers, and eagerly stood up. The priest, halting at the edge of the quay, took a book from a white-stoled boy, read a verse or two, raised his hands as if invoking a blessing, and then flung out seaward a golden cross. An eager spring was made at it by the half-clad men in the boats, who simultaneously leaped into the sea. I fancy one caught it before it touched the water. Nevertheless, all dived, splashed around for a minute or two, and then one sprang out and made off down the street at the top of his speed, the water dripping off him and the rabble following pell-mell. Meanwhile, the priest, the gentleman in red stockings, and the boys with the crosses had executed a strategic retreat and were retiring in good order by another street on the right. We learned, in explanation of this remarkable scene, that the day was Epiphany, and that this was the annual ceremony of blessing the Suez Canal on behalf of the Greek Church. The apparently lunatic behaviour of the damp man, madly running off with the rabble after him, was that he had secured the cross and was making for the church, where, on delivering up the treasure, he would receive a handsome money reward. We sailed just before sunset, finding the sunny skies and sapphire seas of the east changed for troubled waters and lowering clouds. After two days of dirty weather, the sea smoothed itself out, the sun shone forth, and life was once more worth living. We skirted the African coast so closely that we could see Algiers shining white in the sunlight. Crossing over in the night, we awoke to find ourselves under the lee of the rugged coast of Spain, with here and there a lighthouse, a little town lying embayed among the hills, and often only a lonely martello tower perched on a rock to speak of human habitation. Gibraltar we passed at night in a rain squall that obscured its lights, and broke out in the Atlantic to find the seas kinder and the skies bluer than they had been at the remoter end of the Mediterranean. At a time when the question of doubling the Suez Canal or making a parallel one is occupying public attention, it may be useful to state the view of the men who are most intimately acquainted with the practical bearings of the case. I had opportunity of widely gathering the opinions of captains and officers of large ships habitually using the canal, and I find them without exception in favour of widening the existing ditch. The reasons for this are simple and forcible. The chief cause of the vexatious and costly delay now habitually taking place in the canal arises from the grounding of big steamers. In places the canal is so narrow that one could jump ashore from either side of a peninsular and oriental steamer. The slightest turn of the tiller and the steamer is aground. With the canal doubled in width, this danger is reduced to a minimum. 
it is all the difference between walking on a tightrope and crossing by a plank if a second canal is made presumably of the same width as the present one this danger will still remain though reduced by one half the maximum rate of steaming permitted by the canal regulations is five miles and one-third a limitation rendered necessary by the danger arising from the force of the wash in so narrow a gut it is admitted on all hands that if the canal were doubled in width a speed of eight knots might be safely accomplished moreover vessels might steam by night whereas they are now obliged to lie up from sunset to sunrise this would shorten the passage by a day a great consideration for ship-owners, consignees, and passengers. Besides extending the usefulness of the canal by limiting the period of its occupancy by individual ships, added expedition would be gained in a widened canal by the avoidance of the necessity of the block system now existing, whereby vessels have to pull up at stations and wait indefinite periods till the line is clear. With a canal of double width, whilst small steamers could pass each other it would only be necessary for the larger craft to lie up at points where others pass them an operation that would not incur more than a quarter of an hour's delay finally the project of doubling the canal recommends itself on the score of lesser expense the original cost would be much smaller whilst the permanent charges of administration would also be reduced the only argument conceivable in favour of the second canal is the supposition that it would be made with english money worked under english direction and in the matter of rates be competitive with the elder scheme that however is a possibility obviously incompatible with the collaboration of m de lesseps which is the basis of the understanding arrived at in eighteen eighty three between him and the english shipowners what those who do business in the narrow water of the Suez Canal would like above all things to see is a canal double the width of the present one and five feet deeper under British, or for the matter of that, international commercial direction. Failing that, the widening of the existing canal is the only scheme that would give practical relief to the shipping trade. End of chapter 24 Travel east, travel west, a man's own house is still the best. End of East by West, A Journey in the Recess, Volume 2, by Henry W. Lucy. Recording by Ruth Golding, February 2012. alternative shorter version of chapter six of east by west a journey in the recess volume two by henry w lucy this alternative version does not have the statistical tables read out this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the new empire in the west during my stay in japan i had the advantage of many interesting conversations both with mr inouye and mr ito on the condition and prospects of this interesting country in order to enable me to acquire full and accurate knowledge on the subject the foreign minister laid all the departments of the state under contribution and i received from each statements which contain the latest and most accurate statistics of the trade commerce and general condition of the empire i have thrown them together in the present chapter imperial family and government the dynasty of the empire of japan was established by the emperor jimmu in six sixty b c and to the throne have succeeded from generation to generation the same dynasty without interruption up to the present time in the twelfth century the imperial power once declined and the political power of the empire fell to the hands of the successive military chieftains shoguns namely genji hojio ashikaga oda toyotomi and tokugawa for the period of about seven hundred years in eighteen sixty eight the present government stripped the bakufu government of its political power and thus achieved the restoration of the imperial power 
in 1871 all the daimios returned their territories to the emperor, and thus the political administration has become uniform. The present emperor was born at Kyoto on November the 3rd, 1852, and succeeded to the throne of his father, Komei Tenno, on January the 9th, 1868. On the 28th of December of the same year, the daughter of Itsijio Fuziwara Tadaka Daizin was made the empress. She was born at Kyoto on the 28th of May, 1850. In regard to the imperial succession established according to the usages of ancient times, the rule of primogeniture is observed whenever the reigning emperor dies. Females may also succeed to the throne, and there are many examples where they have done so. If the throne becomes vacant by reason of the death of the reigning emperor, leaving no issue, one of the members of the four imperial branch families may be chosen as the imperial successor. These four branch families have not only the same origin or common ancestor, but also have been closely connected with each other by marriage. The imperial expenses are fixed at the amount of 1,748,785 yen for the year 1884. The Empire of Japan is an absolute monarchy. The legislative, executive and judicial powers all belong to the emperor and the Daijio Kuwan, where the emperor presides and decides upon all the government affairs, is the office of the executive and legislative powers, where all the important affairs of the empire are supervised. In this office there are one Dajiyo Daijin, or prime minister, one Gadaijin, one Udaijin, and several cabinet sangis. It is usual that these cabinet sangis act respectively as the heads of the various executive departments. In the present time there exists no fixed demarcation between the legislative and executive branches of the government, but the Genroin, or Senate, established in 1875, discussed the legislative affairs, and the result of their discussion becomes law by the sanction of the emperor after it has passed the cabinet. In June 1883 the number of senators was 37, but there is no limitation in their number, as the usage is that they are chosen from among those who have rendered remarkable services to the state. The Sanzi Inn, or Conseil d'État, established in 1881 as a part of the Daijio Kuwan, has both the legislative and executive branches makes drafts of the executive affairs and of rules and regulations, and discusses all drafts submitted by the heads of the respective departments, and the result of their discussion is submitted to the Senate. It also judges all the administrative controversies. In June 1883, the number of the members and assistant members was 12 and 29 respectively. The executive branch of the government is divided into ten departments, namely foreign, interior, financial, army, navy, educational, agriculture and commerce, public works, judicial and imperial household departments. The local government affairs are vested solely in the hands of the Tsiji of Fu and Rei, or Prefect of Ken the whole empire being divided into three fu and forty-four ken. In each fu and ken there is one tsiji or one rei. Also fu and ken are divided into a number of ku or districts and gun or counties, respectively, in each of which ku or gun there is its chief transacting the local affairs. In 1872, all the Tsijis and Reis were called to hold meeting at Tokyo, the meeting being called Sihoku Wan Kaigi, or the meeting of the local governors, the chief subject of their discussion being the taxes. By the imperial decree promulgated in 1873 was revised the old system of taxation of the whole empire, the revision having consumed the period of seven years. In each of the years of 1875, 1878, 1879, 1881, 
CG and Rei were called to hold meetings to discuss the local executive affairs. In 1879, Fu and Ken assemblies were opened, the members being elected by votes and vested with the power of discussing the sole affair of the adjustment of the local taxes. But the approval of Tsiji or Rei must be obtained to execute the result of their discussion. When Tsiji or Rei thinks that his approval could not be given to it, he submits his reasons for it to the Minister of the Interior for his direction. Those who are qualified to be elected members of each Fu or Ken assembly must be men of over twenty-five years of age, living in each Fu or Ken over three years, and paying land taxes upwards of ten yen. Those who are qualified to elect such members must be men of over twenty years of age, living in such Fu or Ken, and paying land taxes to the amount of five yen. Those who are qualified to elect members were 1,809,610 in number at the end of the year 1881. Of this number, those who were qualified to be elected were 879,347. Education and Religion On December 31, 1881, the statistics of schools, high schools, normal schools, University of Tokyo, schools for special branches and schools of all kinds are as follows statistical table with the number of schools teachers and students omitted from this version among those schools some are maintained by the government expenses or the state taxes some by fu and ken expenses or the local taxes and the money collected from the public in such fu and ken and some by private donations they are called respectively the government, public, and private schools, the number of each of which are stated as follows. Statistical tables of the number of government, public, and private schools omitted from this version. Of these schools, those which are under the supervision of C.G. and Rei are public schools, which are the foundation for the extension of the education of the whole country, and considered as important elements of the educational statistics. Consequently, those who attend and those who do not attend the schools, together with the state of the income and expenditure of the schools, are indicated as follows. In 1880 to 1881, the comparison of those who attain the age of attending school, from full six years to full fourteen years, with schoolboys and girls among those who attain such age, is as follows. Statistical table of number of students omitted from this version. During the years of 1880 to 1881, the annual educational income and expenditure by the local taxes and the money collected from the public are as follows. Statistical table of income and expenditure omitted from this version. In 1881, the number of students of such public schools was 2,582,826, and their educational fees amounted to 404,287 yen, the poor not being required to pay fees. The property of these schools, adding the value of the lands and houses belonging thereto, amounted in value to 19,762,594 yen. During the same year, the amount of money gratuitously given for educational expenses is 977,261 yen, and besides, land and houses are in some cases given. The religion is of two sects, namely Shintoism and Buddhism. In 1881, of the Shinto Yoku or Shinto preachers, the number of male preachers is 17,756, and that of female preachers, 95. Of the number of disciples, males are 1,299, females, 3. Of the Buddhist Kiyodoshi Yoku, or Buddhist preachers, males are 75,144, females 1,131. And of the number of their disciples, males are 19,664, females 1,347. 
the lower classes of people are generally believers in buddhism annual income and expenditure the income for the fiscal year ending in june 1881 was 63,320,565 yen and the expenditure of the same period 63,170,893 yen the estimated income for the year ending in june 1882 was 68,573,995 yen and that for the year ending in june 1883 sixty six million eight hundred and fourteen thousand one hundred and twenty two yen sources of revenue the expenditure for each of the said two years estimated in the budget is equal in amount to the revenue the sources of revenue and branches of expenditure estimated in the budget for the financial year ending june eighteen eighty four are as follows Japanese government revenue and expenditure table omitted from this version. Among the sources of revenue, the most important is the land tax. Ten years ago, the source of revenue had been land tax alone. Although the land tax has gradually been reduced through the land tax reform and the system of imposing other kinds of taxes has been introduced, still at present, land tax amounts to 57% of the total revenue. An average rate of tax imposed on every one tan, about a quarter of an acre, of rice field is one yen and sixteen sen, thirty-six sen for every one tan of dry field, and ninety-seven sen for every one tan of residence. Of the whole population, the owners of some of these three kinds of land are more than six million and three thousand in number. The least amount of tax paid by each of these owners is ten sen. The public debt is of two kinds, namely the home and the foreign. The home debt was made up as follows, July 1883. Government debt figures omitted from this version. A great part of this debt was left to the present government for redemption by the former princes of different provinces. The foreign debt of Japan was raised in England. It comprises a 9% loan of £1,000,000 issued in 1870, which has now all been redeemed, and a 7% loan of £2,400,000 contracted at the price of 92.5 in January 1873, which has gradually been reduced, and which stood at the amount of £1,825,100 in January 1884. Banks at the end of the year 1881, the number of the public banks was 148, of the private, 90, of specie banks, 1, and other companies which had kept some characteristics of bank, 369. The public banks and the specie bank are chartered by the government. The specie bank was established in the year 1880 with the certification of the government, and its capital amounted to 3 million yen. The total capital of the ninety private banks amounted to ten million four hundred forty seven thousand yen, and that of quasi banks to five million eight hundred ninety five thousand yen, january eighteen eighty two. Army and Navy After the disappearance of the feudal system in Japan, the system of the regular army was introduced by the Imperial Decree of Recruitment in the year eighteen seventy two and it was amended in 1879. It was thereby ordered that every man, except the eldest sons or grandsons, and also those who had received a higher education, may be called up from the age of twenty by lot. Those who are called up shall be distributed to their respective military stations, and must remain for three years in the regular army. The soldier who has passed through the regular army must be for three years in the army of reserve, with liability to be called upon once for annual practice, and to be incorporated in the regular army in the time of war or other like contingent event. Leaving the army of reserve, the soldier enters the militia for four years, with liability to be called upon at a convenient place once for annual practice, and to be called up in the time of war or other like event after the army of reserve has been incorporated in the regular army 
every man from the age of seventeen till his fiftieth year is enrolled in the landwehr which body is only called upon for defensive service in time of invasion the strength of the japanese army in december eighteen eighty one was including reserves nearly one hundred and four thousand men besides there are eighty five in telegraph troops three hundred and fifty in the military college for commissioned officers eight hundred and fifty in the military college for non-commissioned officers these form the whole number of soldiers since the passing of the law of recruitment before the passing of this law there was the regular army which consisted of four hundred thousand seizoku among them there are a great many who are still fit for the military service for the naval service volunteers from the age of fifteen to twenty-five are called up the term of the service is either five or seven years the volunteers may prefer either of the two alternatives those who desire to be still in service at the end of the fixed term are allowed to be in service for every three years area and population total area twenty four thousand seven hundred and ninety four point five one square re population eighteen eighty one thirty six million three hundred and fifty eight thousand nine hundred and ninety four eighteen eighty two thirty six million seven hundred thousand one hundred and eighteen more detailed area and population figures omitted from this version in the above table twenty four thousand seven hundred and ninety four point five one square re is equal to one hundred and forty eight thousand four hundred and fifty six square miles the specification of population according to the estimate of january eighteen eighty two is as follows male eighteen million five hundred and ninety eight thousand nine hundred and ninety eight female eighteen million one hundred and one thousand one hundred and twenty number of heads of families seven million five hundred and eighty four thousand nine hundred and eighty six average number of persons in a family four point four six at the same time the number of foreign residents is male five thousand one hundred and seventy nine and female one thousand and eight making the total of six thousand one hundred and eighty seven persons there are no recent statistics of the number of married persons but according to the estimate of january eighteen seventy six there were six million seven hundred and eighteen thousand two hundred and eighty eight husbands and six million seven hundred and eighteen thousand two hundred and eighty eight wives and twenty million nine hundred and one thousand eight hundred and twenty eight others making the total of thirty four million three hundred and thirty eight thousand four hundred and four persons the following shows the number of births for six years but the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate births is not clear tables of births omitted from this version the following is the number of deaths for the same period table of deaths omitted from this version the cities containing a population of more than one hundred thousand are as follows january eighteen eighty two Tokyo in Musashi province eight hundred and twenty three thousand five hundred and fifty seven Kyoto in Yamashiro province two hundred and thirty nine thousand four hundred and twenty five Osaka in Setsu province two hundred and ninety three thousand six hundred and eighty one Nagoya in Owari province one hundred and eighteen thousand four hundred and fifty Kanagawa in Kaga province one hundred and seven thousand six hundred and twenty four by the poor law promulgated in eighteen seventy four it is provided that to each helpless person or one above seventy or below fifteen years of age and who being crippled is not able to do any work one koku and eight to of rice shall be appropriated every year in case of an abandoned child the same quantity of rice is given to any person who brings it up until it reaches thirteen years of age besides this in every locality some funds are kept to help people suffering from calamity in tokyo there is a poorhouse supported by local taxation 
The following table shows how the land lies. Private properties. Rice field, 6,469,841 acres. Farm or garden, 4,561,412 acres. Homestead, 858,545 acres. Mountain and forest, 13,378,553 acres. Wild plain, 3,592,967 acres. Public forest, 12,932,418 acres. There are besides no small portions of crown land which are tenanted by the people, but statistics are wanting. The principal agricultural products in 1880 were as follows. Rice, 155,629,409 bushels. Barley, 62,049,940 bushels. Beans, 10,795,717 bushels. The annual incomes of both the government and private forests are not known. At present, the government forests have in possession trees of one foot in circumference to the number of 1,860,491,648. The exportation of the principal agricultural products in 1881 was rice, fourteen million two hundred eight thousand one hundred twenty eight pounds barley five hundred one thousand four hundred seventy six pounds beans two thousand five hundred forty seven pounds the number of cattle is very small in eighteen eighty the cows and oxen numbered one million one hundred twenty four thousand five hundred sixty four and the horses one million six hundred five thousand five hundred forty three the principal products of the fisheries are whales sardines herrings katsuwo bonito cuttlefish cod and salmon in 1880, the total number of fishers was 1,601,406. 848,288 male and 753,118 female. Number of fishing boats, 190,045. By a notification of 1882, all the mines of the country have been declared government property. Some of them are worked by the government, and others by private individuals. At present there are twelve of the former, and 5,579 of the latter. In 1881, the whole expense of the mining works, both governmental and private, was 5,916,621 yen, while the quantity of the ores obtained in the same year was as follows. Gold, 10,063 ounces. Silver, 322,968 ounces. Copper, 10,376,633 pounds. Iron, 13,528 tons. Coal, 881,261 tons. Exports have steadily increased during the three years ending 1882, the last date available. In 1880, the total value of exports was over 27 million yen. In 1881, it had risen to over 30 million, and in 1882, it was 37 and a quarter million. On the contrary, imports have decreased, the value in 1880 being 36 and a half million yen, in 1881, little over 31 million, and in 1882, considerably less than 30 million. Railways and telegraphs are steadily advancing, and the telephone is also making way. The circulation of the letter post is one of the best tests of a nation's advance on the path of civilization. In 1881, the total number of letters, postcards, newspapers, books and samples circulated through the post was 74 millions. 
in the next year it had risen to over ninety millions and has gone on increasing up to the present date japan has two hundred and twenty five newspapers with an aggregate sale of over thirty seven and a half millions End of chapter six Chapter Seven of East by West A Journey in the Recess Volume Two by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven The Gibraltar of the East. It is a three hours' ride by rail from Kyoto to Kobe. The line is better patronized than that between Yokohama and Tokyo. It runs through a rich agricultural country and half way touches Osaka the birmingham of japan the tall chimneys vomiting smoke that hung like a cloud over the populous towns had quite a familiar and homelike look what was in no degree homelike was the conduct of the ticket collector who at various stages of the short journey looked in to examine tickets he entered bareheaded bowing to the ground and was most effusive in his thanks on returning the ticket after nipping it having seen ours once he did not trouble us again but never failed by a series of bows and smiles to comprehend us in his periodical examination whilst at the same time intimating that he knew our tickets were all right i am not sure that on the whole the british official's sharp cry of tickets and his rapid clutch at what you hold in your hand is not calculated to get through business more quickly but by way of change it was very pleasant to travel three hours in a railway carriage surrounded as it were by a halo of smiles from the ticket collector there was a school fete going forward at one of the towns on the route and the station was beleaguered by hordes of children many accompanied by their parents i was much struck by the appearance of the station-master here like his colleagues he was dressed in uniform based on the english style unfortunately he had drawn in the clothing lottery a pair of trousers of prodigious length he had met the difficulty by the simple process of turning them up at the heels and was now strutting about with a band of white calico lining reaching halfway to his knee it seemed impossible to respect authority thus ludicrously arrayed but he at least was unconscious of any drawbacks he had doubtless up to early manhood gone about without any trousers at all and felt he was now making up the average kobe is a pretty little town at the head of the inland sea it is one of the foreign settlements and has known what it was to have the fleets of england france and holland cleared for action in its bay by way of assisting at the deliberations of the japanese government it is perhaps of all towns the least japanese in its appearance the streets are broad and straight the houses of many stories are built of stone and the banks and other buildings favour the impression that it is a western town of course there is a japanese quarter but it is not closely in evidence as it is at yokohama we went aboard the kiva at night and when we woke in the morning were already threading our way through the inland sea it was fine weather by night and day and we had full opportunity of enjoying the marvellous beauty of this great sea lake a panorama of countless islands was spread out every one of different size and shape some of the oddest most of the islands are uninhabited as in truth are large stretches of the mainland skirting the sea here and there are little nests of houses huddled together in a convenient creek up which junks and sampans can be run in rough weather if the land seemed deserted the sea was alive with boats flitting hither and thither under what seemed dangerously heavy sail at night fires are lit in the stern of such fishing boats as are out and twinkle afar like fireflies there is a wide field for discovery along this lonely and beautiful coast as a yachting ground it has unsurpassable attractions in respect of scenery it is like the kyles of butte with the duration of its beauty lengthened fiftyfold 
on both evenings that we steamed down the sea there was a sunset of rich beauty each totally different from the other no pen could describe the beauty of the sunsets in japan many fantastic names have been used as the title of books upon japan if i were writing a book on the country and wanted a title of that order i should call it sunset land nagasaki the last port usually touched at by visitors to japan going westward is also a foreign settlement but is altogether unlike kobe the foreigners stretch their houses on the crescent facing the bay and on the hill behind nagasaki proper lies over the bridges to the left and is not at all easy to find we undertook to discover it by walking and found ourselves in some narrow dirty streets by the water's edge jinrikishas rescued us and took us into the town which lay in quite another quarter many of the houses are built over ditches canals and other more or less undesirable waterways this gives the place a squalid appearance which is nowhere relieved by signs of affluence nagasaki is i am told in a poor way just now its most prosperous local industry is the carving of tortoiseshell a larger mine of wealth is found in the coal mines which are not far distant nagasaki is the great coaling station of japan the coal is fairly good and cheap costing about seven shillings a ton at the pit's mouth the coaling of a big steamer is a curious and interesting sight which may be watched with more comfort since nagasaki coal possesses the curious quality of being comparatively free from dust an innumerable army of coolies are engaged fully one half being women they stand almost shoulder to shoulder in a line extending from the hold of the collier to the coal hole of the steamer the coal is filled in small baskets which are handed along the living line with incredible rapidity the human chain works as regularly as swiftly and much upon the same principle as the grain elevator on a quiet sunday evening the fourth day after leaving nagasaki we stole into hong kong harbour it was almost a pitch dark night and there were some anxious moments for the captain on the bridge making his way through the narrow strait that leads from sea to harbour the difficulty was increased by the number of sampans and junks gliding about not every one with a light our captain had a great respect for the sailing qualities of the chinese skippers the japanese sampans and junks hang about the pathway of a big steamer and trust to it to keep clear of them sometimes spoiling their chances by altering their course at the last moment the best thing to do with a chinaman the captain found was to trust him and leave him alone still he was apt to get perilously near and on a dark night a procession of junks crossing and recrossing the bows is a little embarrassing so we glided along half speed over the still dark waters the silence broken only by the chant of the man throwing the lead the cry of the lookout from the bows and the low voice of the captain directing the steering hong kong lay right ahead long rows of lights against the dark shadow of the hill on which it stands one light far up the hill was in motion doubtless the lamps of the carriage of some distant diner out returning homewards this was the only sign of life in the town for the rest the long rows of lights were fixed and a weird silence brooded over the town we anchored at the buoy for the night and going ashore in the morning found that warm welcome from utter strangers which is one of the characteristics of englishmen in the east that we were going to stay only forty hours in the place was made a matter of personal lamentation though it was admitted that all hong kong had to show the foreigners might easily be seen in a day it is a lively bustling town though as compared with its former bounding prosperity ichabod is written on its wall it is the same story here as at yokohama shanghai and other outposts of eastern trade which english people have coolly appropriated in the earlier days about the time that jos sedley was collector at boggley waller 
and for some years after, fortunes were made by British merchants at Hong Kong. Making princely incomes, they lived in princely style, and shared their good fortune with their clerks. Those were the days when messes flourished, and the whole commercial establishment sat down to sumptuous meals provided by the head of the house. This patriarchal way of living has vanished with fifty per cent profits, and the junior mess is but a tradition. Still, if competition and restricted trade have cut down profits, Hong Kong does a snug business, and some of the merchants retain, at least in their private houses, the old princely style of living. The population is, of course, chiefly composed of Chinese, who crowd their quarter in a manner which seems to be free from sanitary restrictions. The danger of this state is not wholly unrecognised, and I heard one cheerful resident confidently predict that within two years an epidemic would break out which would decimate the population. The climate in summer is unbearably hot for Europeans, and today, albeit we are within measurable distance of Christmas, the thermometer stands at 80 degrees. Happily, Hong Kong has its Simla close at hand. The peak, a hill 1,800 feet high, standing at the back of the town, is the regular residence of the European community during the summer months. The governor has a fine house there, and round it are grouped the pretty bungalows of the merchants. It is a magnificent sight for a residence, commanding a far-reaching view of the landlocked bay and ships that ever come and go. It is not an easy journey to make, night and morning, but that is rather the affair of the chairmen. An Englishman would never think of walking to the peak. He hires a chair and is carried up in lordly ease by two gaunt and perspiring Chinamen. The jinrikisha has made its way hither, but owing to the conformation of the ground it has little chance against the chair. Following the long street that skirts the bay, the jinrikisha is well enough. When it comes to going uptown, where most of the private residences stand, it becomes an impossible conveyance. The chair is slung on two poles which are borne on the shoulders of two men. It is comfortable enough, but not so rapid as the jinrikisha, though the chairmen easily make their five miles an hour on level road or coming downhill. The governor's house is situated some way up the hill, and from the terrace commands a fine view of the magnificent harbour. The situation has its drawbacks owing to the incessant exchange of civilities on the part of the fleet. It is bitterly said that the Commodore never blows his nose but that the sound is re-echoed through the distant hills by the firing of one or more guns. Certainly the saluting is incessant, and what between the movements of the Commodore, the visits of the General commanding the land forces, and the arrivals and departures of foreign vessels, the guns are going pretty much all day long. After Tiffin, the Governor drove us round by the Happy Valley and back through town, comprising a comprehensive view of the colony and its outskirts. The Happy Valley is a dip in the green hills to the east of the town. The racecourse, a popular resort of Hong Kong, lies here. Sir George Bowen, who is setting himself with vigour to improve the place, has in hand a scheme by which the centre of the racecourse will be drained and laid out as an ornamental garden. This will be a vast addition to the attractions of the place. But Hong Kong is already set in gardens of older, if less straightly ordained, principles. Wherever the eye turns aside from the business streets, there is rich verdure, trees full of leaf, though now putting on their autumn tints. Hong Kong was at the time of our visit much exercised by the imminence of war between China and France, a condition of doubt dispelled two days after our departure by a formal communication from the Chinese government announcing that France had forced war upon it, and that Hong Kong merchants must look out for their own interests. Within forty-eight hours of this declaration being made, well-informed residents of Hong Kong declined to believe that China meant business. This arose less from an impartial and judicial view of the circumstances than from habitual contempt and dislike of the Chinaman. 
in the eyes of the haughty alien who lives upon his soil the chinaman is not a sufficiently elevated being even to go to war he was only scheming making believe and at the last moment would put his pigtail between his legs and run away it is not for us casual callers in to judge of the reasonableness of the state of things suffice it to note that english residents at hong kong have a distinct abhorrence for the chinese they speak of them as if they were beasts and indeed they so literally characterize them i have seen an englishman walking along queen's road dispose of a group of chairmen who proffered him their services by hitting them on their knuckles or whatever portion of their body happened to be under his stick when it smartly fell if they had been a pack of dogs they could not have been more roughly or contemptuously dispersed yet the good qualities of the chinese will upon persistent questioning be fully admitted by the settler the chinese domestic servant is perhaps the best in the world the night after our arrival we dined in the house of an english gentleman where the whole domestic establishment was composed of chinese the dinner was excellently cooked and the service simply perfect four chinamen waited upon a party of nine they were picturesquely dressed in blue cotton gowns the flowing sleeve turned up with spotless white and their long pigtails falling between their shoulders they moved about noiselessly on sandalled feet and were always at hand when wanted in higher grades of life the quiet supremacy of the chinaman is also acknowledged he is a born merchant whether on a small scale behind the counter or on a larger in an office it is grudgingly admitted that he is absolutely reliable his word being as good as some people's bond it is added that this is due not to any honesty but to shrewd calculation and deliberate conviction that in matters of trade honesty is the best policy the finest thoroughfare in hong kong is named after a late governor whose name will be kept green as long as kennedy road looks out over the bay i heard a great deal about the last governor sir john pope hennessy but i did not hear any proposal to name a street or square after him the present governor sir george bowen has been in office less than a year and has thus early succeeded in obtaining the kind regard of the community he has been called upon to govern sir george has grown grey in the colonial service but he brings to hong kong an undiminished stock of vigour in addition to the improvements in the racecourse already referred to he has projected the widening and extension of the prior as the main street skirting the bay is called in addition it is proposed to spend over a million dollars in improving the sanitary condition of the colony a work which unless the apprehensions of the cheerful colonist quoted be overstrained cannot be completed too soon beyond this the governor has submitted to the home government a comprehensive scheme of reform in the constitution of the executive and legislative councils of hong kong and what is more has obtained the sanction of the home government to its main provisions the fly in the ointment of general content is the peremptory refusal of the colonial office to sanction the appointment of a military instructor for the police the english community of hong kong do not regard with perfect repose their position as mere units in the population they would feel more at ease if the police a fine body of men chiefly sikhs were trained to arms as a test of their sincerity they were willing to pay the salary of a competent instructor and the council unanimously passed a resolution to that effect but the colonial office vetoed the proposition and there is some angry talk at hong kong about this interference with the purely local affairs of the colony like most colonists the hong kong settlers are good honest uncompromising tories fretful under the domination of a liberal ministry which when questions arise between natives and colonists unaccountably insists upon the just claims of natives being considered and so flouting british interests but in this matter of a military instructor of the police they are strong home rulers and their case is commended to the sympathy of mr healy and mr bigger the governor has recently returned from a tour through china as far as pekin 
which was marked by an incident that might have had serious international consequences. His Excellency stayed at tea-houses when beyond the field of foreign hotels. Waking up in one of these in the early morning, he found his watch had disappeared. Reaching out for his trousers with intent to go and make inquiries, he found that these also had gone away in the eigenweit. The governor is a burly man of straightforward speech, and looks much more like a British admiral of the old school than a civilian in the diplomatic service. According to common report in Hong Kong, the spectacle of his semi-clad excellency stamping round the tea-house in search of his trousers, and frankly expressing his opinion of the Chinese in general and the thief in particular, was quite awesome. Correspondence on the subject is, I believe, still going forward, but is not likely to be presented to Parliament. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of East by West: A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight in the Tropics. It is a striking thing when making long journeys by sea in the Far East to notice how the British lion has laid its massive paw upon successive points of strategical importance till it has girdled Asia, Africa, and Europe with a line of outposts. As in the time of the Armada beacon fires were built around the coast, till Skiddor saw the fire that burned on Gaunt's embattled pile, and the red glare on Skiddor roused the burghers of Carlisle. So now, on a larger range, beacon fire answers to beacon fire from the China Seas to the Mediterranean. It is lit at Hong Kong in southern China, it is flashed from Singapore on the Malay Peninsula, and is taken up almost within sight at Penang. It twinkles at Fort Blair on the lonely Andaman Island. Rangoon and Mulmain hand on the torch, which blazes throughout British Burma. Akiab at the mouth of the Ganges shows the light, making near connection with India. All Ceylon is British, with its military camp at Colombo and its naval station in Trincomalee. Aden in Arabia and Perim on the far side of the Red Sea hold out the signal which burns on Socotra, a little island commanding the Gulf of Aden, whilst in the Mediterranean it shows boldly forth at Cyprus, Malta, and on the rock of Gibraltar. How it came to pass that these odd corners of the earth should belong to a little island set in northern seas, it would perhaps not be desirable too closely to inquire. But there they are, quietly, unresistingly, and, to tell the truth, prosperously living under British rule, monuments of the activity and the audacity of British enterprise. Singapore, as we approached, was a long, low landmark, lying dark under wet skies, with here and there patches of green showing where the Chinese, having worked a Gambia field at high pressure, had exhausted the generous soil, and, leaving it, the coarse long grass had sprung up. We left Hong Kong in the Verona, which on getting clear of the harbour found itself battling with heavy seas. It was a hot, close, muggy night, good neither for man nor beast. A passenger, impatient of the restraint of his cabin, had a bed made up for him in the saloon. In the dead of the night he woke, dreaming of green pastures and lowing kine. He found he was being walked over by two oxen shipped at Hong Kong with ulterior purposes. They too had found their quarters uncomfortable and walking out had strayed into the saloon, round which they sniffed with much melancholy booing. On the second day we slid into summer seas, the northeast monsoon filling our sails and making the hot ship glad with pleasant breezes. The punkers began to swing in the saloon, and on deck appeared gossamer dresses and thinnest of flannel suits. Before the steamer came to her moorings in Singapore, she was surrounded by a fleet of small roughly made boats, manned by tawny lads naked save for a loincloth. 
"'Yes, sir, yes, sir,' they shouted in chorus. "'Have a dive, sir. All right, sir. Throw in a piece, sir.' A coin thrown over, the boat nearest to which it fell was suddenly emptied, the lads leapt into the water like a flash of brown thunderbolts, and in a moment were back again, holding the tiny silver coin in their gleaming teeth. They were quite as much at home in water as out, and that at the time we met them they chanced to be in a boat was a pure accident. We got up a race for them, six boats entering for a good long course round a boy and back. The tide was running very strongly, and as they got into its course they were swept off, making the goal seem hopeless. One boat caught a beam by a wave filled and was on the point of sinking, but the young Malays abated not one jot of their efforts with the skulls. As they tugged with their arms, they kicked out the water with their feet, and having thus bailed the boat dry, soon made up the way they had lost whilst waterlogged. The race was as fine a one as I ever saw, not a boat's length between any as they came back still fighting with the mighty current. The prizes were delivered in unusual fashion. The money was chucked into the sea, and the youngsters, darting overboard, appropriated it. The Malays are natives of Singapore, but it is the Chinese who work the place. Since the business of pirating has been discountenanced, the Malay seems to have lost all taste and energy for work. If need be, he will labour for his daily bread, but as his necessities are cheaply provided for, the amount of work got out of him is not exhaustive. What he likes to do best, or rather the kind of work which he least abhors, is fishing, a gentlemanly avocation in which occur long pauses for rest. When he has caught enough fish to provide himself with a meal and a little over to barter for rice, he goes home having reached the utmost limits of the day's work. His home is a dark and dirty hut built upon piles over water, if water be conveniently at hand, if not then over mud. The notion of building a house with its foundations set in dry land is an incomprehensible thing to the Malay. Well-to-do people of his race live down by the wharfs, with the piles standing in real water. That is the west end of the Malay social settlement. Poor people who live where they must still have their houses built on piles, but there is only mud underneath, or, with the lowest scale of all, absolutely dry land. The Chinese have overrun the whole of the Malay Peninsula and adjacent parts. But for them, British interest in the Straits of Malacca, which on the eve of the general election of 1874 excited Mr. Disraeli's misgiving, and were never after alluded to, would be in straitened circumstances. Englishmen cannot live and labour in these tropical climes. The Malay lives and will not labour. The Chinese does both with cheerful shining countenance, and prospers exceedingly. Chinamen work in the coffee and sugar plantations and own some of them. They keep the shops, sail the ships, and own these too. Looking out over the busy harbour of Penang from the veranda of the clubhouse, a resident specially well informed in the matter told me that nearly all the fleet then at anchor belonged to Chinamen. The P&O, the British India, and other sea-going fleets appropriate the big loaves. The Chinamen pick up the crumbs that fall from their tables and thrive upon them. They have coasting steamers running to places the precise locality of which is more absolutely unknown to the average Englishman than was that of the Straits of Malacca when Mr. Disraeli sprung the sounding phrase on a bewildered nation and an astonished government. If there is no trade to begin with, they make it, foster its growth, and when once they get a hold on the place, no one can get them out. A marvellous people, the Chinese, who now quietly and unobtrusively play an important part in the history of the world, and are doubtless destined to fulfil more striking ones. They are a nation without the distinction fatal elsewhere of round pegs and square holes, square pegs and round holes. The hole may be square or round. The Chinaman will fit it if there is any money to be got out of it. 
Singapore is the emporium of the Malay Peninsula. Hither come the spices, gambia, tin, and the buffalo hides which Chinese merchants, some of them not above the status of a peddler, buy in the interior, and which Chinese ships bring to the great port of call for English steamers. Just now they are watching with keen interest an experiment being tried in the neighbouring principality of Johor. The Maharaja is one of the few princes left hereabouts who is not under British rule. But whilst preserving his independence, His Highness is a devoted ally and friend of England. He has visited the country, speaks its language, and is even more sedulous in imitating its customs and institutions than the present Ministry of Japan. His palace is at Johor, the capital of his principality. But he has a house at Singapore, where he lives in English style, and as far as he can control his surroundings, with English people. He has been twice married, and both his wives are alive. His second wife has borne him children, but it appears to be against the law that they should inherit the throne, and accordingly a nephew has been declared heir apparent. This young gentleman has just returned from England, where he was educated. The Maharaja is a Mohammedan, and a strict observer of religious rites. When, as sometimes happens, he goes out to dinner, his cook marches in advance to see that no meat comes to table unless the beast has died by having its throat cut. Yet, in imitation of the religious liberty prevalent in England, the Maharaja tolerates all religions, and the other day presented eight acres of land as a site for a Roman Catholic mission. In one respect, His Highness has improved upon his model since he rules his people and dwells in the comity of nations without the assistance of a standing army. A body of police keep the peace among the Malays, and in the Chinese communities the head man is made to answer for order. The Maharaja's revenues, which are variously estimated at from sixty to a hundred thousand a year, come chiefly from licenses for the sale of opium, which is consumed by the Chinese. There is also a tax on the export of agricultural products, and every pig or other animal that is killed in the principality pays tribute to the Maharaja. Still, the mainstay of his revenue is the opium tax, and thus the Chinese keep the state going at both ends, creating its prosperity by their labour, and returning a considerable portion of their earnings in the form of taxation. Johor is rich in woods which cover its hills and dales, but the cost of transport is so great that this, which would be a source of wealth elsewhere, is here an embarrassment. The experiment on which the Chinese is just now fixing his shrewd small eyes is that of coffee planting. The climate and the soil of Johor have always seemed peculiarly well adapted for the cultivation of coffee. Some years ago a few hundred acres were sown, but the wrong plant was selected and failure followed, temporarily shutting off experiments of a similar kind. Three years ago about a thousand acres were planted with another kind of berry, which is looking exceedingly hopeful. It takes four years before a new coffee plantation bears fruit. Next year is the crucial one and should the experiment turn out as well as it just now promises, Johor will become an important place. Singapore presents strange contrasts of English and tropical life, being an English town just as much as Eastbourne or Brighton, though set within eighty miles of the equator. Its streets are named in English fashion, with the familiar white letters on blue enamel. High Street and Stamford Road are the kind of names written up, and at the corners of the road are homely cabalistic signs, F.P. 40 feet, indicating the whereabouts of the water pipe. The policemen wear a modification of their British brethren's uniform, one detail being that it is apparently optional for them to wear stockings. Some do and some do not. A pretty sharp contrast passed me in High Street. 
a tricycle came along and on it was seated a grave and reverend signor in yellow turban white jacket red shirt a paper umbrella and bare brown legs in spite of tricycles high streets water-pipes lamp-posts and police in uniform singapore is intensely tropical the atmosphere is something that one never looks through elsewhere the figures that throng its sunny streets are all tropical europeans dress in white duck suits with straw hats and umbrellas the native men dress in as little as possible the chinese come out in cool costumes of white or of that rich blue the making of which and transference to calico stuffs seems to be one of their secrets in addition there are many emigrants from india in their varied costumes madras sends a considerable contingent the women strikingly handsome and graceful western civilization and eastern habits of dress come again in sharp contrast in the matter of billycock hats i have often wondered what became of this widely used headgear when it grew too shabby to wear the secret is an open one for any who come across the chinese labouring out of their own country the old hats are collected in england and forwarded in bales to wherever the chinese most do congregate i noticed the incongruity among the chinese who crowded the coptic in the voyage across the pacific it is much more striking here that a chinaman on board ship should cover his shaven pate with an old billycock hat stained with hair grease buffeted by english winds and soaked in london fog looks funny but is not inexplicable anything will do on board ship to see him here on land dressed in all his best his spotless white gown and blue trousers his face shining with soap and worldly prosperity his pigtail neatly disposed down his back and on his head a greasy battered billycock is passing strange it cannot be simply the form and material that recommend the hat otherwise they would have them new i never saw a chinaman I won't say with a new hat on, but with anything less than one of disreputable old age. I fancy that with the Chinese the ruling passion is strong alike in the matter of eggs and hats. They like them both old. The jinrikisha is seen at Singapore, but as at Hong Kong, though for a different reason, it does not flourish. It is absolutely too hot for a man, however lightly clad, to run about dragging weights, and the few jinrikishas one meets do not get much beyond walking pace. At Penang, the triumphant westward march of the jinrikisha is finally arrested. Both at Singapore and Penang, a conveyance called a gharry is in popular use. It is a large, black, funereal structure, something like a pauper's hearse. It is drawn by a small but masterful and well-made pony, a couple of which would very comfortably stow themselves in the gharry. The Hong Kong ponies, splendid little creatures but apt to wax wroth and kick, are much prized at Singapore. We brought one down for the Maharaja's brother. His Highness was on the wharf with umbrella up, awaiting the arrival of his new acquisition. "'He's all right. We have got him here,' the friend who had brought him shouted over the bulwarks. "'Is he?' asked the Prince, with anxious face and bated breath. "'Is he quiet?' Being assured on this point, the Prince, a portly personage in white ducks, heaved a sigh of satisfaction and turned away. The traction of heavier goods is accomplished in carts drawn by a yoke of oxen. There is, nevertheless, plenty of work for porters, who under the noonday sun carry stupendous burdens by bamboos borne upon their shoulders. They scorn the interposition of a pad between their bare flesh and the hard bamboo. Accustomed from earliest boyhood to carry weights in this way, the skin and muscle of their shoulders have so hardened as to become insensible to what to an English porter would be pain unbearable for more than ten minutes at a stretch. 
it is a long drive from the wharf to the hotel which is situated in the centre of the town the highway is bordered with tropical vegetation palms coconut trees bananas now fully bearing and flowers familiar in english hothouses here growing by the wayside in wild luxuriance in the early morning when life is well worth living in the tropics we took a drive to the botanic gardens at singapore which are beautifully kept and full of choicest tropical plants and trees growing in perfection in a pond were a group of the victoria lilies the flower not yet out but a bud of the size of knobs on a family four-post bedstead was ready to burst the leaves floating flat on the water with edges turned up at right angles were large enough to have floated the infant moses i had one measured it was four feet across the day after we arrived was sunday and in the evening we went to the cathedral a fine building situated on a bluff overlooking the harbour the punkers were in full swing pulled by natives stationed all round the building the bishop preached an excellent sermon pleading for funds to endow mission churches where in distant parts of his diocese the natives resting from their six days labours might spend quiet sabbaths i wondered whether through the open windows and doors the perspiring punker men heard anything of these kind accents or took a close interest in the amount of the collection made the hotel at singapore like all the european buildings is a roomy place with cool verandas and open doors and windows courting whatever chance breeze may blow in the office there is a placard prominently pasted up curious enough to be worth copying passengers and boarders it runs are respectfully requested not to ask the manager for any money as he has strict injunctions not to give same this is not an isolated hint of a certain aspect of social life in these parts in one or two other hotels i have seen a similar intimation though not so bluntly and quaintly put even more common is the edict that the servants of the hotel have instructions to hold on to all baggage till bills are paid the harbour at penang is full of bustling life and colour to which the sampan men contribute a full share they cast gay clothes about their dusky forms and lavish pictorial art upon the stern sheets of their boats underneath a stretchy landscape apparently turned upside down or a brilliant painting of a steamer with its paddles close to the rudder the proprietor proudly paints his own name joe is a favourite cognomen london charlie shows originality and one boatman advertises himself in a breath as bob good sampan man in most respects penang is like singapore except that its streets are narrower there is the same vertically shining sun the same gay colours in the street and the same long roads in the suburbs lined with coconut trees and palms and bananas on one of these we met a man in white turban and blue gown walking along the sun-baked road flanked by coconut trees carrying under his arm a bundle of the graphic arrived by the last mail penang has a commodious market in which are sold vegetables fruit fish and meat very little business was being transacted when we passed through on a butcher's stall lying on their backs fast asleep surrounded by warm-looking joints of meat were two butchers the flies impartially feeding upon the living and the dead the fruit displayed on the stalls consisted of coconuts bananas limes oranges pines to be bought at twopence each and pumelos for those who have fed on the amoy pumelo the growth of other districts are grievously disappointing on due reflection i hold the amoy pumelo to be the most gracious fruit in the world it is said to be the forbidden fruit and since i tasted it i take a less stern view of the weakness of adam 
albeit it hereditarily entails upon me with the thermometer at ninety in the shade the necessity of sitting here writing when everybody else within view is diligently doing nothing i do not know whether the pumelo in its fresh state reaches london i have not seen it there it is like a brobdignagian orange in shape and of a light lemon colour the peel is very thick but is easily removed and the fruit is pulled to pieces in figs whence the white under the skin peels off leaving only the luscious fruit with its generous juice and its delicate flavour i am writing from tender recollection of the amoy pumelo others though they might have been acceptable if tasted first as brussels enthralls those who do not know paris are not worth peeling and indeed are to be resented as desecrating the name of pumelo one tropical fruit of which i had heard a good deal but reached penang too late in the season to taste is the durian this remarkable fruit is the size of a coconut with the husk off i asked a scotchman what it tasted like like a haggis with an onion too much in it he said that is however the most favourable description i have heard and long residence out of scotland had probably confused his recollection of the flavour of haggis the fruit certainly appears to be composed haggis-like of an olla podrida no two men agree in their description of its taste except in the one respect of an overdash of onion the smell is truly terrific and the fruit is opened only after extraordinary precautions i heard at hong kong of the case of some english officers desirous of tasting this curious fruit who hired an empty house closed the windows and doors opened the fruit and with one accord fled leaving it untasted the malay holds it as a great delicacy and to the chinaman it is a luxury comparable only with an egg that has been in the family five years the high court of justice was sitting during our stay in penang and we strolled in to see how justice was administered in these parts the court was roomy and fresh and the punkers diligently at work a civil case was going forward involving the property of two chinese the judge an amiable undecided-looking old gentleman sat on the bench unaided by the majesty of wig or gown the clerk who sat under him wore a black gown and white bands of stupendous size two barristers engaged in the case wore black gowns and white duck trousers the court was pretty full in the portion allotted to the public here sat a chinaman in cool white baju with roomy sleeves capable of holding the fourteenth trump or anything else that might be useful in the game of life singhalese in bright-coloured calico robes their heads covered with straw rimless flower-pot shaped hats adorned with verses from the koran and malays who had put on unaccustomed trousers in deference to the prejudices of the court standing at one of the barriers was a bengalee with a yellow ochre mark on the bridge of his nose denoting his caste a white calico robe was his sole garment but he had draped it around his tall lithe figure with a grace which the british workman would vainly endeavour to imitate if indeed he would feel promptings of desire in that direction the crowd in court were not able to follow the glib pleadings of the gentlemen in white ducks and black gowns a circumstance evidently taken note of by the astute practitioner if they could not follow the speech they would understand that the gentleman in ducks who was constantly popping up to interrupt his learned brother was a kind of man whose services it would be desirable to engage in time of trouble accordingly whilst one learned counsel was supposed to have the ear of the court the other was incessantly jumping up with an indignant my lord i protest or a now really this is too bad whenever this happened 
the chinamen in the body of the court exchanged approving glances as who should say that's the man for my money he's always alive not easy to come over him i was not surprised to hear that this irrepressible person in whose hands the old gentleman on the bench was as a reed blown by the winds had the lion's share of the practice in the high court of justice in penang End of chapter eight chapter nine of east by west a journey in the recess volume two by henry w lucy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the isle of spicy breezes the children's hour has found a historiographer in charming verse but i do not remember reading even in prose any account of the gentleman's hour on board a p and o steamer it begins at any moment after daybreak and extends up to eight o'clock during this time the quarter-deck is sacred to the tread of man there is no written rule to the effect that no lady is permitted or at least expected to appear on deck before eight o'clock has struck but so it is and this period of the day the pleasantest in indian seas has with characteristic selfishness been marked by the lords of creation as their own and they assume the right to pace the deck arrayed in whatever odd garments they may be accustomed to go to the bath in the pyjama is a garment composed of varied material but invariable in its ungainliness it is generally of flannel but may be of silk and consists of a loose jacket belted round the waist and a pair of shapeless drawers thus arrayed without shoes or stockings and generally hatless the gentlemen fresh from their bath or in preparation for it march up and down the deck with curious and not always attractive revelations of contour it is an old custom old almost as the birth of the p and o company and is one of the cherished privileges of the east indian if any one were to attempt to interfere with it the angry indignation which bristles round the ilbert bill would be but as a zephyr breeze the ladies sometimes whisper a protest but none have dared or have found the opportunity of raising a serious cabal against it it is one of the institutions of the p and o whose laws like that of an earlier empire alter not contemporaneously with the pacing to and fro of disguised judges colonels on leave civil servants and mighty merchants goes forward the cleaning of the ship every morning a p and o steamer is subject to a ruthless tidying up the decks spotless to begin with are scoured the paint washed the brasses rubbed the silver cleaned the saloon carpet taken up and shaken and the floor washed persons interested in the educational improvement of housemaids might do worse than send them for a trip in a p and o steamer if they would take back any infection of the thoroughness of the morning brushing shaking and scouring it would spread happiness through many households the plan upon which the vessels of this magnificent fleet get their morning tub is but an incidental exemplification of the system upon which the gigantic business is worked i suppose there is or certainly was before the german confederation became an accomplished fact many a kingdom the administration of whose affairs did not entail revenues equal to those embarked in the p and o company or require an equal measure of statesmanship for their direction in the harbour at colombo to-day there are three great steamers all belonging to this line coming from different parts of the world and going on various routes a fortnight ago there were six yet colombo is only one port of call and in all parts of the eastern hemisphere these ships are moving to and fro arriving on specified days and departing at fixed hours with the regularity of train on the metropolitan railway 
we sighted ceylon early in the morning and throughout a summer day with the sea like glass and the sky sapphire we skirted the island passing poor point de gal now shorn of its glory and making for colombo which within the past two years has inherited the advantage and distinction of being the port of call for the p and o steamers passengers familiar with bishop heber's hymn went sniffing about in search of the spicy breezes that blow soft o'er ceylon's isle and were evidently disappointed at not realising the dream of early infancy but the bishop knew what he was writing about and the spicy breezes are due to no effort of the imagination or exigency of rhyme captain atkinson of the verona tells me he has sniffed the spicy breezes when steaming fifty miles off the island it all depends upon the state of the weather in ceylon and the direction of the wind point de galle was abandoned as a port of call because it lies exposed to the ocean and with the southwest monsoon is too lively a place for vessels lying at anchor still less for those taking in cargo there is a breakwater at colombo which though it seems to lie low answers for order and affords safe and convenient anchorage for the largest steamers when we arrived off penang there came on board a portly gentleman in white ducks and sun helmet with an umbrella swinging in his right hand i thought he was the lieutenant governor or whatever answers to the lord mayor in penang he turned out to be the pilot and leaning upon his umbrella was good enough to take the steamer to its moorings at colombo no pilot came off for more than an hour after our arrival another steamer had got just ahead of us and as the angered captain put it it seemed as if there was only one pilot in colombo when he did arrive his services were declined and the ship lay out at anchor all night we landed in the early morning adam's peak forty miles off shining in clear outline against the golden sky through which the sun was rising we crossed the harbour in a catamaran a kind of gondola of which the cingalese have obtained the monopoly and are likely to keep it the craft consists to begin with of the log of a tree roughly hollowed out on this is built a structure of pole and canvas which is in no part broader than two feet and tapers to the ends which are on the average twenty feet apart it is clear that a boat on this plan would not float a difficulty triumphantly overcome by attaching to it by two arched poles ten or twelve feet long a heavy spar which floats on the water this balances the catamaran and makes it seaworthy in moderately fine weather should the catamaran be caught in a stiff breeze the proceedings of the captain and crew are simple and efficacious if it is what they call a two piecey man breeze two men climb over the arched poles and descending on to the spar sit there regardless of the raging sea if it is a three piecey man breeze the requirements of the occasion are uncomplainingly met in a big catamaran with large sail hoisted scudding before the monsoon as many as nine men have been counted holding on to the spar apparently half the time under water our boatman favoured by quiet weather sat one in the bow and the other in the stern and rapidly paddled us ashore they were fine-looking fellows with a full measure of the national love of jewellery and gay clothes both had massive earrings apparently of gold and one wore a silver bracelet on his wrist all the people in ceylon from babes just feeling their feet to old men and women their steps tottering on the brink of the grave wear gold and silver ornaments they even invent new places for carrying them and it is no uncommon thing to see a cingalese bell with the top of her ears covered with gold plate or wire a large pair of rings pendant from the lobes of the ear a gold or silver circlet round her hair her nose adorned with rings bracelets on her wrists rings on her fingers and silver plates on her toes this is the perfection of adornment but in one or other of the fashions or in several of them 
the Singalese woman of whatever station in life is set forth. I saw running out of a house a sturdy little boy, two years of age, who had nothing on but a silver key fastened round his waist by a girdle of silver wire. The men take their pleasure less expensively. They delight in gold earrings and rings, but beyond this are content to entrust the recommendation of their personal appearance to a fine tortoiseshell comb of circular shape set on the crown of their heads with the ends towards the forehead. The men evidently pride themselves on their hair, which is generally drawn back from their forehead and tied in a neat knot at the back. As they wear earrings, and not always whiskers or moustache, it is not easy at first sight to distinguish man from woman. The funereal Gary does not make its appearance at Colombo, the public being served by a conveyance something like a dog-cart on four wheels with an awning, indispensable protection against the tropical sun. They are very cheap. I had one for three hours for which I was charged two rupees, a little over three shillings, and was overwhelmed with thanks for a trifling and evidently unexpected pourboire. The horses are poor creatures, the real draught animal of Ceylon being a plump and well-shaped little bullock. These are yoked singly or in pairs to light wagons roofed with dried palm leaves, and can upon occasion get up quite a respectable trot. They are artistically branded, characters being stamped all over their sides. It is pretty to see a crawler, a light palm-thatched wagon drawn by a pictorial bullock, driven by a man in a red turban and white robes, hailed by a native who gets in behind, sits on the floor with his feet dangling down, and is trotted off. Bishop Heber's well-known description of Ceylon as a place where every prospect pleases and only man is vile is open to criticism on both assertions. There is much in Colombo which does not please, the town for the most part being squalid, dirty and ill-kept, the streets flanked by hovels, comparison with which is to be found only in the south-west of Ireland. On the other hand, both men and women, particularly the latter, are strikingly handsome. It is not only their flashing black eyes, their well-shaped faces, or their graceful drapery that please the eye. They have the rarer gift of graceful carriage. A Ceylon girl walks like a young empress, if empresses are particularly good walkers. I use the simile in despair, since I do not know anything in common Western life that equals or approaches the manner of the commonest Ceylon woman in moving about the streets. It is the custom in the island to engage women as street sweepers, and in the matter of what Mr. Turveydrop called deportment, it is a liberal education to watch one of them swaying the long flexible brush of bamboo twigs. Both men and women chew the betel nut, which incidentally serves the purpose attained by other means by young girls in Japan, giving a red tint to their lips, an effect in some cases by no means unbecoming. In the country districts the men wear nothing but a pair of earrings and a narrow loincloth. Taken in conjunction with the tall palms, leafless for twenty or thirty feet and then breaking out into a tuft of green leaves they realize with gratifying fidelity the picture on the cover of the juvenile missionary magazine in towns and near them men dress generally in a single robe thrown about them with infinite grace one colour frequently recurring in the gay procession was a dead gold which, set against the tawny flesh and the straight, lithe figure, was a constant refreshment to the eye. The first thing people do on arriving at Colombo is to take the train for candy, for which slight Colombo may find consolation in the reflection that if candy were the point of arrival, visitors would rush off to the railway station to catch the earliest train for Colombo. There is nothing particular to see at Candy, certainly nothing more than at Colombo, unless it be the botanical gardens. 
but the journey through the country is well worth taking and affords a convenient opportunity of seeing the island this is not marred by any undue rapidity on the part of the train which takes four hours and a quarter to do the seventy-two miles it should be added that the gradient is for half the way very steep clambering the hills and presenting a splendid view of the country i suppose ceylon is green all the year round certainly nothing could surpass its verdure in mid-december at candy rain falls on about two hundred days in the year the annual rainfall being eighty-five inches this is a bountiful supply but the peculiar good fortune of ceylon is that it is pretty equally divided throughout the year unlike india the island knows no alternations of wet or dry seasons with the earth green for so many months and bare brown for so many more in october and november the northeast monsoon is blowing and in june when the southwest monsoon is taking its turn the rains are heaviest the dry season such as it is happens in february and march but even then the earth is at no distant intervals refreshed with genial showers ceylon like some other members of the colonial family has seen better days for some years past its coffee crop has been unremunerative and it is said many of the plantations are heavily mortgaged this year the hearts of the planters are cheered by brighter results there is more coffee but prices are low and on the whole planters are inclined with increased assiduity to extend the growth of the cinchona this tree from whose bark quinine is made was only a few years ago introduced into the island and great things are looked for from it tea is still steadily grown and holds its high place in the market rice is another product of which there are abundant signs on the journey from colombo to candy the hillsides for miles far as the eye can reach are carved out in terraces on whose level the rice is sown the water running down from the upper hills is dexterously trapped and abundantly supplies each step of the terrace an immense boon to the planter as the train slowly mounts the steep ascent on the level height of which stands the capital of the old candian kings the view grows in beauty sometimes closely verging on grandeur below a great dip in the circle of hills is the green valley with the water in the rice fields glistening in the sun beyond is a range of hills ever varying in shape as the train creeps higher and all the way sometimes within reach of hand is a tropical wood rich with coconut and banana trees glowing with the blood-red hibiscus fair with countless wild flowers and cool with fern-clad rocks down which musically trickles the bountiful water candy is a pretty town with its white roads its green foliage its flowers its lake and its sentinel guard of mountains in the native quarter though the streets are broader the houses and shops are not much better than in colombo anything in the shape of four walls and a roof will do for the cingalese to live in the look of the streets is further damaged by the widely spread appearance of shut-up tenements when the cingalese family go forth to their daily work they put up a shutter in the place where the door ought to be and all that is needful is done there being no windows to the houses a row when thus shut up looks like an agglomeration of deserted sheds the governor who seems to have been well looked after has a pretty residence here in a wood on an eminence overlooking the town a winding walk leading to the top of the hill whence a fine view of the town and valley is obtained skirts the governor's garden and is named after lady horton wife of a former governor the finest building in colombo is government house which with its lofty rooms broad verandas cool corridors and pleasant garden is the perfection of a tropical residence 
the artisans of candy turn out some simple brasswork and a curious kind of pottery these are soon examined and candy from a tourist's point of view lives chiefly on the beauty of its botanic gardens they are situated in the suburb called peradenia and are reached by a drive of nearly four miles along the high road to colombo we drove out early in the morning long before the sun was in full blaze we met a long stream of men and women hurrying into town carrying baskets of vegetables and fruit and bundles of packets the principal industry on the long stretch of road appears to be the barbers there was a barber's shop at every few hundred yards a low shed in which a man was squatted on the floor beside the implements of his art awaiting custom sometimes with better luck actually engaged on a job the process is a little peculiar artists and subjects squat on the ground face to face and knee to knee the artist pulling the subject's head about as his convenience may require as frequently as not the cingalese does not squat on the ground but stooping down hangs his weight on his knees with only his feet on the ground i saw two acquaintances meet on the high road after an interchange of salutation they both sank down in this position and putting up their umbrellas prepared for a morning's gossip candy being the principal object of attraction for the british and american tourist has suffered the consequent demoralization of the floating inhabitants boys and men hang about the door of the hotel in search of any odd job that shall look like work and bring in annas another art brought to curiously high perfection is that of mutually helping each other to prey upon the foreigner being told that a small boy hanging about the hotel was a useful guide well up in botany and arbory culture i engaged him for the day and speedily discovered that he was utterly useless what's that i asked him pointing to a curious white flower a kind of flower he replied with perfect confidence and brimming over with self-satisfaction at coming out successfully from an early test what's that i asked a little later indicating an unfamiliar member of the palm family a kind of tree he promptly answered one of his minor triumphs was to point out what he called a bunion tree meaning a banyan and once when we heard a familiar whistle and roar he with a wave of his hand towards the passing object said a train all of which made us glad we had taken a guide he accompanied us to lady horton's walk and had not gone many paces when we were joined by another youth whom our guide genially introduced and who accompanied us on the walk confirming the younger one as to this being a kind of flower and that a kind of tree when we got back to the hotel our budding courier said with a patronizing wave of the hand you give him something i said i would do so with great pleasure and consulted him as to the precise amount explaining that i had meant to present him with a rupee for himself and expressing my appreciation of his generosity in desiring to share it with his companion hereupon the youth's advocacy of his friend's claim abruptly cooled and i heard nothing more on the subject something better still happened on driving to the station the coachman drove off without waiting for his fare presently when we were seated in the carriage he sent a friend for his fare and the friend asked for something for himself for conveying the money the botanic gardens cover nearly a hundred and fifty acres of land and stand fifteen hundred feet above the sea the climate is admirably suited for garden cultivation being hot moist and very equable i learn from dr trimmon the director that the mean annual temperature is about seventy seven degrees april and may being the hottest and december the coldest months the gardens were established sixty years ago 
being partly formed out of a royal park attached to the palace of the kings of Kandy. They are beautifully situated, lying within a loop of the river, musically named Mahaweli, which surrounds them on all sides except the south, where they are bounded by the high road. We took our guide with us, but the little impostor was stopped at the gates, as he knew he would be. This is done on the principle of division of plunder. The attendants within the gardens have the perquisite of showing strangers round, and brook no rival near the throne. It is a nuisance, greatly marring the pleasure of strolling through the gardens, for one cannot take a turn without being accosted by one of these men wanting to sell a handbook, to show the fernery, or presenting a flower or specimen of fruit with a too obvious eye for Anna's. The gardens are, however, quite good enough to compensate for petty annoyances of this kind. Whilst rare specimens of tree and plant are lovingly cultivated, the original beauty of the ground, its undulating sweep, and in some spots its virgin jungle, are left undisturbed. Always there is the flowing river, with the view caught here and there of the satinwood bridge that crosses it like a network of gossamer. Following the various walks there are found nearly all the choice trees of the tropics. Within view of the gateway is a magnificent group of palms, planted more than forty years ago, containing within its area all the native species and many specimens of foreign lands. Here is the talipot, the aloe of palms, which flowers but once and then dies. Continuing the round of the gardens, we come upon the palm of Central America, from the leaves of which the Panama hat is made. Here is the upas tree of Java, with considerably more than three branches, and none of them cut down. Here is a magnificent clump of bamboo, spreading outward at the top like a bouquet. If any one cares to sit out a long summer day, they may see these grow at the rate of a foot in twenty-four hours, half an inch per hour. On the left of the pathway are three mighty trunks, dead to themselves, but living outside with what looks at a short distance like masses of ivy, but is a flowering creeper, gemmed with a pale violet blossom. Here is the India rubber tree, and importations from Perak, which yield gutta percha. Here, their branches almost intermingling, are the Himalayan cypress, the pencil cedar of Bermuda, the Norfolk Island pine, and the champak of India, sacred in the eyes of the faithful. Here is the coco de mer, the Columbus of tree fruit, which, found floating on the Indian Ocean or washed up on the shores of Ceylon, was for two centuries a mystery to man, till its home was found among the least known islands of the Seychelles group. The growth of the tree is as slow as its offspring is adventurous, putting forth a single leaf a year and so taking something like an eternity to reach its normal height of a hundred feet. Here, growing on the trunk of a tree, is a fine specimen of the Monstera deliciosa, of Mexican birth, of which, by the way, there is a much finer specimen at Chatsworth. Here is the candle tree of Central America, with its fruit hanging down like tallow dips ten to the pound. Here is a banyan tree whose branches cast a shadow two hundred feet in diameter. Here is the Ceylon ironwood tree, beautiful in life with its sweet-scented flowers, its leaves born blood-red growing into green above and white below, and in its death useful for household purposes. Here is a tree local to Ceylon whose leaves serve with cabinet makers the purposes of sandpaper. And here, the glory of the gardens, is a long avenue of palms, whose stems run up round and smooth as if turned by a lathe, and are suddenly crowned at the top with a coronet of fan-like leaves. Everywhere there are flowers and sweet scent, and here and there, up 
trees of dark green foliage one comes upon boys beating with sticks at branches from which fall fruit the colour of peaches and something similar in size and shape as they fall they split disclosing the dark brown nutmeg bound in the scarlet meshes of the mace many of these plants and trees are to be seen carefully nourished under glass at kew but they look infinitely better at home in the clear atmosphere and under the sunny skies of the tropics end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of East by West: A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two, by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: The Prisoner of Ceylon. Arabi Bay's home of exile stands about three miles out of Colombo. It is reached by a long, dusty road, sometimes skirting the Indian Ocean on whose cool margin brown figures stand dabbling the water up to their knees and plying a fishing-rod they do not seem to catch much and are comically disproportionate fishing with rod and line in an ocean that washes two continents but it is a very pleasant way of getting through the day having a wholesome appearance of work without the accompaniment of blinding dust and dry untempered heat which harry those labouring by the roadside it is a very squalid quarter, the houses being mere huts thatched with palm leaves. Many of them are not six feet high, and the elders of the family crawl into them like animals returning to their holes. They have no windows, and have not reached the skilful contrivance of the Japanese, whose sliding shutters drawn back leave the domicile easy of access. There is a plain wooden shutter that contrives a double debt to pay, being a window by day and a door by night. When the Singalese retires to rest, this board is put up, and the arrangements are complete. There are plentiful chinks which admit air and some rays of light, but neither is a matter that seems greatly to concern the householder. Passing by day, one can see crouching within the doorway father or mother, even oftener the grandfather or grandmother. In spite of insanitary household arrangements, the Singalese seem to live to a ripe age and wrap their years about them like a picturesque garment. Long grey hair, deeply furrowed faces, gleaming dark eyes, figures still upright and the loose garment of gay colours worn with easy grace make old age strikingly attractive. There is no difficulty in approaching the prisoner of Ceylon. He has neither jailer nor guard, and is free to do what he pleases within the limits of the island. When we drove up he was sitting in the broad veranda which fronts the house, a heavy stone building with nothing lovable about it. It stands in a garden which seems left pretty much to its own devices. These, as in all tropical gardens, take gorgeous turns. There are abundance of flowers growing in wild luxuriance and just by the porch one English rose-bush, timidly doing its best to maintain its ancient reputation amid its richer foreign brethren. Arabi was dressed in a loose light-brown overcoat of unmistakable British make, with white duck trousers and waistcoat, and the inseparable fez. He was at work writing, with his back to the garden and his face to the dead wall, which might, with a little care, bloom with jessamine, with the breath of which all the garden is sweet. He showed us his work a little later, displaying with childlike pride the laboriously made English characters by which he had spelt out by and by, a time will come, and other simple sentences which formed his English lesson. His exercise book had originally been designed for accounts, and he now filled the money column with Arabic phrase, translating it into English on the border line. As he opened the book he disclosed a couple of cheap New Year cards, the remembrance of unknown admirers in England. The literature was execrable, 
but the gay colours seemed to please the Egyptian, and he evidently treasured them. Two or three men in native dress were standing about the stables, which flanked one side of the house. A gentleman whom we subsequently knew as the interpreter advanced to receive us as the carriage entered the grounds. Arabi silently bowed a welcome, but did not seem inclined for conversation with casual strangers. Many passers-by call in, and he is not quite sure that all are friendly. We had an introduction from a trusted personal friend, which smoothed matters, and presently the cold, suspicious manner was altered, and the silent man became loquacious. He has so far profited by his studies in English as to be able to carry forward simple conversation. He will soon pass by his interpreter, whose command of English is not extensive, the effort of translation causing him piteously to perspire. Arabi had no objection whatever to discuss political affairs, but he even ostentatiously persisted in doing so from the standpoint of a permanent exile. Like Victor Hugo after the coup d'etat, he has taken a solemn oath perhaps superfluous in the existing circumstances, never to let his foot press the soil of Egypt while Tophiak reigns. Oui, tant qu'il sera là, qu'on cède ou qu'on persiste, ô oh France, France aimée, et qu'on pleure toujours, je ne reverrai pas ta terre douce et triste, tombeau de mes aïeux et ni de mes amours. Thus Victor Hugo in Les Châtiments. I will never go back to Egypt as long as it is enslaved by Tophirk, Arabi says, with unwonted access of animation. I have no desire to see Egypt while it is a land of slaves. Once it was a country that smelled sweet to the nostrils, now it stinks. Its wells are covered with earth, there is no refreshment in it. Why does not England make Egypt free? Talking again of Tophirk, and contrasting him with his father, he said, Ismail is a clever man, but a rogue. Tophirk is not clever enough to be a rogue, he is simply foolish. I do not think he knows the difference between right and wrong. Of England, whose arms chased him from Alexandria and routed him at Tel el Kabir, Arabi speaks with unfeigned respect, and with an affectionate regard, which, if not real, is well assumed. I hope to see England some day, he said. I am learning English fast, and write it too. Look here. Then he brought out his lesson book, and gazed with a pleased, fond smile upon his tremendous and painful feats of calligraphy. He was so engrossed with his scholastic pursuits that he forthwith proceeded to give an English lady who was present lessons in Arabic, reciting from his stock of English phrases and putting them in Arabic. He wrote his name for her on a card, setting himself resolutely down at the table, inking his fingers a good deal, and spending seven or eight minutes upon the task. When concluded, it ran, Ahmed Arabi the Egyptian, Colombo, with the date. He might almost have stormed a town with a similar expenditure of time and physical labour. It was regrettable to find that the names of the rank and file of the fourth party awakened no responsive chord in the mind of the illustrious man whose chequered career they had followed with varying attention. He seemed all unconscious that in the spring of a session Sir Henry Wolfe and Mr. Gorst had denounced the government for not eating up Arabi man and horse, and in the autumn of the same session had truculently returned to the attack with the charge of cruel and cowardly severity towards a pure and high-minded patriot whom the fortunes of war had delivered into their hands. But for the leader of the party, the exile soldier cherishes the loveliest feelings of gratitude and respect. "'You will see Lord Churchill when you return,' he said, speaking as all but the simplest remarks were made through the interpreter. "'Salute him for me, and give him my thanks. I honour him as the friend of slaves, the champion of the oppressed.' 
as Zarabi was unmistakably in earnest, I trust I preserved a grave countenance whilst taking charge of this message. But I could not help thinking of Lord Randolph's good fortune, which kept him away from the house at the epoch when the exigencies of party conflict led the fourth party on another tack, and Sir Henry Wolfe and Mr. Gorst, out heroding the daughter of Herod, nightly demanded that Mr. Gladstone should produce the head of Arabi on a charger. Whatever discontent may have ruffled the bosom of Arabi on first taking up his residence on the island has now disappeared, or is judiciously controlled. He declares himself happy and contented, cut adrift from war and politics, and passing a peaceful life battling for supremacy over English verbs, and giving up his mind to circumventing the tendency of the plural to creep into his exercises when grammatical accuracy demands the singular. He likes the climate, except that it is too wet, which means that at pretty regular intervals a thundercloud of rain bursts over the thirsty island and keeps it ever green. He certainly looks well and happy, and talking to him under the cool veranda, with the soft air wandering through the quiet garden, one would not readily associate this gentle-mannered, kindly-faced man with the acts that will make the name of Arabi Bey live in history. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of East by West: A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two, by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Eleven: The Liverpool of India. When I was at Hong Kong, I heard a plaintive protest against the ignorance prevalent in England on matters pertaining to the colony. They do not even know the indignant colonists said by way of climax that hong kong is an island that is a just and unanswerable reproach and by way of averting its adaptation to bombay i hasten to say that the city is actually an island extending over an area of twenty-two square miles it is one of the few valuable acquisitions that came with the Stuarts being ceded to this country in 1661 as part of the dowry of the Portuguese Princess Catherine on her marriage with Charles II. Some little difficulty followed upon this arrangement, the Portuguese captain in possession declining to fulfil the treaty, and the British soldiers who had been sent out to take over the place were landed on the island of Caruar to await the settlement of the dispute, which many anticipated by dying. Charles the Second was exceedingly wroth with his father-in-law, blustered a good deal, demanded a hundred thousand pounds by way of compensation, and finally took nothing. Two years later the English troops somehow or other got into Bombay, and in 1668, nothing in the way of money being squeezable out of the new possession, King Charles handed it over to the East India Company for an annual payment of ten pounds. The company proceeded in business-like manner to improve the attractiveness of the place, and had succeeded so well that in 1675, when Dr. John Fryer visited it, the original population of ten thousand souls had been multiplied sixfold. They were, according to the early traveller's account, a very mixed lot a set of the most confounded rascals in the world, as Sir John Astley on an historical occasion urbanely described the Irish home rulers in the House of Commons. What the East India Company wanted was men and women to fill up the new settlement, which speedily became the Alsatia of India. Strangely enough, this early characteristic of mixed nationality clings to Bombay to the present day, all the nations of the world jostle each other in its teeming streets. According to the last census, the population of 10,000, which owned the sway of Portugal in 1661, had, in the course of 220 years, reached over 773,000. Of these, only 10,451 were Europeans, a mere handful of the dominant race 
planted out amid the luxuriance of native growth. Considerably more than half the population is Hindu, of various castes and divers principalities. A hundred and fifty-eight thousand are Mohammedans. The rest are Parsees, Jews, Portuguese, Negroes, half-breeds, and Chinese. These last, which form so important and numerous a section of other countries on the coast of the Eastern Hemisphere, have gained no foothold in Bombay. After all these years, there are only a hundred and sixty-nine in the city. The reason for this is perhaps not far to seek. The work which the Chinese successfully undertake in Hong Kong, the Strait Settlements and the Malay Peninsula, is accomplished in Bombay by natives or earlier settlers. Where the Chinaman would set up as a banker, he is faced by the Marwari. Where he would embark as a merchant or shipowner, he finds the Parsee in possession. He is an excellent cook and household servant, but so are the Indo-Portuguese, who have an earlier claim. Whilst for the lower arts, the washing and tailoring, the native is more than equal to demands upon his time and energies. Bombay had at one time an evil reputation for its fatal insanitariness. It was a common saying that the duration of a European's life was spanned by two monsoons. On one side of the town there was, and in bettered condition still is, a wide expanse of low land called the flats. Over these the ocean washed when the monsoon blew, and when the wind ceased, the sea, sullenly retreating, left behind a morass which bred malarious fever. This evil was grappled with just a hundred years ago by Governor Hornby. He had frequently represented to the directors of the East India Company the perils of the situation, and had pointed out how they might be averted by the creation of an embankment that would keep the sea off the flats. The proposed improvement would, however, cost a lack of rupees, and such willful extravagance the court of directors resolutely declined to sanction. Repeated application met with persistent refusal. But Governor Hornby was a man of courage and resource. He estimated that the work might, if undertaken in a liberal spirit, be completed in a year. He waited till his term of office was within eighteen months of expiring, and then began the embankment. There was no telegraph in those days, nor any overland mail expedited by swift ships and express trains. News travelled slowly to Leadenhall Street, and the embankment grew apace. The directors, either getting wind of the project, or suspecting the governor of evil intent, sent an urgent dispatch bearing on the subject. It duly reached Governor Hornby, but he, desiring not to have his mind distracted whilst the great work was in progress, left the dispatch unopened in his desk. When the embankment was completed and the lack of rupees spent, he opened the letter, and found it was an order for his suspension from the office and authority of Governor of Bombay. It was too late to prevent the creation of the embankment, and the Governor could only write and express his regret for the series of circumstances that had baffled the intent of the Court of Directors. The Honourable Court momentarily went mad with rage, but it could not tear up the embankment, which remains to this day the salvation of Bombay and an enduring monument to the memory of the audacious governor. Oddly enough, within the last twenty years Bombay has permanently benefited by a somewhat similar high-handed proceeding on the part of an official. Any one who lived in Bombay in 1860 and returned to it now would scarcely recognise his old acquaintance. Within that period, chiefly between 1861 and 1872, Bombay was visited by something like an epidemic of palatial building. It began during the American War, when the price of cotton steadily went up, pouring sovereigns by the million into the lap of Bombay. It is estimated that between 1861 and 1866, 
Bombay received 81 million sterling over and above what she had during the previous five years gladly accepted as full value for her cotton. A great deal of this fabulous wealth disappeared during the mad rush of speculation which whelmed the city in 1864, but a good deal of it stuck, and its proceeds may be seen to this day. Wealthy natives, making coup after coup in cotton, and scarcely knowing what to do with their money, determined to keep their memories green by dowering the city with some stately gift in stone. One presented a lack of rupees wherewith to build the clock tower which looks abroad over island, sea, and mainland. When the inevitable crash came, this benefactor was ruined. Only recently the tower has been completed, and it was found that so munificent had been the money gift, it was impossible to spend the last five thousand pounds. The original donor, pathetically setting forth his present condition of comparative destitution, petitioned the government to refund him this overplus, which would be sufficient to give him a fresh start in business. The government, in a minute which cannot be read without a glow of admiration, frigidly rebuked the unfortunate man for even submitting such a proposition, and reminded him that the money, should they loose their grasp of it, belonged not to him but to his creditors. Hereupon the creditors pricked up their ears and hailed a Daniel come to judgment, but the government felt they had done all that could be expected in the cause of commercial morality by laying down this principle, and they hold on to the money. It was during these hilarious times, when money flowed in like the rising tide, that Bombay found its Osman. The municipal administration of the city was conducted in some not very clearly established manner by a commissioner and a bench of justices. The commissioner happened to be a gentleman of much ability, overmastering energy, and a fine taste for street architecture. He pulled down and built up, broadened thoroughfares, created squares, levelled rookeries, and above all built a magnificent market the finest in India, or, for the matter of that, in the world, which was named after himself, Christian and surname, so that there should be no mistake. Bombay was delighted. From a commonplace town it was growing into a beautiful city, compared with which Paris, under the wand of Baron Osman, would have to take second rank. Then the bills began to come in, and there followed a period of consternation, broken by a blast of indignation. The popular edile became the execrated spoiler. He stood gallantly to his post for some time, asserting the inviolability of his office, but the wrath of the taxpayer prevailed, and finally the once autocratic commissioner was smuggled out of Bombay, something after the fashion in which Sir John Falstaff escaped from Dame Quickly's in the hour of peril. But, like Governor Hornby, his works were indestructible. There remained for Bombay nothing but to pay the bill and enjoy with whatever grace was possible the fair buildings and broad boulevards it had unwittingly purchased. Fortunately, the active commissioner had not the opportunity, even if he had the desire, to deal with the native streets. Consequently, Bombay presents within convenient area the full contrast of a modern and magnificent European quarter, with the narrow alleys flanked by lofty buildings in which the natives live. Here one may stroll for hours as far remote from sign of Western life as if India were still under her native princes or her Mughal conquerors. Leading out of Bombay in the direction of Parel, where the governor lives, is a street a mile and a half long, which, whether by day or night, is thronged with a motley multitude. Here, with pointed turban, glorious in red and gold, is the Banyan, the earliest foreign trader of India, who to this day controls much of the trade with Africa and Arabia. These are good church-going Hindus, and holding the Buddhist theory of the transmigration of souls, they will not destroy animal life in any form. 
In various parts of the city there are homes for decayed dogs, cats, and other animals, pindera poles they are called, endowed and supported by these shrewd traders. Driving early one morning along the Queen's Road, I saw a Hindu apparently dropping seed by the wayside. He was scattering it close by the grass-grown wall that here skirts the road. When he had gone his way, I went to see what he had been doing, and found he had been strewing bits of sugar for the refection of an army of ants, who, some ten deep and in endless stream, were passing and repassing, engaged upon one of their mysterious enterprises. On this same morning, in the same road, nearer to the city, I saw a Mussulman produce his prayer carpet and perform his morning devotions. A few paces off was a Parsee in high glazed hat, white cotton bedgown and bright red trousers, hailing his deity in the rising sun, whilst on the sward close by was an Englishman in flannels and sun-helmet, diligently riding round, taking his exercise at the only hour possible in this Christmas weather. The low wall which flanks Queen's Road at this part serves other purposes than that of patrol ground of the ants. It is a favourite sleeping quarter for the fastidious native who finds his overcrowded dwelling too hot. Nothing is more common, passing here in the early morning, than to see a bundle on the wall move, a cloud of white drapery parted, and, behold, a mild Hindu, a truculent Moslem, or a half-caste out of place, rises from a comfortable night's sleep. His ablutions are performed as publicly as his night's rest is taken. From some of the coolies passing by with leather skins tightly filled, he begs as much water as will fill his lota, the small circular brass vessel without which no native moves many yards from his headquarters. This he pours over his hands, rubs his face with all, washes out his mouth, and is ready for anything else that Allah or Vishnu may send him. This capacity on the part of the Hindu for sleeping anywhere where night may chance to find him is rather embarrassing in hotels. The personal servant who invariably accompanies the Anglo-Indian sleeps outside his master's door, and till this habitude grows familiar is apt to be stumbled over. It makes no difference where or how the door may be situated, there the servant sleeps. At Benares, our room was one of a range facing the courtyard with an open veranda skirting it. On the stone flags of this veranda, with the thermometer at freezing point, slept three servants, like dogs at their master's doors, one, I know, having come from the far south. The orthodox Hindus who are under the domination of the Brahmins are most frequently passed in the press of the bazaars or the bustle of the Parel Road. An easy means of distinguishing between Mussulman and Hindu is found in the cut and fold of the cholis or breastcloth. The Hindu fastens his near his right shoulder, a small space cut away disclosing the bare flesh. The Mussulman fastens his near the left shoulder. The Hindus are divided into two broadly defined camps, the one worshippers of Vishnu the preserver, and the other of Shiva the destroyer. You may know a follower of Shiva by his having a mark stamped in colour horizontally on his forehead. The adherents of Vishnu have a similar mark, but it is stamped in colour perpendicularly. The Mohammedans also have their two camps, one the Sunnis, who claim to be orthodox, and the other the Shias, who accept as the successor of the Prophet Ali, the fourth Caliph, and his sons Hassan and Hussein. Of this latter sect are the Boras, the peddlers of India, who drop down on the newcomer at hotels with the sureness and swiftness of a hawk. In the street throng are to be found many coolies, whom the observant friar, surveying Bombay two hundred years ago, bracketed with Christians, or rather put in a higher place. At a distance enough from the fort, he wrote, lies the town, 
in which confusedly live English, Portuguese, Topazes, Gentoos, Moors, Coolies, and Christians. Topaz is the name quaintly given to the Indo-Portuguese, and evidently refers to the lighter colour of their skin as compared with the natives. Other half-breeds, result of European and native connection, are called Eurasians, a sonorous word, the origin of which seems obscure, till we perceive it is formed by elision of the compound word Europe, Asia. Notable even among this many-coloured crowd, in which no two people are in respect of style and colour dressed exactly alike, are the Parsees. This industrious and wealthy section of the population have a strong and lamentable tendency to rig themselves out in European clothes. But with broadcloth coat and trousers on their body, they never forsake their curious headgear, the tall, brimless, glazed hat slanting backwards. All day long this crowd passes and repasses, an ever-varying picture of enduring interest. The ordinary liveliness of a busy street scene is added to by the fact that all shop work is done in public. Here, as in Japan, there are no shop fronts, the proprietor, his family, his friends and his customers squatting on the floor of the excavation in the lower part of the house, which is called the shop. Bombay thought itself ruined when, with the sudden conclusion of the American war, prices of cotton tumbled down, carrying with them all the fabric of speculative enterprise built on the foundation. But, as statistics show, Bombay trade has not only survived the crash, but has considerably increased. More cotton is now exported, and a larger aggregate sum paid for it than during the most inflated period of exceptional war-borne prosperity. Naturally, in these circumstances, the population is increasing, whilst that of Calcutta is standing still, and that of Madras declining. There is a familiar saying in India which illustrates the general appreciation of the more favoured condition of Bengal as being the seat of the government. When the punker is pulled, the stronger current of welcome air goes to the side on which the boy stands, the other side benefiting only by the return swing. The better position is called the Bengal side of the punker. But it is clear that at the present rate of relative progress, this term will become obsolete. Not content with exporting cotton, Bombay is now spinning it. Several mills, giving employment to some thousands of hands, are now in operation, and others are projected. Apart from considerations local to Bombay, this is an enterprise that will be watched with kindly interest by all who have at heart the welfare of India. It is amongst the undisputed axioms bearing upon the recurrence of famine that the more manufactures spread, withdrawing men and women from the overpopulated labour market in the agricultural districts, the less frequent will famine be. In addition to cotton, Bombay exports opium to the extent of about six million sterling per annum. Wheat also is a considerable item in its export returns, though the quantity greatly varies through succeeding years. These are transactions conducted through the houses of the great Banyan merchants, or of English firms. But the 600,000 natives who populate the city have their hands full of work in smaller ways. The brass workers are a great guild in Bombay, clustering together in long rows of shops that extend for some way down the Parel Road, which they make resonant with the clatter of their hammers. Printing is another industry which finds bread for many people. The printers, chaparillas as they are called, do not set up type, but stamp muslins, calicoes and silks with simple designs and in bold colours. Some confine themselves to dyeing the calico, which comes either from the Manchester looms or the local mills. When a Mohammedan or Hindu woman wants a new gagras or cholis, she buys the necessary length of calico and takes it to the printer, 
selecting her own colours. These often seem bold regarded by themselves, but gracefully wrapped around the swarthy limbs and shoulders, and mingling with the party-coloured throng, they are enchanting. After a pretty extensive journey through the largest towns in northwest India, I do not remember to have seen among the lowest classes five women who were badly dressed, and these exceptions were probably Persians. The innate art taste of the natives of India is shown not less in their magnificent monuments at Benares than in the art of dressing themselves. In the School of Art at Bombay, an experiment has for some time been carried on with conspicuous success to revive the ancient art of Indian pottery. Mr. Terry, the director and moving spirit of the institution, works upon a very simple plan. He takes boys out of the street, gives them a few elementary lessons in drawing and designing, and then, providing them with a wheel and a stock of clay, bids them create whatever their fancy or their genius, if they have it, suggests to them. The result is seen in some original compositions of shape and colour, not in the most highly finished style, it is true, but preferable to some tastes by reason of their unconventionality. The Prince of Wales, when he was here, took home a large packing case of the products of the school. A more generally accessible collection is to be found in the South Kensington Museum, though I confess that it was not till I had travelled all the way to Bombay that I made the acquaintance of the work. The extension of the dock accommodation and the opening of the Rajputana Railway, a link on the way to the far north, have already given to the trade of Bombay a notable impulse, which is certain to increase. The city now has a regular municipality, which keeps a sharp eye on all means of adding to the prosperity of its charge. A remarkably fine body of police answer for order. Great care is taken with their training, amongst other things in which they are tutored being the practice of giving first aid to the wounded. Sir James Ferguson told me a capital story about this class, an examination of which he had just attended. The men were being catechised as to what steps they would take in the event of various street accidents of common occurrence. Now supposing, the director asked, looking round the class, all burning to distinguish themselves in the august presence of the governor of Bombay, supposing a buggy driving along the street were to run over a man and fracture his ribs, what would you do? Run after the buggy waller! driver, and take him to prison, promptly answered one of the men, policeman instinct overcoming humanitarian impulse. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of East by West, A Journey in the Recess, Volume 2, by Henry W. Lucy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. Burying and Giving in Marriage Chuturbuj Murarji presents his best compliments to blank and requests the favour of their company to a nautch party in honour of the marriage of his son Chururodas at Javerborg on the Kalbadevi Road on Monday the 17th December 1883 from 9 to 12 p.m. In response to this invitation, boldly printed on a white card with the imprint of the Am E. Jamshid Printing Press Co. Limited, in scarcely less large type at the bottom, I found myself in the Calvadavy Road at 10.30, when it might reasonably be supposed the fun was at the height of its fastness and fury. The giver of the party is one of the wealthiest and most popular natives in Bombay. The road in which the hall is situated is the centre of Hindu life. Consequently, there was much excitement in the neighbourhood, and the approaches to the hall were crowded, much as is the doorway of a London church when a fashionable wedding is taking place but it became clear on entering that all the life and excitement were outside. Within, 
ranged on benches leaving a broad gangway in the centre, were some sixty or seventy natives, chiefly dressed in cool, loose-fitting white robes. Most of them had a bunch of roses in hand, the unfortunate flowers being tightly tied as if the design were to make a ligature. They had suffered the further indignity on presentation to each guest of being sprinkled with powerful rose-water. One of the elders of the family carried round a large dish of betel-nuts, made up in lime-leaves, the whole of which one was expected to put in his mouth forthwith, an expectation cheerfully fulfilled by the natives. At the lower end of the hall stood the Nautch dancer, gorgeously arrayed in costly cloak of crimson silk loaded with gold lace and embroidery. I suppose a hundred pounds could not have purchased this raiment, besides which the lilies of the field would timidly bend their heads. The lady could afford such extravagance, since the fee paid for her attendance was a hundred and twenty pounds. This is unusually high, but the host was rich, and she a prima donna among Nautch girls, having come down specially from Benares. One pace behind her stood the orchestra, composed of three men. One incessantly beat a tom-tom, a second played a kind of violin, and the third played with infinite skill a pair of small bells. The girl, in a harsh, unmelodious voice, sang a monotonous recital of a love-chase. The general idea of the remont was the disappearance of a lover and the guest by the faithful maiden. From time to time she got on his track, when a little liveliness was introduced into her motions and voice, but for the most part she saw him not, and her dollar visibly affected the spirits of the patient audience, who chewed their betel-nut reflectively and looked unutterably bored. The chief victim was the bridegroom, a boy of thirteen who sat near the head of one of the front rows, dressed in jacket of richly brocaded satin and ruby velvet trousers. In strings around his neck and glistening all over his robe were diamonds worth forty thousand pounds, but these carried no comfort to his seared soul. It was all very well for his father, beaming on the guests that came and went, and seeing in the influential assemblage tokens of respect and regard for himself. It was not bad for the uncle, flitting hither and thither with his dish of betel-nuts, on hospitable care's intent. It was pretty well for the bride, aged eleven, who had long since been put to bed and was probably dreaming of a new doll nor need the guests have looked so like the famous party in the parlour, all silent and all damned. This was for most of them a first appearance. They had dropped in casually, might drop out when the thing became absolutely unbearable. But for the bridegroom, the business had commenced on the previous Friday night, and would not conclude till the Thursday night following— there would be some diversion on the morrow, since then he would set forth for the bride's house at the head of a goodly procession, and would make believe to bear the coy maiden off, in spite of the tears of her mother and the threats of her father. But at night, from nine to twelve, this dreary business would go on again, with the solemnly pirouetting nautch girl, her waving hands, her mechanical glances to right and left, and her harsh voice uplifted in pursuit of a lover too shrewd to allow himself to be caught. There would be the tom-tom man, the man with the fiddle, and the man with the bells, playing without cessation. There would be the uncle going round with the betel-nuts, the stream of guests smilingly entering and gladly going. As he thought of these things, the bridegroom's heavy eyelids drooped from sheer weariness, and he yawned till he shook the garland of jewels that glistened on his neck. I should like to have taken him out into the back yard for a game of marbles, or for ten ecstatic minutes with a top. But fate had called him to higher duties, and with gallant attempts to keep his eyelids propped up and to suppress a yawn, he sat it out.
the company in the hall was exclusively composed of men but through closely latticed windows at the upper end glimpses were caught of black eyes and white teeth and there was heard the murmur of female voices on a cross bench at the top of the hall was a rajah a handsome man splendidly dressed who with hand resting on the jewelled hilt of his sword sat impassive as far as his body was concerned but his bright black eyes were never still roaming restlessly over this company and taking in every detail shortly after eleven the nautch girl began to wake up she had caught sight of the judiciously retreating lover and uplifting her voice proclaimed the happy chance as she sang she advanced with slowly regulated paces up the hall the orchestra following her and the tom-tom man with well simulated interest crying ha ha when the maiden reiterated i see him now the climax seemed to have arrived and having come to see a nautch dance i expected the dance was about to begin but except that the girl waved her hands and body and now and then slowly revolved there was no more motion than during the earlier portion of the performance there is a vague notion in the western mind that nautch is the indian rendering of naughty the worst thing that could be said against this nautch dance by one of the chief professors in india was that it was unapproachably and inexpressibly dull as to decency the girl wore more clothes than would fit out the inhabitants of a japanese village her heavily embroidered robe nearly reached the ground displaying below a pair of trousers so long that they showed only the silver ringed toes and draggled away at the heels fully a foot too long there were apparently no arrangements for pockets for the girl kept her handkerchief in a convenient place between the two small drums that form the tom-tom she made no scruple when necessity arose of taking this out using it and returning it but always with graceful movements of the body and pretty waving of small shapely hands jewelled to the finger-tips by eleven thirty we had had enough and left amid a succession of yawns from the bridegroom which threatened to have a fatal effect and so bring the proceedings to a premature close on the next day following the natural sequence of services in the prayer-book i went to see a parsee funeral the towers of silence stand on a hill overlooking bombay and the long stretch of water known as back bay the situation is one of the most favoured in the neighbourhood of the city and the hill is dotted with the houses of european residents who do not too much like the contiguity of these awesome towers but the parsees were here first and it cannot be said that either their burial place or their funeral service is obtrusive from the road below the towers are invisible and only a vulture slowly sailing through the sultry air reminds one of their propinquity there are five towers in all made from a common model they are twenty-five feet high the diameter being seventy-five feet within the roofless tower is a sloping platform marked out in three divisions within the outer ring are placed the corpses of men women are laid in grooves formed in the second circle and children in the third with the exception of the top always open to the heavens there is only one entrance to the tower this is by a doorway made in the thick walls through which the corpse bearers enter and deposit the naked body in its appointed place as soon as they retire the vultures who have been waiting for their meal impatient of the scant ceremonies that precede its setting forth swoop down and begin their work no human eye has beheld the ghastly spectacle the silence and the solitude of the towers are broken only by the presence and hideous bustle of the birds of prey but it is known that within half an hour of the bodies being laid out in the tower nothing is left but the skeleton eight days later by which time the bones are thoroughly dried the corpse-bearers return 
take up the relics and cast them in a well in the centre of the tower, where in process of years they become decomposed, and absolutely nothing is left of what was once man or woman. For two hundred years the Parsees, living together in Bombay, have here found their last resting place, their dust mingling in a common tomb, undivided in death as they were bound together in life. Yet in all these years it has not been found necessary to clear out the wells by reason of overcrowding. It is customary for a man or woman to be buried in the particular tower where those of their own family, traced back in many cases for two centuries, have been given to the vultures. One tower is set apart for special purposes, and is the least frequented. Here are buried members of the Parsi sect, who have been guilty of heinous crimes, or in some way become outcasts from their race. It would be shocking that a Parsi should be buried in the earth. A criminal belonging to the sect must have Parsi burial after the fashion in vogue since the time of Cyrus, but the bones of honest men and women may not be contaminated by mixture with his. In a temple commanding all the towers, the sacred fire, lit two hundred years ago, is still kept burning, and is mathematically set so that the light may shine through an aperture in each of the towers. We had the advantage of having the place and the mode of funeral explained by the secretary, a genial person in spectacles, white gown and bright red trousers, who spoke excellent English. He explained that the Parsees regarded cremation as a preferable means of disposing of dead bodies, but they worshipped fire, and could not set for their deity the performance of this last office. Whilst admitting that the process was naturally revolting to the Western mind, he powerfully justified it on the score of sanitariness. So careful are the Parsees that earth shall not be polluted by the absorption of matter from dead bodies, that in connection with the well containing the decomposed bones, they have an elaborate system of drainage which carries off whatever may issue direct to the sea. Whatever else may be said of the system, it is certainly cheap, five rupees covering funeral costs. As we stood in the grounds, a funeral came by. In accordance with custom, the service had commenced at the house of the deceased, where friends and relations had gathered and prayer had been said. It is enjoined by the Parsi ritual that whatever the intervening distance may be, the body must be carried on the shoulders of men from the bed to the tower. They passed us at a swinging pace, four men bearing the body on a light bier, shoulder high. The body was simply covered from head to foot with a white cloth. All the mourners were dressed in white, and those not carrying the bier walked two and two, each couple holding a handkerchief between them. I asked the secretary what was the significance of this, but he did not know, could only surmise in no very clear way, that it was a fortification against impurity. It was ordained by Zoroaster, and that was enough for him, if not sufficient for a mind fresh to the inquiry. Before the procession walked an old man leading a white dog with curly tail, and not in the best condition. I thought he had caught the mongrel trespassing within the cemetery, and was leading it to the gate with intent ignominiously to thrust it forth. But I learned that a dog is an indispensable figure in the funeral, scarcely less so than the corpse itself. When the bearers brought the body to the foot of the tower, on the topmost edge of which the vultures sat, a black foreboding line, the cloth was removed from the head, the dog brought up, and effort made to cause him to look into the dead face. This done, the corpse-bearers took up the body and disappeared within the trap-door, and the dog was led away. Here again, except that it was ordained in the ritual and had been practised for thousands of years, my philosopher and friend in the baggy red trousers was at a loss for explanation. 
some hold he said whilst warning me against accepting it as anything but a surmise that the dog's eyes have the power of attracting to themselves all impurity in well-regulated households the dog is brought in to look upon the face of the dying man or woman before the last struggle comes just as in another church extreme unction is administered as the dying eyes of the pious catholic look last upon the cross so ere earthly things fade for ever from his closing eyes the parsi looks on the face of a dog the dog must be white in colour and to be perfect should be marked with yellow spots a rare phenomenon reserved for the betterment of the eternal chances of the rich we saw the dog come back and no longer wondered at his melancholy aspect what a life it must lead to be taken out at frequent intervals expecting that it is going for a scamper through the fields or peradventure to be led forth to a bountiful meal and always to be brought up short to see the cloth uncovered to think that perhaps after all here is the meal and once again only the pale dead face and the glassy eyes I asked the secretary did they live long, but he did not know. The corpse-bearers having disappeared within the tower, the mourners quickly retraced their steps and ranged themselves outside the temple on the side facing the tower. They stood there mute and motionless for several minutes. Suddenly the silence was broken by the sound of a bell. The black line circling the top of the tower swooped downward with hoarse cries and the rustle of great wings, and the mourners took up the concluding portion of the service for what cannot strictly be called the burial of the dead. When we left the place a quarter of an hour later, the black ring on the top of the whitewashed tower was beginning to form again. The vultures slowly sailing up were resuming their old positions many of them standing on one leg seemed to be picking their teeth with the other claw as with contentment born of the dinner they lazily surveyed the scene bombay busy and bustling still containing fair supplies of plump parsees and beyond the quiet sea taking on roseate tints in the light of the setting sun End of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of East by West: A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen: The Holy City. The railway journey from Bombay to Benares is accomplished in two nights and the greater parts of two days. The line passes through a level country, which at this season of the year is piteously parched. There are many signs that in the rainy season the supply of water is even embarrassingly rich. But the river beds which drain the plain at brief intervals are now dry lands, and the sign of former water makes the country look more desolate. Only the trees bear up against the prevailing drought. These, deep rooted in the soil and profiting by the plentiful summer rains, have begun to take on a weary look but on the whole they are wonderfully green and relieve the landscape from absolute barrenness for the rest there is no sign of life save the thin cattle forlornly nosing the burnt stubble that here and there fringes the dusty soil what a scene for dimmed eyes gazing through gaunt cheeks body and soul steeped in the sickness of hopeless hunger with the memory of famine in the past and dull apprehensions in the future, it is no wonder that the people one sees in the villages through which the trains pass should have a look of settled melancholy and eyes and mouths that never laugh. It was foretold when railways were projected in India that they would prove a failure because the Hindus of caste would never suffer the contamination risked in herding in a third-class carriage. This foreboding has been entirely falsified. It is the third-class traffic that is not only the backbone but the flesh and blood of Indian railways. 
all the trains on the trunk lines are much longer than on english railways and the ordinary allowance of first-class accommodation is two carriages of second-class one the rest are third-class carriages and during a railway journey of three thousand miles i never saw them otherwise than overcrowded in india partly owing to the climate and chiefly to the long distances travelled the night trains are more populated than those which run through the day this becomes a serious matter to the traveller who has lain down to take his only chance of a night's rest at every station on all the lines we found a crowd of from twenty to fifty natives waiting for the train if they could have taken their places quietly this would not have been a matter of general interest but the shouting and shrieking the running to and fro is at first alarming suggesting that their object is not to take their seats but to storm the train the difficulty of the situation and its ludicrousness if one were inclined to take a humorous view having been suddenly wakened up for the fifth time in a run of fifty miles are added to by the appearance of the newcomers in india every one travels with bed and baggage and to see half a hundred hindus wildly racing up and down a platform with their bedclothes in their arms or wrapped around their body is exciting till constant repetition wears off the edge of novelty in other ways than that of commerce railways are doing a great work in india they are breaking down the barriers of caste if a brahmin or a jain wants to go from bombay to jabalpur delhi calcutta or madras he must make his account with the certainty of finding himself at some point of his journey jammed between an outcast and a mohammedan he must even unless he is content to starve eat before them and having done this in special circumstances without finding the heavens fall worse things from the brahminical point of view may follow benares is not only the holiest but the oldest city in india before christ was born benares was great when babylon was struggling with nineveh for supremacy says mr sherring when tyre was planting her colonies when athens was growing in strength before rome had become known or greece had contended with persia or nebuchadnezzar had captured jerusalem and the inhabitants of judea had been carried into captivity benares had risen to greatness if not to glory nay she may have heard of the fame of solomon and have sent her ivory her apes and her peacocks to adorn his palaces while partly with her gold he may have overlaid the temple of the lord in spite of british domination steam launches on the river and railway trains crossing the ganges by iron bridges benares preserves its old-time aspect and is with the exception of an english church a mission-house a college a police station and the cantonments of british soldiery much as it was when akbar reigned one railway does not presume to enter the town but has its terminus on the further side of the ganges the other the oud and rohilkund enters from the town side but stops on the outskirts and the bazaars and temples have it all their own way in the town the river is crossed by a wretched bridge of boats whose poverty of accommodation is made up for by excessive toll the upper portion of the town near the english settlement is liberally laid out in squares green lawns after the rain but just now so bare and brown that it is difficult to believe blades of grass could ever burst through its barrenness still the trees are green and are peopled with a lively race of squirrels who dodge the passer-by peeping round the trunk to see if he is really coming and disappearing amid the boughs with a nimbleness that makes nothing of their bushy tails there is a great deal of animal and bird life about the streets safe in the freedom from harm secured by the gentle creed of the hindu the sparrows chirp about the roadways and almost stand to be passed over on the footpaths 
two grey kites benignantly eye them from a ruined wall as if they would not touch them even if someone else would kill them on the trees in the temples and promenading the roofs of the bazaars occasionally entering by open windows and taking pot luck are thousands of monkeys sacred from stick or stone these are not monkeys such as occasionally lend added terror to the london organ grinder but creatures running to the length of three feet from head to haunch and of aspect preternaturally sagacious flocks of goats meander through the streets big well-formed handsome beasts bullocks are used as beasts of burden but the cow like the pope leads a merry life i suppose the cows belong to somebody but they walk about the streets as if they were ground landlords they are small cattle plump and well favoured forming a strong contrast with the thin and careworn human population amongst whom they indolently pick their way they stroll down the centre of the narrow thoroughfares through the bazaars frequently stopping the traffic types of the idolatry which bars the growth of civilization i met one one morning strolling through the bazaar shouldering everybody out of the way suddenly she caught sight of a basket of greens which a woman was peddling on the roadway without saying by your leave the cow stopped and critically turning over the greens selected a young and toothsome cauliflower the poor woman feebly battled with the marauder but the cow took no notice and did not budge till it had its cauliflower when it resumed its morning stroll through the bazaar the cow it is well known is one of the idols of hindu worship and if the woman's god wanted a cauliflower it would have been sacrilegious too strenuously to resist the desire close by where this uncommercial transaction in green market stuffs took place there is a temple where under the portico half a dozen bulls are kept literally in clover the place is much dirtier and smells more vilely than an english farmer would like to have his cowshed but the beasts seemed placidly happy reflectively munched their grass wondering what they did there and in their slumbers babbling o'er green fields the cow in bronze figures in various sizes is in most of the temples on the pavement near one of extra size and super sanctity i saw two men playing dice as for the temples themselves they are more especially to the traveller fresh from the gorgeous fanes of japan in all ways despicable at best they are so crowded in among other buildings that any architectural beauty they might possess is lost to view in order to see the far-famed golden temple one has to ascend the first story of a shop on the opposite side of the narrow way before he can behold the domes which for the peace of his soul the maharaja runjit singh had freshly crowned with plate of gold for the most part the sacred places do not merit the name of temple being rather shrines a few feet high many of them are like deserted toy shops in which business has gradually dwindled down to the vanishing point and the broken-hearted proprietor has gone away not caring to take with him the small model of a cow the grotesque doll or the strings of faded marigolds which garland the tawdry shrine at all the temples brahmins abound in pursuit of their various functions the principal one seeming to be that of begging there are many things in buddhism incredible to the western mind but not least is the possibility of paying any kind of reverence to the lazy fellows who skulk about the temples bleed the pilgrims of their uttermost farthing and pester foreigners for the smallest copper coin buddha has many votaries in crowded india but the brahmins are numerically an appreciable portion of the numberless congregation they toil not neither do they spin and since they must live they unblushingly beg all their ministrations from the solemnest to the most immaterial end with outstretched hand 
palm uppermost. We stood at Manikarnika, the sacred well of Hindu mythology, towards which, from hill and dale, teeming city and silent field, the eyes of the pious Hindu are strained. Hither, as the first duty on entering the holy city, the steps of the wayworn pilgrim are bent. Vishnu dug this well and filled it with the perspiration from his sainted body, and into it Mahadeva later dropped his earring. So holy is the place, and so powerful the grace with which it is endowed, that its waters will wash away the worst of sins. Even murder is not too black a crime to resist its cleansing properties. Looked at with eyes lacking faith, the holy well is a pit of filthy water, the odour of which, wafted upwards as its depths are stirred by successive pilgrims, induces desire to get the inspection over as quickly as possible. Access is gained to the level of the water by a flight of seventeen roughly hewn steps. Two Brahmins were officiating, dressed in dirty white calico trousers, charlies of faded finery, and black headgear, half cap, half turban. Business was comparatively slack. One pilgrim, whose dusty feet betokened a long journey, and whose villainous face suggested a special necessity for absolution, walked down the steps and was received at the bottom by a Brahmin, who promptly sold him a handful of marigolds, and took the money before proceeding further with the scheme of salvation. The pilgrim, holding the flowers in the palms of his joined hands, dipped them in the water, and then threw one half upon its surface, where already floated hundreds of buds sickening in the fetid tank. Taking up another handful of water, he stood with it dripping through his fingers, whilst the Brahmin rapidly recited a formula. Finally, the pilgrim walked into the well, and thrice dipped his head beneath its yellow, evil-smelling water after which came again the inevitable coppers, and he lightly ran up the steps whiter than snow, though his sins had been as scarlet. Immediately after came two women, who went through the same process on their own account, and finally ducked a child, who vigorously protested against the impurity. Seated by the well was another Brahmin, who, if physiognomy be a true guide, ought to have spent his nights and days in the well. He had the most evil-looking countenance I have seen since I left San Francisco. There was about him, withal, a grotesqueness suggestive of the low-born villain of the stage who lays in wait for the fair maiden, and would rob and murder her but for the timely appearance of Sir Galahad de Montmorency. On his head was a hat built up in conical shape, till the diminishing peak reached a height of fully two feet. Round it were twined garlands of yellow marigolds, the Hindu's sacred flower. Round his neck were half a dozen strings of beads of various sizes. His right hand was hidden in something like a sock, with the toes downward at right angles from his wrist. The counterpart of this I had seen offered for sale in the bazaar, and I knew that it was designed to cover the hand with which he counted his beads. Some of these curious adjuncts to church service are decorated with the semblance of a cow's head sewn on at the heel part. This holy man was content with a plain sock. He sat cross-legged on a bench, motionless and apparently lifeless, save that as I stood a little distance off and made note of his dress, I could see his weaselly little eyes furtively glancing at me. He evidently thought I was sketching him, which pleased him, though there was higher satisfaction in the conviction that the episode would certainly not end without a transfer of coppers, perhaps even of silver. By the side of him upon the bench was a trumpet and a sort of tambourine. Slipping the sock from off his hand, he took up the musical instruments, blew a tremendous blast from the trumpet, and vigorously rattled the tambourine. I was so pleased with this remarkable man that I am afraid I behaved with injudicious liberality. 
and the report of my munificence it amounted to sixpence in sterling silver being noised abroad the two brahmins leaving a fresh influx of pilgrims in the well ran after me clamouring for bakshish this well is the centre of shrines and holy places a stone's throw from my friend with the peaked hat and the cunning greedy little eyes is a marble slab in the centre of which are two small dents these we learn are the veritable imprint of vishnu's feet when he alighted upon the earth they are certainly very small in many of the temples the brahmins are employed in rubbing oil into the heads and bodies of the devout in one i saw seated an old man with a grand statuesque head patiently sitting whilst a muscular brahmin worked the oil into his pate close by here too is a more than usually sacred growth of the people a patriarchal tree whose once stalwart limbs drooping under the weight of far-spreading boughs were supported by a block of solid masonry built under them being saturday an ever-changing procession of grave elders matronly women young men and maidens were walking round and round the tree chanting a low strain every time they passed a particular point in its circumference they threw on it with their hand water taken from the ganges and carried in their lotas some varied the performance by throwing marigolds or grains of rice it seemed a particularly dull game of follow my leader but it is a serious religious function and good hindus would not see saturday's sun go down till they had walked a hundred and eight times round the people tree laved its trunk with holy water or cast upon it some offering of food or flour a goat had discovered the richness of the land and climbing up the masonry browsed upon the flowers whilst the pigeons coming down in swarms pecked up the rice nobody saying them nay bathing was going forward briskly in the ganges and it was notable how men and women coming up from their ablutions shrank from the touch of the christian in the narrow byways they flattened themselves against the wall and gathered in their skirts as we passed by if we had accidentally touched them the spiritual benefits of their morning bath would have been forfeited and they would have had to return to the ganges and go through it all again we visited the monkey temple which swarms with hideous bloated brutes who have a most ungodlike hankering after a kind of sweetmeat sold at the gates of the temple the temple itself is a poor place with a shrine that might easily be turned to useful purposes by the slight alterations necessary to transform it into an early english fireplace the monkeys when not grinning on the temple steps or making long arms about the courtyard for stray beans or sweetmeats or foraging among private dwellings which abut on the temple live in stately palaces of tamarind trees from the boughs of which they hang by the tail and jabber at their votaries we saw the shrine before which a goat is sacrificed every morning the blood-stained block and the flag on which it stood testifying to the faithful performance that morning of the ceremonial but far more interesting was the observatory built nearly two hundred years ago by the raja j singh by whose stupendous instruments hindu almanacs are to this day constructed the observatory stands near the man mandil ghat on the banks of the ganges and is a striking object seen from the river it is reached by many steps leading to a courtyard the instruments as they are called give the place an appearance rather of a gymnasium than of an observatory there is a wall eleven feet high and nine feet one and a quarter inches broad set in the plane of the meridian by this instrument able persons can ascertain the sun's altitude and zenith distance at noon its greatest declination and the latitude another wall also set in the plane of the meridian is thirty-six feet in length by four and a half broad 
it slopes upwards from a height of sixteen feet four and a quarter inches to twenty two feet three and a half inches following its lines the eye infallibly rests upon the north pole this brick wall is useful for ascertaining the distance from the meridian the declination of the sun or of any planet or star and the right ascension of a star the most curious of the instruments and the most colossal is appropriately called Digance Antra. it consists of a pillar four feet two inches high and three feet seven and a half inches thick surrounded at a distance of seven feet three and a quarter inches by a wall exactly its own height this again is encircled by a wall double its height and distant from it three feet two and a half inches the upper surfaces of both walls are divided into three hundred and sixty degrees and are marked with the points of the compass the object of this simple and attractive contrivance is to find the degrees of azimuth of a planet or star on the whole perhaps a good telescope and a quadrant whilst more portable would be equally useful but j singh worked according to his lights and enjoyed high honours in his day the bazaars of benares are like the native quarters of all great cities the most fascinating places to linger in far above temples and ruins and the ordinary show-places which have honourable mention in guide-books they lie low in the shadow of lofty buildings sacred from the noonday sun the shops are constructed something on the principle in which a malay digs out a boat from the trunk of a tree a hole in the wall is pierced on the level of the street occasionally a few shelves are put up quite as often none the stock in trade is piled about the floor leaving place for the proprietor to squat as near the open air as possible and the shop is open for business in the larger establishments dealing in cloth and cotton goods there is space for one or two customers also to squat on the floor more generally business is conducted with the customer standing outside in the street in either case if all the parties engaged be natives the proceedings are conducted in a style calculated to strike terror into the heart of the timid passer-by shopkeeper and customer glare upon each other with flashing eyes they shout and rave and gesticulate till just when the order-loving foreigner thinks it his duty to go for the police the row suddenly ceases the customer takes a yard or two of print under his arm puts down a few annas and goes his way life being long and custom fleeting in the bazaar much time is by mutual consent whiled away in the practice of bargaining the shopkeeper asks twice or three times as much as he means to take the customer offers something less than he means to give and before the extremes meet at the line fairly marking the value of the goods an immense deal of shouting is done and an hour of an otherwise dull day pleasantly disposed of where europeans are the purchasers a tiers parti appears upon the scene this is the man who wants backsheesh for having brought the high contracting parties together it will be your guide if you have one otherwise any native will do who has seen you wandering about the bazaar and followed you up to a particular stall which you have selected without his assistance and even without knowing that he was following so deeply rooted is the principle of bakshish in the eastern mind that even in these circumstances the shopkeeper will not deny the interloper's right and when you have paid your money hands him a percentage on the first day we visited the bazaars a man got up on the gurry and rode into town when we got out to walk he followed us and as we stopped to make purchases at various shops he joined the party assumed proprietorship of us and claimed his bakshish at one place we bought some white muslin caps at an expenditure of six annas whereupon this fellow extorted from the shopkeeper two pice as his legitimate bakshish after this i took the precaution on approaching other shops formally to introduce this gentleman to the proprietor explaining that we had nothing to do with him or he with us 
and stipulated that if we bought anything he should get nothing this did not abash him in the least or influence his movements and i believe it was with unfeigned regret that the shopkeepers found themselves debarred from giving him anything they would much rather have done business in their own way and secretly resented this interference with their national customs an english resident told me when he took a gari home from the station his servant openly went up to the driver and demanded his share of the money payment all indian servants when making purchases for the household take their commission there is no secrecy in the matter it is done as openly and as much a matter of course as he takes his monthly wages i asked a householder in bombay what percentage of the charges in the monthly expenditure book managed by his butler went into that worthy's pocket well he said having carefully considered the matter he ought not fairly to get more than twenty-five per cent it would be interesting to hear the comments of a congregation of native indian servants on the story of gehazi that the prophet's butler merely for following his master's guests and taking as bakshish two changes of raiment and two talents of silver should be turned into a leper as white as snow would seem to them an unjustifiably harsh proceeding this chapter would with such a congregation prove an insuperable obstacle to proselytizing end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of east by west a journey in the recess volume two by henry w lucy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen bathing in the ganges a difficulty small in its way but not without embarrassment has pursued me since i landed in india i am constantly tempted more especially in the cool freshness of the morning to fill up pauses in conversation with chance acquaintances by observing what a lovely day or what beautiful weather such a remark i feel would be quite startling to an anglo-indian and might even be accepted as a sign of gibbering idiocy one might with equal appropriateness accost an acquaintance at breakfast by remarking that twice two are four or break in upon his evening meditation by observing three from five leave two fine weather is a matter of course in india at this season and is no more a subject of remark than the break of day or the constant flow of the ganges towards the sea nevertheless it is to the newcomer a source of constant marvel a fund of endless pleasure the winter season in the northwest is the perfection of weather cool and fresh in the morning summer heat and cloudless sky through the day and at night opportunity for the delights of blazing wood fires yesterday we said we would set out early and row down the ganges to see the bathing if it were fine lifelong habit involuntarily added of course it was fine gloriously fine and after chota hazri the simple meal of tea and toast with which anglo-indians early break their fast we set out there are several means of locomotion provided in benares you may drive through the streets in a bullock cart or be drawn by buffaloes long-necked ugly black beasts altogether unlike the lordly buffalo of the american prairie there are camels galore and there is a curious carriage called ekka very much like the irish outside car except that it is smaller and holds only two passengers who sit on either side with their feet over the wheels there is accommodation for resting one foot in an iron stirrup it is usual to sit upon the other these ekas drawn by stout little horses driven at high speed seem to require on the part of passengers long training and insensibility to early falls before becoming quite comfortable we contented ourselves with the slower but safer gari and drove to man mandil ghat where we took boat an overdecked top-heavy structure rowed by four men with oars having the maximum of loom and the minimum of blade 
in addition to the four men who rowed there was one who shouted a good deal and steered a little and two who did nothing till we disembarked when they asked for bakshish it was eight o'clock an hour at which bathing is in full swing all along the town side of the river gorts stone steps run down into the water generally there is a temple at the top of the gort by the Sindhya ghat are two lofty turrets which appear to be toppling to the ground. The foundations, built almost in the river, have sunk, and it is said are still sinking. The veil of a temple close by has been rent in twain, and some day there will be shrieking and sudden death when these massive turrets complete their destiny and fall with a crash among the crowd always encircling them on its way to and from the river lower down a palace once belonging to the raja of gwalior has sunk into the earth only the ruined and roofless walls of its upper stories uplifted from the tomb where there are no temples or palaces the sloping ground is taken advantage of for the carving out of grotesque figures of the gods there is one of the brother of vishnu his head and shoulders carved out in the yellow stone of the perpendicular rock his body from the middle downward being represented with legs apart an inane half-surprised look on his visage furthers the fancy that this is the representation of a drunken man who has slipped down on his haunches and doubts whether he will be able unassisted to get up the scene on the river's bank is a bustling one thousands of people men and women are coming and going by the steep stairways women with earthenware pots on their heads red in colour and lovely in shape though they cost but a few pence come for water for household purposes others bring their household washing to the marge of the beautiful river and side by side with pilgrims from distant madras or the far north a woman washes her skirts or scrubs her brazen vessels but the great business is to bathe to wash and be clean from impurities more grievous than those that come from household labour or journeyings by the wayside on all the highways and railroads converging on benares troops of pilgrims wend their way benares is their mecca the ganges their jordan to behold the one and to wash in the other has been the daily dream and aspiration of their life many of them are very old and to watch them tremblingly picking their way down the rough-hewn steps and eagerly clutching at the cool water suggests the doubt whether they will live to mount the steps again doubtless many would be greatly content if death came to them here and now and if life should vary its long unkindness by suddenly quitting them whilst their eyes feasted on the flow of the ganges and their weary limbs were laved in its cool waters it is hard for phlegmatic englishmen to realise the sentiment with which the hindus regard the ganges mother ganga as they fondly call it it is part of their daily life to-day as it was in days through which history stumbles with faltering step to the hindu the stately river is daughter of king himalaya and of his queen the air nymph menaka the icicle studded cavern at the base of a snowdrift from which the river issues is the tangled hair of the god shiva to cry ganga ganga three hundred miles distant from the river is sufficient to wipe away many sins to bathe in its waters as blue and fresh when they pass benares as when they first reach the plains is eternal bliss to spend six years in following the river's course from the bay of bengal to the himalayas and back again is to secure a place in the immortal imperishable world sung of in the rig veda Quote, where there is eternal life where joy and pleasure reside and where the sun is placed End quote. life and death stand hand in hand on this consecrated ground close by the most crowded ghat is a funeral pyre so near that the bathers might reach out their hands to warm them at its flame this fire is always burning night and day fresh fuel being brought hourly from the great city 
which never seems to have one less in the bazaars because of these vacancies in households. When the bodies are burned out, the ashes are thrown upon the Ganges, and the stream running in shore mingles portions of them with the bathers. From some of the ghats, wooden stages are built over the river, thus multiplying the accommodation for the worshippers. Here is an old man, his wrinkled face aglow with devotional feeling, on his knees at the edge of the stage, ladling up the water with his hands and muttering incessant prayer. Close by is a fine, stalwart young Brahmin, going through the ritual with a rapid ease that betokens long practice, and no disinclination to get through with it as quickly as possible. Here is another Brahmin, up to his waist in water, working his fists in an energetic fashion, which at a short distance looks as if he were wanting someone on the opposite bank to come on and have it out, in good old English fashion. On closer inspection it is seen that he has a piece of string round his neck, and that, holding it out first with one hand and then with the other, he is vigorously washing it. Here is a woman whose matronly figure is boldly outlined by the cotton drapery that clings to her as she comes up, wholly unlike Venus, from her third dip. A man close by scoops up the water in the palms of his joined hands and pours it out as if offering a libation, thrice repeating the ceremony and crying aloud his petition to his preserver. There is wide variety of attitude and age, but all bound by the common bond of profound earnestness. There can be no question of the sincerity of the form of worship which necessitates standing knee-deep in the river in damply clinging cotton cloths, with the morning air fresh from frost-bound fields blowing keenly. Not less in earnest are the Brahmins, who sit under umbrella shades at the head of the ghats, caring for the superfluous clothing of the bathers, and waiting to stamp their foreheads with the mark which testifies to due performance of the morning function. This caretaking and stamping means coppers, and some of the stands must bring in a good deal of money. Seen from the boat, Benares is very beautiful in the morning air. The minarets, which mark former Mohammedan dominance in the stronghold of Buddhism, stand out clear against the sky that is momentarily deepening in blue as the sun rises higher over the broad river. In a population of this strongly marked religious tendency, it is interesting to inquire what way Christianity has made. There has been no lack of honest and earnest endeavour, there being not less than five missionary societies which have agencies here, and some of them have been at work for over a quarter of a century. According to the census report of the Northwest Provinces, I find the population of Benares is a little over 175,000. Of these, 133,000 are Hindus, 42,000 Mohammedans, and 265 Christians. How many of these are officials and missionaries I do not know, but at best the number of natives gathered into the fold by the united efforts of the missionaries is lamentably small. On Sunday I went to the Mission House of the London Missionary Society to attend the native service. It is a neat, commodious building, comfortably seated, and possessing the attraction of a harmonium. In Mr. Hewlett, the pastor, missionary work has a model servant. When I entered, he was earnestly preaching to eleven natives, one half of whom were directly and officially connected with the mission. This was bad but I gathered from a melancholy little joke heard from the lips of a missionary that things are worse elsewhere. At Mirzapur it befell at one time that the native congregation was reduced to a single individual, a lad of fifteen. In course of time the news spread that the congregation at Mirzapur is growing. The lad of fifteen was becoming a youth of eighteen. Next, Christian India was thrilled by the report that the congregation at Mirzapur had doubled. The young man of nineteen had taken to himself a wife. Mr. Hewlett preached his sermon with doors and windows wide open. His house stands within the compound a few yards distant, 
and his voice fell upon the ear of his dog, who had been taking a siesta in the veranda. Presently the dog appeared in the doorway, and, discovering his master in the pulpit, walked up to him, and entirely disappeared from view, save that its tail was left wagging in the friendliest way outside the limits of the pulpit. This is a trivial story, but it has a grave moral. If a man like Mr. Hewlett, a scholar and an earnest, simple gentleman, who men and dogs are instinctively drawn towards, has not more to show for twenty-three years unremitting labour than this scanty congregation, Christian missions are in a bad way in India. It is true that in the South there is a longer list of converts to show, but these are found chiefly among outcasts, who, peremptorily cut adrift from Hinduism, are peculiarly amenable to the kindly influence of Christian missionaries. In Benares, Mr. Hewlett's own testimony is, quote, that for years the native congregation has hardly grown, either in numbers or in ability to support a pastor. End quote. But if the seed of the gospel fails in hopelessly stony places in the stronghold of Hinduism, the missionaries are doing a great work in the way of education. In the London Mission College and Girls' Schools, 1,265 pupils last year were receiving a thoroughly sound education. I came across one of the ex-pupils, a young fellow who was the proprietor of a well-to-do shop in the inlaid brasswork. He spoke excellent English, was bright and intelligent, and was so pleased to find me in company with Mr. Insell, Mr. Hewlett's colleague in direction of the London Mission College, that he sold me a lot of things at their market price, without the customary preliminary of asking three times their value, and gradually coming down to fifty per cent over it. In addition to the work carried on in the college and schools, and over above her labours as principal of the girls' school, Mrs. Hewlett pursues the system of Zinana work, visiting the Hindu women in their own homes. These things may even yet, as Mr. Hewlett with pathetic patience and courage hopes, bring about a great awakening in the Hindu mind. In the meanwhile, the benefits of the educational system administered by the missionaries is unmistakable, and cannot fail to bear fruit in increasing measure. The general position of Christianity in India, as affected by mission labour, is grimly told in the official statistics of 1871, the latest available. These show that of the 240 millions then peopling British India, only 718,000 were Christians, considerably less than half per cent of the population. Of these, only a small proportion are Protestants. In Madras, for example, where more than half the converts have been made, of a total of 533,760, 416,068 are Roman Catholics. Of the total number of Christians in India, British and feudatory, the Roman Catholics claim 1,317,782, and the Protestants 325,000. The superior tactical adaptability to circumstances of the Roman Catholic priesthood may be held in some measure to account for this remarkable discrepancy. If it were part of the business of a Protestant missionary in China to have pictures of the Annunciation in the mission room, he would be content to follow early models of art. The Jesuits know better than that, and their chapels are adorned with pictures of the infant Jesus in a pigtail, and Mary tottering on feet squeezed small enough to please a mandarin. The conversions to Protestantism, such as they are, have been the result chiefly of the London Missionary Society, which entered the field in 1798, the Church Missionary Society, which sent out its first representative in 1814, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, which followed in 1826, the Presbyterian Missions, which opened in 1830, and the Wesleyan Methodist Society. Excluding the Scotch Church, of which I have no particulars, the other four societies maintain their position at an annual expenditure of £165,000, 
contributed from home in addition to this there are special funds and money raised in india which would probably bring the expenditure up to something like a pound per convert per annum in the afternoon we were on the river again rowing to ramnagar the palace of the maharaja of benares the castellated front of the palace stands boldly out on the river bank and through the bright clear atmosphere seemed distant only half an hour's rowing but this prospect is illusory, and it was after an hour and a half's battling with the current that the men brought the boat to the landing-place at the foot of the castle. The scene on the river in the afternoon is greatly changed from that witnessed in the early morning. The ghats are almost deserted, though here and there are to be seen tardy worshippers bathing their thinly draped bodies in the holy stream. Godliness having been cared for in the morning, cleanliness has its due sequence in the afternoon men and women kneeling on the bank or standing ankle-deep in the water on the steps of the ghat were busy scrubbing pots and pans or washing household linen the brahmins save one at a remote ghat had gone only their umbrellas remaining to mark the spot sanctified by their presence and ministrations the broad river shading from green to blue and wonderfully clean considering the hourly pollution of a great city flowed steadily on sparkling in the sunlight looking back growing distance added enchantment to the city standing high up on the bank with its frontage guiltless of a straight line and the twin minarets of the mosque always the most prominent feature in the picture of all possible views of benares the best is to be obtained by a journey towards ramnagar the city, following the bank of the river, curves outward in crescent form, displaying all its beauty to the south. The opposite bank, going towards Ramnagar, is a flat plain, a brown bank, showing where the river overflows after the rains, and beyond this, fields dressed in the living green of the young shoots of late autumn-planted wheat. When the Ganges rises after the rains, it does so in a manner worthy of its reputation. At the Maharaja's palace there is a watermark showing how the river rises in August from thirty to forty feet. On the low bank, now deserted by the stream, a flock of vultures were gathered, discontentedly picking at the ribs of a skeleton. A little further on something was floating in the water, serving as a resting place for a flock of smaller birds who diligently pecked at it. We were too far off to see what this was but it was too probably a dead body there is no municipal law at benares forbidding the casting of dead bodies into the river this is however done only in the cases of people too poor to pay two rupees for wood to light a funeral pyre it is equivalent to a pauper's funeral but as there are many paupers in benares there are many corpses in the ganges a little apart from the vultures perched on the skeleton, a cyrus paced in solemn meditation. The cyrus is much like the stork, though with bigger body and broader bill. Its stride is curious, the pompous way in which it slowly draws its foot up and plants it out for another stride, combined with a slight swagger of its tail, being reminiscent of a being something between a churchwarden and a masher. It took no notice of the vultures at their sorry banquet, nor of the smaller birds perched on the vultures' backs, nor of the sky overhead, nor of the river rustling by, nor of the great city in the solemn stillness of the opposite side of the river. It paced up and down with its ridiculous stride, its head hung down in meditation, and the movement of its body suggestive of its having its hands clasped under his coat-tails. Scarcely less comical was its mate, sitting on the bank with its legs, prodigiously long from knee to claw, spread out flat before it, hooked from the knee, as a man might rest on his elbows. The cyrus is always found in couples, and there is a pretty legend, doubtless founded upon fact, that when one dies its mate, refusing food or drink, pines away. 
caught young and tamed, the cyrus will answer the purpose of a watchdog. It makes a curious noise which gives warning of the approach of strangers by day or night, and has an impartial way of pecking at the legs of unfamiliar visitors, which makes it interesting. Some people who have tried it say the flesh of its breast is very good eating. Broiled with onions, it makes a passable substitute for beefsteak. But its chief commercial value, when dead, lies in its long legs, which from the knee down to the claw makes a pipe stem much affected by the natives. Still nearer the palace, a body was burning under a pile of wood near the edge of the river, the bereaved relatives sitting on the bank dressed in white. The funeral was not going off very successfully. The wind, such as it was, blowing from the south, had lit up that side of the pile, leaving the other untouched. The undertaker's men, evidently familiar with this mischance, stood at the side, and with what looked like a red tablecloth fanned the dying embers into a flame, laughing and talking the while as if the freshness of the joke of cremation never palled. The descendant of one of the ancient princes of India has a right kingly watchdog at the gate of his palace at Ramnagar. This is a tiger, which a month ago was roaming free in the Maharaja's jungle some twenty miles off. He was caught in a trap cunningly prepared, and after infinite labour and no slight personal danger, was caged and brought in triumph to Ramnagar. For the people of India, the tiger has an interest quite different from that which stirs the breasts of visitors to the zoological gardens in Regent's Park and kindred institutions. For Western people, the tiger is a curiosity. For the Hindu, it is a painful reality, like hunger and houselessness. At this very time of writing, there is a village in India on the outskirts of which devoted policemen dressed in women's clothes are walking about. The neighbouring tiger, with a fine appreciation of quality, will lunch only off the female inhabitants, and after many vain attempts at catching him by traps and legitimate hunting, this device has been had recourse to, hitherto without success. For whilst the disguised policemen walk about in absolute safety, veritable women are from time to time snapped up. Doubtless the tiger at Ramnagar had frequently contemplated a visit to the village, but not precisely in this style. Reflection on this unfulfilled intention may add to the poignancy of his feelings. However it be, he is the most sublimely wrathful creature I ever saw. Still fresh from the jungle, he has not learned that trick of restlessly pacing round the cage with which zoological gardens tigers amuse themselves. He lies at the remote end, half rising when a crowd gather round, and with lips drawn back and bristles stiff as lance poles, he growls. At times, the noise which seems to shake the cage is more like a moaning sigh of infinite regret than an ordinary growl. Here are these people, ten or a score of them, within the length of half a bound, and between him and them what looks like a frail immaterial mesh of bamboo. But he knows its strength for he has tried it, springing with a single bound from the further end of the cage, expecting to find himself plump in the crowd, astonished and dismayed to find his head beaten against iron bars. He has given that up now, and spreading out his magnificent body at full length at the end of the cage, only growls. Once an ingenious villager rattled a stick through the open bars of a narrow porthole by the tiger's head. Then he leapt up, and with hate and rage blazing from his eyes, and thunderous growls issuing through his closed teeth, he smote the iron bars with his mighty paw. After the tiger, the palace of the Maharaja was a very poor affair. 
admission is obtained through a gateway and by an ill-kept courtyard flanked on either side by shabby huts in which the prince's retainers live there was a sentry at the gate dressed in what looked like the cast-off clothing of a british soldier he was lounging about the gateway as we approached at sight of us he took up his gun and like the faithful cyrus whom he resembled to the extent that he had a red tuft on the top of his head showed a disposition to peck at us with the bayonet as he was inflexible we had to wait till our cards were sent in and were permitted to pass only when the maharaja's private secretary a babu with kindly face and gentle manner came to the rescue when we left the sentry was again caught napping but he shouldered his rifle with comical alacrity as we came in sight and as he saluted looked more than ever like the soldier of the burlesque stage the apparition not unfrequent of natives with red hair is startling till it is known that the effect is obtained by dye the mandley a leaf something like the myrtle works this wonder and is much used by the mohammedan soldiers we did not see the maharaja who happened to be at prayers his highness engages in devotion for twelve hours a day straight off and has done so for twenty years this habit commendable in itself interferes somewhat with his opportunities of social intercourse six hours he sleeps six hours he devotes to mundane affairs and the rest to heaven should there be any imperative call upon him such as the visit of the nizam which happened the day before our visit he takes the necessary time out of his sleep one half the day is inviolably dedicated to preparation for the world to come i asked the babu whether the heir apparent was devotional to equal extent no he said with a sigh he takes only one hour in the morning and half an hour at night the rooms of the palace are large and lofty but the effect is spoiled by the importation of glass chandeliers with coloured globes and furniture from tottenham court road the attendant showed with a special pride half a dozen french musical boxes under glass cases which when wound up played jigs and set birds hopping about on trees monkeys performing niggers clanging cymbals and other vulgarities it was pitiable to see these things in the house of a man who had within reach the illimitable art treasures of india the only decent things in the palace were the marble floors the inlaid marble chimney-piece in the drawing-room and an ingenious clock a duplicate of which the maharaja with characteristic generosity presented to the prince of wales who had admired the original as we rode back to Benares, the sun had set, and night was swiftly descending over river, fields, and city. The mist rising from the Ganges had wrapped itself round the city like a mantle. A second fire had been lit close by where the ashes of the one we had watched in the afternoon still smouldered. They glowered upon us as we passed the low bank, like two great red eyes peering across the darkling river at the great city on the other side which we could not see though we could hear the far-off murmur of its multitude end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of east by west a journey in the recess volume two by henry w lucy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15. The Residency at Lucknow Lucknow might well be named the City of Palaces. Long the residence of the kings of Oud, it has been dowered with many imposing buildings where formerly royal state was kept, and where now British officials carry on their work, or the infrequent footfall echoes through tenantless rooms it would seem that whenever time hung heavy on his hands the king of oud built a new palace they are not excellent in any way and a glance at the outside as the traveller passes is sufficient to meet the requirements of the occasion prominent among a score of these royal buildings 
is the Hosseinabad Imambara, with which the third king of Aud endowed the city. Like many of the ancient buildings in India, it is a mausoleum, enclosing the tombs of the king and his mother. It is a poor, gaudy place, with a confusion of glass chandeliers, coloured glass globes, looking-glasses, and other devices calculated to please the minds of children. The prophetic eye of the king, foreseeing a time when, in default of special arrangements, his tomb would be neglected, and his globes and his chandeliers left unpolished, he bequeathed a sum of money sufficient to keep up an establishment of servants, who lounge about the place and pounce upon visitors with demands for bakshish. Once a year, on the anniversary of the lamented death of this monarch, there is a great flare-up of candles within the mausoleum and of lamps in the courtyard and garden. This is a highly popular festival and serves to keep green the memory of Mohammed Ali Shah. Broad roads flank the quarter of palaces, and, not examined too closely, the big white-fronted houses look well seen through the vista of green trees. The native town is much like that of any other Indian city where over two hundred thousand natives congregate. There are narrow streets and interminable bazaars populated chiefly by sellers. Here, as elsewhere, it is a marvel how these shops can be kept open. Everybody is busy manufacturing articles for sale or calmly smoking awaiting the arrival of a customer. But the customer comes only at rare intervals and though he makes a terrible noise when he arrives, that will not strike the balance of the long blank in the day's business. In these Indian bazaars, business is conducted on a literal adaptation of the principle, much cry and little wool, or little cotton goods, muslin, brasswork, inlaid metal, gold, embroidery or pottery, as the case may be. For Englishmen, the real interest of Lucknow lingers round the looped and windowless raggedness of the residency, held by a handful of gallant men during the mutiny. The residency is approached through a broad Portland place-like thoroughfare in the quarter of palaces. Eighty-three years ago it was resigned by the reigning Nawab for the use of the British resident at his court. The Bailey Guard Gate the outpost of the gallant defenders of the residency, is now a few ruined walls eloquently pitted with bullet marks. Where in 1857 the native city stood, creeping close up to the walls of the residency compound, a fair park now smiles. It has been the policy of the British, alike at Delhi, Cawnpore and Lucknow, while preserving the memorials of the defence of the beleaguered loyal troops, to level with the ground the congeries of houses from which the mutineers poured their shot and shell. Close by the Bailey Guard Gate, so called from Colonel Bailey, the officer who commanded the first residence escort, is Dr. Freyra's house. Hither Sir Henry Lawrence was carried on receiving his fatal wound, and here he died. A roofless chamber in this battered house bears the inscription, Here Sir Henry Lawrence died, July the 4th, 1857. There is an underground room where a number of ladies and children passed through the dreadful days of the siege, with shot and shell whistling overhead, and the slow progress of the day marked by the deadly cannonade. Every morning at daybreak it began, continued till the heat of noon came on, then fell away to begin again in the afternoon and continue as long as light lasted. When relief came and the garrison with its womankind had been quietly withdrawn in the dead of the night, the mutineers, breaking in and mad with rage to find their prey had escaped, vented their fury on the dumb sticks and stones of the house, smashing everything that was breakable even to the stone staircases. The residency must in its time have been a pleasant house, standing on one of the highest spots of ground in the city, with a fine view of the country beyond. Entrance is obtained by one of those broad, lofty porticoes that are a feature in all Indian houses of the better class. At some distance in front, just behind the Bailey Guard Gate, is the banqueting hall, 
where gloomy state dinners and gayer balls were given before the trouble came. This building admirably served as a hospital during the siege. Like all other outbuildings, the banqueting hall is battered with cannon shot and perforated with bullets. As for the residency itself, it is simply a heap of ruins. On a mound close by is a prim Maltese cross, reared, quote, in memory of Sir Henry Lawrence and the brave men who fell in defence of the residency, end quote. It is a poor, mean-looking thing to stand as the official memento of so glorious a deed, but Englishmen have always been more successful in doing great deeds than in commemorating them in marble or brass. The true memento of the defence of Lucknow, and the only one needed, is the picturesque ruin of the residency itself. Every portion of a wall standing, every roofless room entered, has its story written in the sharp, decisive handwriting of cannon or rifle. Here is the room where Sir Henry Lawrence was sitting at breakfast on the 2nd of July, 1857, when a shell came in through the window and mortally wounded him. It is a small room, looking on to a veranda with a tower beyond. If the gunner who laid the mortar had seen the British resident across the intervening space and through brick walls, he could not have taken surer aim. The hole in the outer wall through which the shell passed still exists, precisely as it was made, and one can clearly trace its course across the veranda, through the window, and into the little room, where Sir Henry sat, apparently in full security. Here is the Tykana to which a former Begum was wont to retire from the heats of summer. It is some feet underground, and no place could have been better designed for the purpose to which it was put during the siege, when two hundred and fifty women and children lived here, or rather here died daily. When the Begum dwelt here, fresh air and sunlight came in through the carefully constructed portholes near the roof. With a constant hail of shot and shell raining on the place, it was not felt permissible to leave these apertures unguarded. They were accordingly blocked up, and in darkness, with scanty supplies of fresh air, sick in body and sore at heart, women and children dwelt in this chamber for five months and five days. One morning, in spite of all precaution, a shot found its way through one of the blocked-up windows, and a deep hole low down on the opposite wall shows where it landed. No one was hurt, but one lady died of fright. Food and water were brought to the prisoners through a secret underground passage communicating with the Taikana. Like the house of Dr. Freyra, this carries proof of the fury of the mutineers when they leapt over the mud walls of the entrenchment and entered the silent and deserted residency. Having no English men and women to slash and hack, they turned with impotent fury upon the very stone staircases of the Taikana and broke them down. Here is the guard-room, next door to the fatal breakfast-room, where six soldiers were buried alive in the ruins created by a shell. Here is the tower, honeycombed with cannon-shot, on the top of which, day after day, some gallant officer volunteered to stand, telescope in hand, and report the movements of the mutineers. Shot and shell flying around the residency constantly struck here and there, but this tall tower, on which the British flag defiantly floated, was a mark always being struck, and the marvel is that so much stands. Here is the flagstaff, cut in twain by a cannonball in the early days of the siege, patched together with iron hoops, and once more carrying the flag before the exultant shouts of the mutineers had gone the full round of their camp. The flag, riddled with shots, is still preserved, and on Christmas days and Sundays floats from the patched-up flagstaff on the old tower, looking out on a scene in strange contrast with that it witnessed in 1857. Except the Taikana, which is really a cellar, there is not a roof to any chamber in the residency. Very early in the siege the upper rooms were rendered untenable, and the work of destruction was finished when the mutineers broke in. 
Throughout the grounds, dwarf brick pillars mark the places where the various batteries stood. One place not marked, though it is worthy of a tablet, is the drain through which Mr. Kavanagh made his way into the city, and so on to the Alambagh with a letter to Sir Henry Havelock, who had established himself there with the relief column. Mr. Kavanagh had dressed himself as a native, but a man cannot creep through a mile or so of drain-pipe without obtaining a suspicious appearance. As he emerged at the other end of the drain, he was arrested and taken before the rebel leaders, but succeeded in getting off and placed his missive safely in the hands of Sir Henry Havelock. The churchyard behind the residency is full of interesting memorials of the siege. Of the little church itself, the mutineers scarcely left one stone standing upon another. Near its ruins is a plain marble slab bearing the legend, Here lies Henry Lawrence, who tried to do his duty. This is the full inscription as usually quoted, and it would seem difficult to spoil its touching simplicity. This has, however, been done by the curious rider, so familiar in the death sentences of the judges in the Old Bailey, May the Lord have mercy on his soul. There is an odd monument over the grave of a lady burnt by the explosion of a shell. The slab on the top is carved into curious convolutions, designed, it is said, to simulate the blisters which broke out over the unfortunate lady's body. There is a monument over the grave of the lady killed in the Tykana by a shot that never touched her, sacred, so the inscription runs, to the memory of the young wife of Captain Lancelot, who died of fright, 16th of July, 1857. In one corner of the churchyard is a little cluster of graves where lie the children who did not survive their baptism of fire. As we stood by the pillar marking the position of one of the hottest batteries, served only by volunteers, two jackals trotted into the compound outside the graveyard, and lifting up their voices, piteously howled. But this was the only note of discord in a place where the peace of a summer day reigned, and where, under the shade of the sacred people tree and the tower-like tamarind, the sorely tried sojourners in the residency take their rest. End of chapter 15